Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's an enchanted island or a prison, a crazy happy dance, or a funeral march in blues time. It's a sorcerer's palace with golden mirrors and jeweled fountains, or it's a wailing wall corroded with pain. Call it anything you want, it's My Beat. One of the ways to get on my beat is to infiltrate through the grim lines of people trying to buy tickets to South Pacific. Those people are going to mutiny someday. It was about nine in the morning and a good thing happened to me. The good thing was a kid named Paul Thomas. A sweet kid, a gentle kid. A kid who'd wrapped himself in iron to stall off the pain so many people handed to him for free. Mr. Clover, Mr. Clover, could I talk to you for a minute? Sure, Paul, sure. Any place, any time. How about in the lobby here? Okay, lobby it is. I'm sure glad to see you, Paul. It's been a long time. Not so long, Mr. Clover. It's only five, six months since you got me that job. Maybe seven months since you caught me breaking into a store. Uh, who remembers what happened seven months ago? How's the job, Paul? How's it working out? Mr. Eric karen has been treating me fine. He's even had me bonded so I could deliver all that jewelry and stuff. I bet your folks are proud. Yeah, they're real proud, Mr. Clover. I've been meaning to get up to Harlem to visit them. Your mother's a fine woman, Paul. Give her my best. I'll do that, Mr. Clover. She keeps asking about you. Paul, it's a good thing to see you the way you are. I'm in trouble, Mr. Clover. I think I'm in big trouble. Oh? You want to tell me about it here? We could go someplace and get a quiet cup of coffee. I better tell you about it fast, Mr. Clover. A couple of days Danny, ago, they came... Danny, Clover, how's Broadway's Glamour Boy? How's the finest of the finest, oh, huh? Oh, hi, Kirk. <laughs> Am I interrupting something, Danny? The boy won't mind being interrupted, will you, boy? Maybe I mind, Kirk. Oh, no offense, Danny. Come on, ask me how I am. Ask me how I've been doing. How are you? How you been doing? Oh, great. Very, very great, Danny. Yes, sir. Don't I rate an introduction to the boy, Danny? Paul, this is Jerry Kirk, a private investigator. Paul Thomas, Jerry Kirk. Hi, Mr. Kirk. Danny, you don't keep up. A smart detective like you should keep up. I'm not a private eye anymore. No? Well, so long, Kirk. See you around. No, no, no. I'm not a private eye anymore. I'm in the plush, Danny. Plush office, plush stipend, furnished by Acme Insurance Company. I investigate insurance losses for them. Oh, it's a lot easier than breaking down doors to haul apartments. But not so much fun, huh, Kirk? <laughs> more, Danny, more. It even gives me the price of a couple of tickets to South Pacific here. But uh, how about you, Danny? You still hitting the triple features in the grind houses, Danny? Goodbye, Kirk. <laughs> yeah, it's been swell seeing you, Danny. I'm sorry about him, Paul. Now, tell me what's on your mind. I can, Mr. Clover. I got to get to work. I'm late. I'm late. Paul, Paul, come back here. That's how the day began, with a kid starting to tell me a big trouble and then running away. It was about five when Paul's big trouble started to catch up with me. A patrolman leaned out of a squad car and handed me a slip of paper. J. Arakarian, the paper said. It said the Paramount Building. And at the bottom, it said, urgent. I'd been there before. J. Arakarian, lapidary and dealer in precious gems, was on the 14th floor. You went through a door and passed the beam of an electric eye and waded through a carpet to a desk and an olive-skinned girl with tight black hair. You gave your name and you got nodded past another beam and some carved oriental wall hangings to a young man. Morning coat cut to hide the lines of his shoulder holster and sneer cut to fit the scar that ran from his eye to the corner of his mouth. Then a chaperoned hike through another doorway. And there he was, J. Arakarian, impeccable in ascot, striped pants, and a legion of honor ribbon in his satin lapel. He had another thing, a guest. I asked Mr. Jerry Kirk to be with us, Lieutenant Clover, because his interests lie in the same direction as ours. Hiya, Kirk. What's all this about? Mr. Arakarian will tell you, Danny. You see that, Lieutenant. What do you want to see me about, Mr. Arakarian? About the boy you asked me to hire. About Paul Thomas. You know Paul Thomas, don't you, Danny? What about Paul Thomas? 
Mr. Arakarian is a polite man, Danny. He's trying to tell you the kid absconded with an awful lot of jewelry. Uh, please. This matter is very dolorous to me. A hundred thousand dollars worth, Danny. How about letting Mr. Eric Carrion tell it his way, huh, Kirk? I was just phrasing it neatly. A hundred grand, Danny. Right now, you just listen, Kirk. What did Paul Thomas do, Mr. Eric Carrion? He failed to deliver a consignment. He failed to let me know the reason why. He has been gone since this morning. Disappeared. Like a puff of smoke, huh, Mr. Akarian? That's what you said? They, they assign a bright eye like you to this, Kirk? Like me, Danny. Uh, Mr. Jerry Kirk is from the insurance company. In a matter like this, one thinks of insurance. In a case like this, one also thinks of how maybe Paul got slugged. One also thinks he could have been robbed, Mr. Akarian. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Paul Thomas turns up in an alley, Kirk, slugged. A bet? Yeah, sure. I know human nature, Danny. He's gone a long way with those rocks, absconded, he's stolen. Now, in a matter like this, the amount is not a pittance, Lieutenant. A hundred thousand dollars worth of first water gems, jewel cases, settings. Got a list of what's missing? Uh, right here. You see? It uh, makes not an inconsiderable... Yeah, it's not inconsiderable. It is very dolorous, Lieutenant. Uh, you'll get them back? Dollarus means it can make you cry. But Arakarian's Dollarus was different from mine. His was a hundred grand he'd lost. Mine was a boy named Paul Thomas that maybe I'd lost. But it was still only a maybe. I had two things to do. Turn the list of missing jewels into headquarters, which I did. Then call it Paul's home in Harlem. Harlem is a guilt and a scar and a wound. And the wound is a tenement lighted by kerosene lamps. A tenement with barred windows through which you can watch the moonlight darting out on the backs of hungry rats. And Harlem is a place of quiet laughter that stops when it sees you walking up the stairs to the one room in which Paul's family of five live. Yes? Oh, it's Mr. Clover. Hi, Mrs. Thomas. I hardly expected to. Please forgive the way I look. I... Oh, you look fine, Mrs. Thomas, fine. May I come in? Why, of course, of course. The children are outside playing. It's just as well, Mrs. Thomas. I want to talk to you. Please sit down, Mr. Clover. Soup? Is it about Paul? Why did you see him last, Mrs. Thomas? This morning. He stopped by on his way to work. Is there anything... He doesn't live here anymore? No, Mr. Clover. Paul's a man now, and he needs a place of his own. Where is it, Mrs. Thomas? Is my boy in trouble, Mr. Clover? Well, we don't know. I, I don't think so, but I have to be sure. Where's his place, Mrs. Thomas? It's a rooming house on 137th Street, 26 East. It's clean. You can actually see the sun. Paul couldn't do anything wrong. Not anymore, Mr. Clover. Paul's good. He's good. He hasn't been by here tonight. No, but that doesn't mean anything. Lots of times he doesn't come by at night, but he'll be here in the morning. He's always here for breakfast in the morning. Well, I think I'll run over to that address you gave me, Mrs. Thomas. Uh, I'm sorry I can't stay and visit with you. You'll let me know about my boy, Mr. Clover. Whatever way it is, you let me know. It'll be all right, Mrs. Thomas. It has to be all right. <laughs> Outside, it was one block north and two to my left of the subway station at 125th and Lenox. In those three blocks, you could feel the breeze from the East River fighting a losing battle with the heat. But it wasn't the heat that stopped me. It was squad car 15, patrolman Florio at the controls. Eh, not bad, Florio. Three-point landing. Hi, Lieutenant. Come on, get in. Thanks. Are you headed uptown? Well, that depends, Lieutenant. Wherever you say. Uptown? You hey, better call headquarters first. I've been cruising, looking for you. Headquarters said you were in Harlem. Yeah, call them, Florio. Sure. Troll car 15, calling headquarters. Come in. Troll car 15, calling headquarters. Headquarters receiving patrol car 15. Go ahead, 15. I take it, Danny. Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. Danny, Tartaglia speaking. About that Arakarian robbery. Guy named Jerry Kurt called you. Yeah. Said he wanted you there when he took Paul Thomas. Oh, where's all this taking place? 137th Street, a condemned tenement. Three houses beneath the northeast corner on Lennox. Ten o'clock, the guy said. That's right now, D'Artaglia. Thanks. Let's go, Florio. You heard the man. Right. Florio. Yellow yeah, Lieutenant. 
You're only giving me a lift down the block. Turn off that siren, huh? Hello, Danny. Glad you showed. Headquarters said you had Paul. You got him, Kirk? He's in that tenement, Danny. Thought he materialized out of that puff of smoke? How do you know he's in there? Look, Danny, a guy steals $100,000 worth of jewelry. It's hot. He can't get rid of it. So he makes a deal with the insurance company. The deal Paul made was for 15 grand. He got in touch with you? Yeah, sure. He said meet him here. So I got in touch with you. I'm double-crossing him, Danny. I called in the cops. You wouldn't want it any other way. Yeah, let's go in. And Kirk, keep your gun in your pocket. Danny, you know I seldom carry a gun, and tonight's one occasion when I don't. Come on. Hey, it's pretty dark. Lucky I brought a flash. Paul. Paul Thomas. Let me handle it, Kirk. Paul. Paul, it's Danny Clover. Paul. Maybe he isn't here, Kirk. He's here. That sound came from down in the basement. Hey, Kirk, somebody's shooting downstairs and not at us. Yes, and somebody's taking a powder, too. Let's get him. Don't you think it's time you got out your gun, Danny? Yeah, it's all changed now. Hey, huh? shine your light over there. Where? Back of the staircase. Yeah. Hey, Danny. A body. Danny, look, he's got a gun. Paul. He's dead, Danny. Your boy's dead. Why was he killed? He was a bad boy, Danny. A bad boy with bad company, and the company just took a powder. How do you like your boy now, Danny? You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Casey, crime photographer, finds an innocent-eyed young woman riding a murder-go-round tonight. As he joins her... His girlfriend, reporter Ann Williams, and Ethelbert, the magnificent bartender, caution him to go slow. For a merry ride with murder, join Casey and his pals tonight. And also be around for Second Class Passenger, another thrilling study in Escape. Crime Photographer and Escape are Thursday night features of most of these same CBS stations. Now, back to... Broadway's My Beat. One thing about Broadway, you can become a name overnight. All you have to do is have three current wives or ride four winners in a row. Or you can do it the way Paul Thomas did. Get caught up in a $100,000 jewel theft. And keep your mouth shut about it by being found dead in a Harlem tenement. Not that Paul Thomas would make much of a splash but he would make a fast 30 seconds conversation piece over cheesecake and coffee. A cop uses up the night begging, pleading, grubbing for a break in a murder case. Then he goes home and begs for sleep. And in the morning he goes back to his office at headquarters and starts all over again. And that's where it broke. Come in. Come in. Come in. Danny. Danny, open your eyes. I got a surprise for you. You open them, I'm tired. I got something on the Paul Thomas case. What? Yeah, see? You open your eyes all by yourself. It's not hard, is it, Danny? I could close yours just as easy. What do you got? Well, one of the Arakarian jewels showed up at a pawn shop. When? 10.30 last night. 10.30? That was after Paul's murder. How come you wait till now to give it to me? Easy, Danny. Take it easy. All right, all right, but how come? Larry of Larry's Pawn Shops Limited just phoned it in. Says he didn't get our list till 10 this morning. Larry, sir. Get me a squad car, Tartaglia. I'll pick it up out front. Okay. Uh, Danny. Yeah? I know what this means to you. Sorry I kid it. That's okay, Sergeant. It's okay. But get that squad car, huh? Oh, 
Danny, boy. Danny, you. This is quite an honor. Hi, Larry. Hi. I, I, I could have saved you the trip if you just called me. You need it, the air. Okay, Larry, what do you got? Uh, Danny, you, do you mind stepping in the back room? I'm trying to close a deal. Sometimes... Sometimes it embarrasses my clientele to see me consorting with a detective. Ain't it a shame? Give it to me, Larry, and quick. Oh, Danny, this isn't like you. To... You want me to show you what I can really be like? Okay, okay, Danny, okay, I'll get it for you. Uh, think it over, miss. I'll be right with you. Uh, here. here it is, Danny. Here you see? Hmm? This diamond ring matches up exactly with the one on the Arcarian issue boy sent me. If I say so myself, it's a beauty. Yeah, yeah, but who pawned it? it it's on the ticket. A girl named Ellen West lives at this address on 115th Street. At least that's the name of the address she gave me. Uh, you know where to send it. Send the ring. Oh, it hides me to part with it. So isn't it polite the way I cooperate with you boys, Danny? You'll remember it, won't you? Sure. By the way, what did you give the girl for the ring? It's worth two grand. I gave her 600. Can't hear you, Larry. How much? 600. Still can't hear. It was worth two grand. I gave her six hundred dollars. Uh, oh, Danny, I could kill you. Hey, Mister, you didn't hear what I said. I, I, I was just kidding. I, pay no attention. I didn't mean it. I'm ready to offer you a little more. The girl whose name might be Ellen West lived in a street that might have been anywhere. Could have been a market street in the slums of Madrid or Rome or Athens or New Orleans. It could have been anywhere. But right now, it was under the bridge of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. Right now, it was a street where Paul's murderer might be waiting in a dark room behind a locked door, waiting for a knock that had to come. Yes? Who is it? The police. Open up. Please. Why are you come here? I haven't done anything. Are you Ellen West? That's right. That's my name. How you know my name? I don't know you. Uh, I'm Danny Clover, Ellen. Broadway special detail. I'd like to ask you some questions. Mr. Danny Clover? Huh? Paul told me a lot about you. Please come in, Mr. Clover. Thanks. You knew Paul Thomas? I knew him. I knew him better than anybody. We were going to be married. How old are you? Sixteen, Ellen. Eighteen. Going on nineteen. That's not too young to get married, Mr. Clover. I mean, it wouldn't have been. Ellen, you pawned a ring yesterday. Where'd you get it? Did Paul give it to you? Where would Paul get a ring like that, Mr. Clover? Where'd you get it, Ellen? Came in the mail. Oh, you have the package it came in? I threw it away, Mr. Clover. I threw it away. Because I didn't want to know where to send it back. Maybe you should have given it to the police. Maybe I should have done what I did. I got $600 for that ring, Mr. Clover. With $600, two people like Paul and me could get married. Did you tell Paul about the ring? I didn't see Paul yesterday, Mr. Clover. I didn't seem to tell him about the ring or anything. I got so much to tell him. <laughs> Paul's mother said he had a room of his own. Did you ever see it? I saw it. I met his roommate, Joe Kendall. His... Roommate? Well, not exactly. You see, Mr. Clover, where Paul lived, that room of his own, that was just a place where he could sleep for eight hours. Joe Kendall had it for the other eight hours. They do that a lot up here. Yeah, I know, I know. Now, that's all, Ellen. Just one thing. You won't go away. Where would I go, Mr. Clover? Mr. Clover? Yes, Ellen. Here's the six hundred dollars. I got no use for it now. The hotbed address of Paul's roommate, Joe Kendall, didn't pan out. But a suddenly forgetful landlord suddenly regained his memory when he put on a pair of wire-rimmed glasses and examined my police badge. His cooperation from that instant was a thing of joy. Joe Candle was working right now, mister. Joe Candle worked in the change booth in the subway station at 59th Street. You want some change, mister? No, Jane. Information. What kind of information? Your name, Joe Candle? 
Uh, that all depends on uh, what connection the name's being used. In connection with the police. Uh, show me. Try this. Yeah. Yeah, that badge says you're the police. Says my name's Joe Kendall. What can I do for you, Lieutenant? It's about Paul Thomas, Joe. I read about him in the papers this morning. I'm sorry about Paul. How sorry? Lieutenant? Uh, now, wait a minute. Uh, here you are, lady. Two dimes and a nickel. Lieutenant, it's this Maybe way. Maybe I asked you a bad question, Joe. Not at all. I'm sorry about Paul, Lieutenant. As sorry as I am for any man who died the way Paul did. What about Paul? What did he tell you about himself? Well, things like, I'm tired, Joe. That's what he used to say to me. When he woke me up because it was his turn to sleep, he'd tell me things like that. That's all? Other things, too, Lieutenant, but that was a general idea. Something else, Joe. That ring on your finger. What'd you get it? Are you going to believe me? Okay, Lieutenant. I'll tell you anyhow. I got it in the mail yesterday. You should have let the police know. I should have, but I didn't. Maybe I was going to. Maybe I was going to pawn it. I don't know. You'd better let me have it. Oh, sure, sure. Here. Take it. Lieutenant, I'm in trouble now, huh? I guess right now you come under a couple of laws in the penal code, Joe, but which one escapes me? Just don't run away. I'll be here, Lieutenant. Here or in Harlem, one place or the other. <laughs> It was a decision I had to make about the girl, Ellen West, and about Joe Kendall. And it was a decision I made. They turned up with a part of the missing jewelry and a strange story how they'd got it, and I didn't book them. I didn't put a tail on them. If they told the truth, it gelled an idea that was shaping itself. If they'd lied, I'd know it before the day was over. Back at headquarters, I made out my report that way and turned it in. Then there was nothing to do but trade stairs with Sergeant Tartaglia and wait for the report from the technical boys. Well, I don't know, Danny, I don't know. I'm not sure you did the right thing. Those two might have been holding back. And technical lab reports, Lieutenant. Ballistics, chemical, prints, all of them. Thanks. Okay, Lieutenant. Ballistics, nothing. No, I figured there'd be nothing there. Hey. Hey. So long, Tartaglia. Hey, Danny, where you going? Take a look at those reports. They'll make your red face even redder. <laughs> Those photoelectric eyes wink even at you, huh? They're carrying. They make no distinction, Lieutenant, between friend or enemy. They're ever alert, ever suspicious. Yeah, you kept me waiting a long time, Arakarian. A jeweler has many things to take care of, Lieutenant. Sometimes you must keep even the police waiting. But you're not lonely. Did not Monsieur Atu amuse you? Oh, so that's his name. No, your flunky Atu didn't amuse me. He's so silent, so sinister. Is that the word? It's a good word for Atu. Tell me, Atu, that shoulder holster you wear under your morning coat, how do you avoid a bulge? You must have a good tailor. I wish I had a tailor like that. I would send you the name of Atu's tailor, Lieutenant. Is that all you wanted? That's just part of it. I'd like to have a look at your vaults. You wish to buy some jewelry wholesale? No, no, I'd just like to find some lost jewelry. Stolen, it says on this list. Stolen from a Mr. Arakarian. That's why I'd like to have a look at your vaults. You're insane. But I will humor you. But uh, first, a trifle. You have a warrant, Lieutenant? Now, what do you know about that? I clean forgot to get myself a warrant. But as you say, it's, it's a trifle. Now, how about the vaults? I do not think so, Lieutenant. In your country, I have learned to do everything. Comme il faut. How? Comme il faut. Translation, as it should be. Thanks. I like to learn new words. A warrant would be as it should be. Then I'll just have to get the vault open myself. Atto! Tell your flunky to take his hands off me. Atu is a very difficult man to tell things to. Not only does he not talk often, often he does not listen. Tell him to take his hands off me. Perhaps you could persuade him yourself, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, perhaps I could. <coughs> oh, 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 Atu, I went and spoiled your creases. You, you release me and I... I... <coughs> Well, Kirk, the eminent investigator, today on occasion for carrying a gun. 
You didn't have to shoot Eric Carrion. I did, Danny. To save you from getting knocked off, I had to do just that. Save me? What are you talking about? Well, look at him. Look at Eric Carrion's hand. He was just getting ready to pull a Luger. Yeah. Okay, Kirk, this wraps it up. Let me have your gun. Huh? What for? Ballistics will want it to check it against the slugs in the body. But you saw me shoot him, Danny. The gun, Kirk. Are you off your rocker, Danny? The gun. I've got a permit for this the gun. The gun! Oh. Ow. Yeah. Thanks for the gun. Oh, sure. Sure, Danny, now that I know you were sincere about wanting it. Well, uh, like you said, this wraps it up. <laughs> you figured it a little ahead of me, that's all. Tell me how. Oh, easy. Eric Carrier never parts with the jewels and reports them stolen for insurance money. Yeah, true, true. Tell me, Kirk, how do you figure Paul Thomas figures? Also simple. Eric Carrion tells the kid to uh, make it look like the kid ex- ex- uh, ran away. Well, uh, maybe Eric Carrion wanted to do it another way, and the kid, well, the kid barked. Sure, yeah, that's right, Kirk. Paul came to me yesterday and started to tell me he was in trouble. It adds up. Huh? It adds up neat. You know what else? Two of the gems showed up with two of Paul's friends. Eric Carrion mailed them to throw off suspicion. Clever, real clever. Yeah, but here's the twist. The gun Paul was holding in that tenement cellar had no fingerprints on it. Huh? He was dead before he went in that tenement, Kirk. Dead men leave no prints. Paul Thomas was dead before I saw you, Kirk. Hey, that is a twist. That scene in the condemned tenement, you and Eric Carrion staged it. That's why I want your gun to huh? check it against the slugs they took from Paul's body. You're crazy, Danny. Listen, how else I'm crazy. You killed Paul. You propositioned him and he'd have none of it, so you killed him. And you killed Eric Carrion so he wouldn't implicate you. You stink, copper. You stink, but you won't take me. I've been waiting for you to do that, Kirk. Are... Waiting. Ow! That's for Paul. Ah! For Paul. For Paul. Ow! What stopped me was something gentle. A tap on the shoulder, it was all. But it stopped me. Man from headquarters looked down at me, and his tap was gentle. He said that was enough. I quit, but I didn't believe him. He said Kirk was something the law had to take care of. Then I had to believe him, because I'm a cop. In the mid-afternoon heat, Broadway is a desert. A desert littered with mirages of what might be men or women. You touch some, and they vanish. You touch others and they snarl and slink away. It's real or it's phantom. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's my beat. With Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's the shrieking edge of a numb universe that lies in the shadows and licks its wounds. And it's wasteland, a tinseled wasteland that wears the motley, wears the scarlet of neon, the harsh gold of a trumpet scream, the kaleidoscope of color a tear makes when it's held up to the light. There's the color of the desolate wind that sighs through Broadway, nameless and cold. The wind that drifts, touches everything, seeps in through windows and under doors, lends its quality to whatever room in which it dies. Like the room where I was standing. Mrs. Branch's rooming house. Cretan drapes. Dusty. Beaded lamp. Dusty. Wash basin. Rust stained. The bed pulled down from the wall. The crumpled sheets. 
and the dead woman. And Mrs. Branch not believing a bit of it. Oh, I know it, I know it, I know it. What, Mrs. Branch? Someone's going to come along and pinch me, and I'm going to wake up, and this whole thing will be a dream. Won't it, Mr. Clover? No. Who is this girl? I'm going to tell you because it doesn't matter, because it's a dream. Her name's Mary Dimming. How long has she lived here? Four years. Five. One morning, she rang my doorbell. She had a black suitcase in her hand. I liked her. She liked me. Yes, she stayed. Always paid her rent. Now, oh, I don't believe it. Now she's dead, Mrs. Bryant. She's been stabbed to death. You've got to convince yourself of that and help. Who were her friends? Oh, she was very popular. Whenever the doorbell rang or the phone was for Mary. I often wondered why she didn't marry with so many friends. Tell me how you found her. Well, I brought Mary her coffee this morning. She didn't smile when she saw me. Something was wrong, I told myself. I shook her, and then I saw the knife. And then I said to myself, someone's going to come along and pinch me in this whole thing. But you called the police, anyhow. I pride myself on presence of mind in any circumstances. Did she have any visitors last night? I wouldn't know. I wasn't home. Oh, that book. What about it? Mary loved it so. It was her dearest possession. A yearbook from high school, you know. She loved to look at it before she went to sleep. I suppose that's why it's on the bed beside her. Here, let me show you. What? You see. You see. Mary's picture in a yearbook. Uh huh. Mary Deming. Voted by the class of 1937 as... Is the girl most likely to succeed, Mr. Clover? Isn't that nice? Fingers of sunlight reached through the windows hung with the torn, soot-stained cretonne, reached out for the woman lying there, touched her face, her throat, her shoulders. For an instant, youth flowed over the dead woman's body. The youth her dead hand held in the shape of a high school yearbook. For an instant, a girl lay there in sleep, sun warm in the power that is a girl's. Then the instant was gone. In a little while they came, the servicemen of death, the technical man, the photographers, the coroner, Mugovan. I gave Mugovan the notes I'd made, the yearbook, told him what I needed, sent him on his way. A little while after it was done, the men in the white jackets brought up the wicker basket and the joke to fit the occasion. <laughs> At headquarters, a man stood at my desk, a bald man, eating a big red apple, enjoying it. It was Sergeant Gino Tertaglian. Danny, I was saving this for you for my lunch, but it took you such a long time, I couldn't save it no longer. <laughs> I know, Gino. Did Mugovan... Yeah, yeah, he gave me a message, Danny, and I got all the dope right here in my pocket. Well, let's take it out and look at it, shall we? Huh? Oh, oh, sure, sure. I can tell you what's in the dope without you looking if you want. Okay, I want the girl, lately deceased, Mary Deeming. She had a police record. Oh. Not that serious the way you said, oh, Danny. A record that is not unordinary among certain type people. Reckless driving, driving while under the influence, bashing a cop in the eye because he stopped her while she was doing 90 on a Sunday afternoon, disturbances of the peace on occasion, shoplifting, little ordinary things like that. Uh, anything else? Uh, not from me, Danny. You, Mugovan? Yeah, Danny. I checked and cross-checked the high school yearbook like you told me. Mary Deming against everybody else in the book. Something? Maybe. Anyway, I came up with the names of four students that the Deming girls seemed to be most intimate with during the high school years. Uh, who are they? Uh, I made up a list, Danny, here. I traced their addresses, their occupations. Three of them, anyhow. Fourth is going to take more time. Thanks, Mugovan. Wasn't too easy, Danny, cross-checking all that stuff. The sororities, the uh, San Susi French Language Club, the Letterman, the Acapella Choir, the Proms, the National Thespians... All that high school stuff wasn't easy. <laughs> Tell Gino about it, Muggerman. He'll save you a big red apple. So it began, a woman dead in a boarding house, and her last identification with life, a high school yearbook. A woman, anonymous except for that. Somewhere, if Muggerman's checking was correct, four people had intruded upon her life, tempered it, perhaps shaped her dying. Only perhaps, a policeman has to make sure. Call on number one. George Ferris, football player, who made All-State back in 1937. Now department store floor walker. 
Wade through the ladies' wear department, through the bookstore, down the escalator, and seek out the man who quarterbacked the bargain basement. Impose a name for him. Uh, Mary Deming, you said. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what about her? Uh, Mary Deming. Mr. Ferris, will you okay this charge tape? Uh-huh. There we are. Thank you, Mr. Ferris. Now, uh, now then about Mary Deming. She's dead. Well, now. Well, well. I guess we're all getting old, Mr. Clover. Just last week, I met old Polyakov. You know, Ferris to Polyakov. What a combination we were. I flipped him, he caught him. Ferris to Polyakov. Polyakov said we were all getting old. Yeah, rackety racks and a locomotive for us. So Mary's dead. We found her this morning with a knife in her back. You know, she had to end that way. Why? Human nature. It's in the books, Mr. Clover. Mary Deming was wild for her age. Wild? What do you mean? Boys. Lots of them. That included you? I was a star quarterback. She wore my sweater for a week. Then one Monday afternoon, I saw her in the drugstore with a left tackle. Uh, Mary Deming was a wild kid. I liked her. For the week, I knew her. Have you seen her since high school? Yeah, about a year ago, when I was in ladies' lingerie, a woman with a shopping bag was stealing one of our 498 items. Mary Deming. Did you ever arrest her? Well. Well? Yes, I did. After all, I worked for this store. Sure. That's the last time I saw her. Mary Deming. Well, well. The next on the list Muggerman had compiled from the yearbook was a woman, Lillian Hess, address New Rochelle, occupation, unmarried. Her picture came to mind, a girl with a plain face with gentle eyes, a sweet smile, her dark hair cut in a page boy. The woman who opened the door was the same girl, the same plain face, the same gentle eyes, the same sweet smile, the same cut of hair. Time had only touched the corners of her mouth, had drawn the lips back and down, had brushed her cheeks delicately with shadow, hollowed them slightly. That was all. Even her voice was a girl's voice. What is it? What do you want? I'm uh, Danny Clover of the police. I want to talk to you about Mary Deming. Oh, of course you do. I'm practically the only girlfriend Mary has. Please come in. Let's go into the den. <laughs> I call it a den. I, I suppose a man would call it that. You said you were pra practically Mary's only girlfriend. I'm proud of it. I like Mary. I like her a lot. No matter what the other girls say about her, there's more to Mary than they... Well, they just don't understand her, that's all. Miss Hess... Mary Deming is, uh, what I want to say is that she's... You want to tell me that Mary is dead? I know that, Mr. Clover. I saw the afternoon paper. Here we are. This is my den. I, I was just playing some music and reading. I love that song, don't you, Mr. Clover? I, I play it over and over. Please sit down next to me on the couch. Thank you. Mary Deming was murdered. They were jealous of her. That's why they killed her. Who? Oh, almost all the girls. Some of the boys, too. All jealous of Mary, for their own reasons. You know, Mr. Clover, Mary once came to my room and cried because she knew how they felt about her. She never showed it, but it hurt her. That's why she went on those reckless, dangerous drives at night. She told me so. Still, she was voted most likely to succeed. They voted her that out of meanness. They didn't mean it the way it sounds. They, they didn't say out loud what she was going to succeed at. When was the last time you saw her, Miss Hess? Mary? It was in the afternoon, just before... She congratulated me. She kissed me and said she wanted all the happiness in the world for me. In the afternoon before what did she do that, Miss Hess? Before the graduation dance. In June? It's always in June, Mr. Clover. You see, Paul and I were going to announce our engagement formally at the dance, but Paul died. That evening he died. Oh? Uh -huh. Yes. I went to his house just before dinner to ask him... Well, to ask him did he really love me. He ran down the stairs to answer me and fell and died just like that, without any reason. I'm sorry. 
I'm very sorry. It's all here in my diary, Mr. Clover. The last time I saw Paul, the last time I saw Mary. My last entry, June 12, 1937. It tells all about Paul and me and... I'm sorry, Mr. Clover. Will you stay to tea, please? I did. Tea poured by delicate hands into delicate china. Smiles and chit-chat and small, fragilely iced cakes. Yesterday's time recaptured and held briefly until time changed and it was suddenly evening. The fingers on my arm when she showed me to the door. Number three on the list, Ona Webster, cheerleader, class of 37, the yearbook had said. Now, Ona March, married five years before to a Keith March. Address, 8020 Andrews Avenue in the Bronx. You got here. You finally got here. What? You are the police, aren't you? I called. I'm looking for Mrs. Ona She's March. She's in there, in the bedroom. I told you she would be. Come on. Look, I... I just came home, went out for a walk. There have been prowlers. Maybe I shouldn't... Wait a minute. I don't know what you're talking about. Who are you? Ona's husband. I told the policeman on the phone about my wife. What's the matter with her? She's in there, on the bed. She's been stabbed to death. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. An old friend of yours comes back tomorrow night, Luigi Basco. And once more, you can live that wonderful life with Luigi. So join us on CBS this Tuesday night for Life with Luigi on most of the same CBS stations. <laughs> There's a special hour on Broadway, the hour between twilight and darkness, dinner time. It's the time of the swarming into the earth because home is at the end of a long tunnel and walk three blocks. Or it's the time of the fast look at the translux, the run out into the streets and say, cooled off, huh? Coffee, hot dogs, cream soda, and the nickel tip. And Broadway tries to gulp its dinner the way it's seen ordinary people gulp their dinner. Wipes up the gravy with a second piece of bread and compares boyfriends, girlfriends, and recurring dreams. But my dinner time wasn't like that, because it didn't happen, because it was being preempted by something else, by a woman with a dime store knife pushed deep into her, by a man with a fright of death goading him, taunting him into screaming at me. Do something! Don't just stand there! Take her away, whatever it is. That... That's why I called you, police, because I thought you knew how to... Please, please do something, please. Take it easy, Mr. March, easy. We'll do what needs to be done. I'm, I'm sorry. Just that I... That's my my wife lying there. I understand, Mr. March. Here, sit down over here. Come on. Thank you. Would you like some water? Anything? No. No, thank you. Do... Do they always look like that? Huh? When people die. Do they always look like that? Who'd want your wife dead, Mr. March? What a strange way to say it. But then I suppose whoever killed her wanted her dead, or he wouldn't have, have done that to Ona. Who? I don't know. I told you I thought a prowler, a thief, maybe. But nothing's been disturbed, has it? I, I don't maybe know. Maybe you, Mr. March? No, no. But you understand, Mr. March, that you'll be treated as a suspect until we... Yes, of course, of course. I understand. Good. Now, there's some questions I want to ask you. Did your wife know a woman named Mary Deming? Once she did, there were classmates in high school. And you? I knew Mary. She was one of my students. Oh? I'm a high school teacher, science. Only I recall that Mary Deming was in my class when we read about her murder. You think Ona and Mary Deming... You think the reason... You fell in love with your wife when she was in high school, Mr. March? I used to watch her at the football games. She was a cheerleader. She was young, exciting. You, you know how a girl can be. You fell in love with her then? I suppose so. But I didn't know it until five years ago. We met again by chance in a theater. After a while, we got married. Your wife and Mary Deming, were they 
friendly? Did they go around together, have the same boyfriends, things like that? I honestly don't know. Only and I almost forgot we'd known each other in high school. We hardly ever talked about it. Mr. March, how well did you know Mary Demi? What? How well did I know her? Uh huh. Only as a student. You never saw or talked to her after she left high school? No. And Mrs. March, did she ever see or talk to Mary Demi? Well, if she did, she never told me. What? What's that? I'll see. It's the police you called for, Mr. March. I'll let them in. Hi, Danny. Oh, Gino. Come in. I brought you what to eat, Danny. A box lunch for supper. <laughs> Thanks. Put it down. I'll eat it later. Okay. I already peeked in mine, Danny. I got an apple. How about you? Well, probably an apple. Box lunches never change. Oh, I don't know. Once I found a dollar bill in mine. Gino, I... Once I found an Easterling Sterling Silver Spoon with which to eat my potato salad. Gino, I... I guess I'm born lucky. Gino, please, I'm tired. I've had a tough day. Two people have been killed, and I'm no closer now to the answer than I was I'm when you... I'm sorry. Do you have anything to tell me, Gino, about Mary Damming or Ona March? No, Danny. I'm sorry. Danny? Yeah? What is it, Mugovan? Found what we were looking for. And what was that? Fourth name on the list, the one I couldn't trace down, Milliken Polk. Hey, that Milliken Polk. I was looking through that yearbook. That guy was the genius of the class. Got through high school in two years. The type I admire most highly. Where is he, Margovan? In the penitentiary, Sing Sing, a three-time loser, for selling oil wells to visiting movie stars and poor Texans. Don't stare at me, Danny. So his education turned him into a con man. So kill me. How come you had such a hard time finding him? Polk had eight aliases. I tracked down one, he'd suddenly dissolve into another man. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, Danny, it's too late to drive up to Sing Sing tonight. You haven't eaten your supper. Don't worry about it. Mugovan. Oh, yeah, Danny. Call Sing Sing. Tell him I'll be up in the morning and tell him to throw a guard around the cell for Millican Polk so he won't dissolve into another man. Stand right where you are, sir. Huh? Nothing personal, sir. It's just that the slightest movement, the slightest distraction upsets the delicately balanced mental processes of my student here. Doesn't it, Jerome? Uh, yeah, it does do that, Professor. Uh, just what you said it does. Shall we show the policeman what we've learned today, Jerome? You are a policeman, aren't you, sir? I am, Millican. Oh, goody. Yeah, let's show the policeman what we learned today, huh, Professor? Go right ahead, Jerome. <clears throat> Uh, today we have learned that uh, energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. That's excellent, Jerome. Excellent. Isn't it, sir? Excellent. And now will you tell me about the Pythagorean theory? Uh, please, Professor. Even the slough said I was excellent. Later, Jerome. First we must find out what the slough wants with us. What is it you want with us, sir? Only you, Melican. Thank you, sir. You may take a recess, Jerome. But the Pythagorean... Take a recess, Jerome. Mm. And now, sir, we are in effect alone. What can I do for you? You went to high school with Mary Deming. My congratulations, sir. However did you track me down to this, my private lair? I thought I'd successfully wiped out that puerile phase of my life. Not quite, Professor. Now that you've found me, I suppose you want all I can give you on Mary Deming. And uh, let me see. Ona March, Neona Webster. Am I right, sir? How did you... I keep up with things, newspapers, magazines. I'm the uh, institution's librarian. I assumed it was only a matter of time before one of you would appear asking me what you're asking me. You assumed right. So? I don't suppose you would arrange for this favor of little time off, say, a furlough, so to speak? Uh-uh. I thought not, sir. About Mary, most... Delicious girl, provocative, stimulating, quite an experience to a youth who had the intelligence to appreciate her qualities as I did. You knew her well. Let's put it this way, sir. When I was in high school, I'd put my brain against any football letter on the campus. Mary was quite interested in me till I tired of her, threw her to the athletes. What about Ono Webster? A bore, always turning cartwheels, screaming through a megaphone... Ah, Mary, Mary. You really like Mary, huh, Professor? There were so many things about Mary to like. 
Like the way she could wriggle out of trouble. All these years, in trouble, out of trouble, like putting on and taking off a nightgown. Always somebody to take care of Mary. You have any theories, Millican, as to who might want the girl's dad? I haven't wasted my brains on it, sir. For the past five years, I've been occupied with Jerome. Now, Professor, now you're going to tell me about the Pythagorean theory? Now, Jerome. I'm sorry, sir, I'm calling my class to order. Goodbye, sir. And the things Millick and Polk had told me had their own place with the fragments I'd gathered up about two women. Ona March, cheerleader. Mary Deming, most likely to succeed. Classmates of the year 1937. Ona, the respectable wife of a respectable man who lived in a respectable house. Mary, a woman whose youth fled in a hurry because Mary was in a hurry. Too much of one. Back at headquarters, I went over a police record again. Reckless driving, 1937, license revoked. Drunk driving, 1939, fined $100. One night spent in jail, then released, fine paid. Drunk and disorderly, 1941, fined $50 in 30 days. Sentence suspended, fine paid. Went like that, fine paid, fine paid. Then a felony a year ago, shoplifting. But a lenient judge changed it to read petty theft. Fine $500 in probation, fine paid. The fine was always paid. Go back again and start all over. In 1939, the money for the fine was furnished by Joe Sage, bail bondsman. And in 1940, by Joe Sage, all of them, every one of them. Maybe Joe Sage had a fragment to hand me, too. Yo, what is... Oh, hello, Danny. I didn't recognize you. The light in here. <laughs> Maybe it's because you haven't been in here so long. I need some help, Joe. For you, the house. Thanks. About a client of yours. Except about clients. Ah, oh, Danny, you know in this bail bonding profession we ain't required to give information about clients. Like a doctor, like a lawyer, Danny. Look, you're talking to me, Joe. You know as well as I we can subpoena your books. Sure you could. With a good reason. Try murder. Which of my clients do you wish to ask me about, Danny? Mary Deming. Like the back of my hand. I know that well. Good. You know, tell me all about it. Sure. Here is a dame who used to get herself into trouble peck after peck. Drunk driving, disturbing, heisting underwear. Little things, but you could count on it. And her fines got paid every time. I'm just trying to find out how Mary could afford to pay you back. You'll know I went her fines, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Because I had a standing order. About ten years ago, a man came to me and he said, this girl, Mary Deming, ever gets into trouble, help her. This man said he would personally guarantee I would be paid back. What man? A professor, high school teacher. He wrote after the word business on my client's card. Named Keith March? Named Keith March. Why do you ask me questions when you know the answers? Oh, Mr. Clover, please come in. Thanks. I will. I was expecting you sooner. I came back to check something with you. Yes? You said you hardly knew Mary Deming. You only knew her as a student. Would you like to add to that, Mr. March? No. Why should I? You were in love with her, weren't you? You're being ridiculous. It wasn't Ona you watched in school. It was Mary, because you were in love with her. What are you talking about? She was a child. Your wife's age. How old are you now, Mr. March? 39. 13 years ago, you were 26, just starting out as a teacher. A man 26 can fall in love with a 17-year-old girl. There's nothing unusual in that. But I still don't Every see... time Mary got in trouble with the police, you got her off, got her fines paid. We have records that you help Mary. Why should you do that? Mary... Mary... Mary's the kind of a girl who never looks twice at a man like me. You'd have to take my word for that. I helped her. Why? Because the times I helped, paid money to help her. She would thank me, let me do other things for her. There's there's this, Mr. Clover. What? I did love Mary. Then why do you accuse me of killing her? You didn't, did you? No. I told you I loved her. Sometimes I hated myself for it. But I loved her. But you know who killed her, don't you? So do you. Your wife? She hated Mary. Hated her for what she could do to me. I never kept it a secret from Ona. That's why 
Ona killed her. That's why you killed Ona. From my point of view, that was the only thing to do. Ona had killed the thing I loved. After Mary was dead, nothing had any value. Not even taking another life. You understand that, don't you? Let's go. It's not going to be that easy. Keep away from that desk. I'm going to kill you, Mr. Clover. <laughs> you're, a, you're a fool, Mr. Clover. <laughs> you, you did just, just what I wanted, wanted you to do. I wanted to die. It's all I wanted. You fell into my trap. I didn't have the nerve to do away with myself. So I used you. Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. Danny, Gino, get an ambulance up to 8020 Andrews Street in the Bronx. Roger, we'll call. Anything serious? Just a shoulder wound. Nothing serious. Who, Danny? Not you? Not me, Gino. The man who lived to go on trial for murder. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to. Erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory. The street is lettered with odds and ends. Fit them together in any design you want. Only nothing slips into place. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in tonight's cast were Jay Novello, Hi, Averbeck, Peggy Weber, Sammy Hill, Lou Merrill, and Jack Crucian. Broadway's My Beat, with Anthony Ross as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Where your safest bet is on the time of day. And even that they'll fix if they can figure an angle. It's not a street, it's a merry-go-round. Where you can't tell whether that pretty girl sitting over there in the convertible parked by the curb should be called dimpled or double cross. Well, that's the street I'm walking, and I, I got a little time to kill before I check in at the precinct station house, so I decide to look in at Stillman's Gymnasium, where box fighters work out, and watch the kids spar a few rounds. How's it, Lieutenant? Usual bunch of two-bit gamblers and matchmakers standing around on the sidewalk outside. And upstairs, a mob of guys watching the two practices. I see a fight manager I know called Jack Siegel. He sees me, too. Hey, Lieutenant, you're up early today. <laughs> Jack, boy, you're looking good. Hog fat, Danny. The habit of eating. Well, I hear a lot of people speak very highly of that habit in my time. Who are you eating off these days? Is that a way to talk, Danny? You mean what future champion's destinies am I guiding at the moment? Have it your way, Jack. You got a good prospect? You mean you don't know? No. The leading welterweight contender? The best counterpuncher since Joe Gans? The pride of Hell's Kitchen? You don't know? <laughs> when the day comes that you don't have the latest sensation. Only or... this time for real, Danny. Look, look, ring one. The boy in the green jersey and sweatpants. He's a welterweight. Ah, uh, he'll make the weight. Hey. Hey, you know, I think I know that boy. <laughs> Terrible Terry Rogan. I teach him everything. Sure. Sure, he's got a fight coming up at the garden this week, hasn't he? And the winner to get a crack at the title. Terry Rogan, is he? <laughs> 
You know, I remember him when his name was Roganski or some such, and he's fighting in the police athletic Yeah, league. that's the boy. Yeah, he's good. I like these quick weathers. Well, that's all. He's gone three rounds. He's through. You, you want to say hello, Lieutenant? Yeah, I'd like that. Yeah, uh, so come with me. How are you feeling, kid? Okay. Some sparring partners you get for me. Uh, what's the matter with him? Keeps giving me the heel of his glove and the laces. All the time in the clinches, I get string in my mush. So? What do you think Perini will be giving you Friday night? Hi, uh, Terry. Oh, uh, this is Lieutenant Danny Clover. Terry, shake hands. Hey, I remember you. Lieutenant Clover, sure. Sure, the PAL fight three, four years uh, ago. Sure, sure. I, I remember you telling me how you were a fighter yourself years ago. Yeah, but you, that's a lot. Danny? This I never know. Yeah, you can look it up. Right after the first war, I win five fights in a row, and then yeah, uh -huh. then I lose five fights in a row. Look <laughs> it up. Hey, you better get your robe on, kid. Oh yeah, yeah. You want to come back in the locker rooms, with Lieutenant? Chew the fat. Yeah. So you're going at the garden Friday night, hmm? Yeah, that that's right. Say, Lieutenant, remember that night in the PAL finals? I was just a kid then, Jack, fighting feather. Lieutenant here was in my corner. Hey, what about Friday? Are you going to take this Perini? Oh, uh, who knows? They were quoting odds yesterday, Danny. Terry's two to one to take him. Yeah. You should have seen that PAL final, Jack. It was before I knew how to use my right. I win that final with just my left hand, right, Lieutenant? Oh, now, I'm more interested in talking about Friday night, kid. Jack tells me you win, you get a crack at the title. Yeah, that, that's right. That's great, kid. I know you'll win. I'll be betting on you. You better grab yourself a shower. Oh, yeah, yeah. I... Lieutenant. Yeah? You never can tell about fights, you know, Lieutenant. What's the matter? Well, it's just that I, I wouldn't want you to lose any money, but... Hey, 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 shut up, shut up. What kind of talk is that? Uh, you, you beat it to the shower. Tell her to give you a rub down before your legs tighten up. Well, I was on now, cut time. it out, cut it out. Do like I say. If it makes you feel any better, kid, I, I never bet big on the fights. Okay, Lieutenant. Come on, Danny. Yeah. Your boy is not exactly looking forward to Friday, is he, Jack? <laughs> For a two-to-one favorite. Ah, uh, let's get out of here. I'll walk you down 8th Avenue. Ah, sunlight. That gym gives me the Williams. I can't figure it. You're a boy trying to tout me off a betting on him. Grief, Danny. Do me a favor, forget it. Huh? He's like this all the time before a fight. Why, you should believe it. Two months ago, we was fighting at the arena. It... What's the matter? Hey, get that. Over there in that convertible across the street. Oh, yeah. Her. Oh. You know that? Mm. Boy, on a spring day like this, I could wish I were 20 years younger. <laughs> Say, wouldn't that break your heart? Yeah, she probably would, too. What's the matter, Jack? What's wrong with her? Come on, I got ulcers. Hey, she's so beautiful, she's done true. Come on, come on. But you know her? Who is she? Trouble. Trouble for my boy. Louise is her first name, Lindsay is her last name, but her middle name is Trouble. Oh? Five weeks ago, she turns up and he's been running around with her ever uh, since. Yeah, it's quite a car she's got. Is she in the money? Ah, not that. The car is the kid's. He buys the day after he drops Kid Leviton in the third. Oh, forget it, Jack. A young fighter and a beautiful like that go together like five and two. The natural. You don't help my ulcers. Ah, right, take it easy, Lieutenant. Where are you going? Back to the gym. I get thinking. When I get thinking, I get worrying. When I get worrying, I got to get back and have a look at my boy. I'll see you around. Hiya, Danny. What do you know for sure? How much, Al? Huh? Are you Ben Stillman's? Yeah. Yeah, watching young Terry Rogan. He goes to the garden Friday night. Oh, yeah, yeah, Rogan. What about him? Keep your money in your pocket, Danny. What? Big Sig Sherman's in town, you know. Huh? I'll see you around, Danny. Hello. Hello, I want to speak to Tony Florida. This is Florida. It's Danny Clover, Tony. Are you awake? Uh, what time is it? It's a little afternoon. Oh, mm. Danny, Danny, you know I don't close my club till four in the morning. Listen, Tony, Tony, wake up, will you? You ever hear of a guy called Big Sig Sherman? Hello? Hello? I'm still here, Danny. Oh. 
I take it you heard of them, huh? I heard of them. Very rapid citizens. Am I out of line asking you about them, Tony? You're never out of line, Dan. Well, what can you tell me about this Sherman? Big Sig is a businessman, Danny. A very big businessman. Yeah? He's a careful businessman. He likes to make sure of his profits, you know? Yeah. Yeah, where's he from? His home? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but he's got an address in Hot Springs, Arkansas. What's he doing in town, Tony? Do you know? Well, Big Sig is in the syndicate, Danny. I, uh, think you better ask your other questions from somebody else. Uh, but listen, Tony. Uh, a syndicate, hmm? So the syndicate is on this. That's all I need. We pause to say... There'll be laughter on the old Erie Canal and in a modern high school classroom tonight as Helen Hayes stars in the famous comedy The Farmer Takes a Wife on CBS's Electric Theater and as Eve Arden stars as America's favorite teacher, Our Miss Brooks. In The Farmer Takes a Wife, Miss Hayes will be heard as a canal boat cook who has to choose between farm life and the rip-roaring colorful life she is known on the canal. As our Miss Brooks, Eve Arden will be the object of a raiding party by a vi rival high school faculty. The bait for her services being a handsome male teacher. On a night known for its comedy on CBS, you'll delight in the expert comedy of these two great feminine stars as the Electric Theater and our Miss Brooks come your way tonight over most of these same CBS network stations. <laughs> And now back to Broadway and Detective Danny Clover, who likes to pick up his cigars and gossip at the same place, the Cleveland Hotel Cigar Stand. Well, hello, sweetheart. Lieutenant Clover, just who I've been waiting for. What are you doing Friday night? Are you on duty? Friday night? A visiting fireman was by here this morning and bought a dozen tickets for the fight Friday night, and then turned around and bought two more, the last two for me. Ringside. Mm, what do you know? I did not either. <laughs> All I did was smile at him and to say I wished I could get to see a fight sometime. You want to come with I'll me? I'll let you know later, Sally. Now, give me a handful of cigars. Give me a handful of money. And what I hear, it's going to be a fight worth seeing. This Terry Rogan, you know, fighting Patsy Perini. The odds are two to one, this character was telling yes, me. Yes, so I hear. Well, and from what he was saying, he couldn't understand why Perini was such a favorite. Perini's not the favorite. Well, this character said he was. He said the odds had changed overnight. You think maybe the fix is in, Danny? Did you ever hear of Big Sig Sherman, Sally? I heard of him. Big Sig, they call him. They should call him Sure Shot Sherman, the way he hates to take chances. Is he in town? Give me my change, sweetheart. Say, what's your hurry? I offer him a free-for-nothing pass ringside. I'll have to let you know about it later, Sally. I'm late to check in at the precinct. <laughs> What is all this? To sign you to the garden fight? Now look, Clover. I'm sure it's not going to be a square rattle, Captain. Unless I can just get the time. I to... need every man in the squad to work in this narcotics hall, Clover. Look, sir. Yesterday, Terry Hogan was a two-to-one favorite. Overnight, the odds switched. Now the other boy is favorite. Same odds. They'll get even longer. That's not evidence. Not evidence. Captain Force, do you hear what I said? The boy was a two-to-one favorite yesterday. He's now a two-to-one short ender. Odds don't change like that unless something's up. Well, you can see what happened. Whoever put this fight in the tank got big money down here, Detroit, Los Angeles, New Orleans, all over the country. And then somebody talked. The word has gotten around. But by fight time Friday night, the odds will be 10 to 1 in favor of Perini, who doesn't figure even to go the limit with Rogan, unless it's a tank job. If you really think there's something wrong, pull in some gamblers and ask them questions. You know enough gamblers. Yeah, what about your friend, uh, Tony Florida? I've asked enough questions already, sir, to make me feel this fight is in the tank. Now, I can keep it square if you'll just assign me to it till Friday night. Well, it's a waste of time. Oh, it's just two days, sir. Tom Donnelly and Donnelly's I... Donnelly's busy on the narcotics hall, and that's that. And you should be, too, and you will if you don't get out of my office in a hurry. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> Hiya, 
Terry, can I come in? Yeah, sure. Sure, Donald. What's up? I'm not supposed to be in bed by now, you know. Yeah, I know. Jack Siegel said he didn't mind if I stopped by for just a minute or two. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You wouldn't know why I came by, would you, Terry? Why, no. No, I got no idea, Lieutenant. Maybe to tell me to remember my right tomorrow night. Yeah. In a way, that's it. That was uh, certainly some fight that night, Lieutenant. I'm glad you were in my corner. I learned a lot since then. Yeah. Sure, that, that Jack Siegel, he's one smart manager. He's not too smart for his own good, is he, Terry? What do you mean? Something funny is going on with the odds in this fight, Terry. First, it's two to one on you, and well, if you wreck it, I figure it's an overlay at that. Then all of a sudden, since overnight, the odds get twisted around the way you are the long shot. How about that? Oh, well, that's, that's just gamble talk, isn't it? Who knows why these things happen? Yeah, who knows? Hey, Lieutenant, you don't think I'd do anything well, crooked, do you? You tell me, Terry. Honest, Lieutenant, you got me all wrong. Who's this Louise Lindsay, Terry? How long have you known her? Now, look, Lieutenant, just forget her. See, keep her out of this. What's there to keep her out of, Terry? Why, what we're talking about. I'm engaged to Louise, Lieutenant. That's absolutely straight. Where's she from? None of your business. She's my fiance, that's all. Oh, just your fiance. That's hmm? right. We're getting hitched right after this fight, if you want to know. Sure, sure. Congratulations, kid. Get a good night's sleep. I'm sorry if I sounded off a little. Yeah, that, that's okay. Night. Don't forget to keep your right hand up tomorrow night. Yeah. Yeah. You do that. Evening, Danny. I saved the table for you. It'll be quiet over in the corner. Thanks, Tony. Did the girl show up yet? Yeah, she's here. You're doing very well for yourself these hey, days. Something, isn't she? Black, black hair. I prefer yeah, I like that. that. It's on the level. With a blonde, who knows? Oh, the hair, yes. You could be sure about the <laughs> hair. And thanks, Tony. <laughs> Louise Lindsay? That's right. I'm sorry to be late. I'm Danny Clover. Sit down, Please. Lieutenant. Thanks. What's so important you've got to meet me in a nightclub at 11 at night? I understand you're engaged to that fighter, Terry Rogan. Yeah, I called Terry to tell him he wanted to see me, and he got all upset. It's no good for him the night before he fights. Tells me you think there's something phony about the fight. I was getting that idea. And you think maybe I'm responsible, that is. You've heard of the syndicate. Syndicate? No, what's that? You ever hear of a guy called Sherman? Sherman? Mm -hmm. Sherman. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've heard of a lot of Shermans, but I don't know any. What's his business? Well, right now I got an idea his business is bothering your boyfriend. Well, look, suppose you stop talking in riddles and tell me what this is all about. You know you've got Terry all upset. Hey, that's a big rock you're wearing on your third finger. <laughs> Mr. Clover, let me set you straight. I don't know what you're thinking. But Terry and I are in love, we're engaged to get married, and the day's been set. This diamond's no problem. Oh, I can see that. And I don't know anything about any fixed fight. The only thing I have to do with prize fighting is trying to see that Terry gets out of it. If he wins, he gets a crack at the title. <laughs> Why should you want him to get out of it? Because I don't want our kids to have a father with a tin ear and a buzzing in his head and a pair of broken hands. He's still young and healthy. Well, he won't stay young, but I want him to stay healthy. You really like him, don't you? You're catching on. I'm beginning to think I had you taped all wrong, Miss Lindsay. But if your boyfriend is mixed up in a fixed fight, you'll, you'll help me then, won't you? I doubt it. How's that? That's his business, not mine. They boiled you about ten minutes, didn't they, Miss Lindsay? You think I'm hard-boiled. I'll tell you something about me, Mr. Clover. I was born in the hard coal fields of Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. My father was killed in a mine disaster down there. That was 19 years ago, and I was only two. My mother had to bring up me and three others all by herself. If I sound hard-boiled, that's why. Now, all I'm interested in is getting married to Terry. We're going to buy a little business. Oh, yeah? What kind of a business is that? A dry-cleaning business. Maybe Maybe you'll send us your trade. I'll do that. Oh, Miss there you are. I almost couldn't find out where you two were. Jack, how are you? You know Mr. Siegel, Miss Lindsay? We've met. Hey, sit down, Jack. What are you drinking? Milk. 
What you do to my boy? You got him all upset. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. He calls me, nothing will do, but I got to come over here and tell you not to bother Lindsay here. Makes me promise Oh, him. I wouldn't say I was bothering Miss Lindsay. I was just... Uh, oh, uh, you want me for something, Tony? Uh, sorry to bother you, Danny. Oh, not at all. Excuse me, Miss Lindsay. What is it, Tony? The man you were asking me about? Oh, yeah? He just came in with a party. I told Victor to seat him at this table next to yours. There's a big man coming now. Right, Tony. Thanks. Uh, couldn't be sweeter. Right this way, please. Oh, hey, pardon me. You're, you're Mr. Sherman. That's right. Well, my name's Clover. I've been hearing a lot about you. You come to town to the fight tomorrow night. You could get a reputation for being a pretty curious guy. Oh, no hard feelings. Uh, I heard you were in town to see Terry Rogan's fight. I thought maybe you'd like to shake hands with his manager. Here, right oh. here. Jack Siegel. This is Mr. Sherman. Right. Uh, yeah, and this here is the Rogan's fiancé, Miss Lindsay, Mr. Sherman. Mm, how do you do? This the man you were asking me about? That's right. Mr. Sherman, I understand you've been bothering Terry about something. I won't say crooked because I don't know about that, but just don't get him upset. Mm, you, Siegel, if you're Rogan's manager, why don't you see to it he don't get mixed up with pancakes like this one? Well, now that you mentioned it, I think no, it's a good no, idea that... no, let's all keep our temper. Then tell Big Sig to move his load along. You've got some polite friends, mister. Ain't it the truth? So please accept my apologies, Mr. Sherman. I'll see you around. Mm, there's always that chance. <laughs> uh, whoever that was, Danny, he got my ulcers going again. Well, I don't know why he should do that to you, Jack. How about it, Miss Lindsay? You want me to give you a lift home? Yeah, I've gotten pretty sick of this drum in the last couple of minutes. Oh, by the way, you're going to the fight tomorrow, aren't you? No. I don't like to watch them. Well, then maybe you and I could listen to it over the radio together. Now, wouldn't that be fun? Good night, Jack. Sergeant. Yeah? Put this on the teletype to Washington, will you? Sure, Danny, right away. Hey, Dad. You're of mines. What's your business with them? I found a gold mine last night. Go on, will you? Get on it. Talk to that guy in Hot Springs, Lieutenant. Yeah? So? So here's all the dope he had on Sigmund Sherman. Give, give. See, picked up three times for vagrancy, once on the Sullivan Act, once for... Yeah, it's quite a guy. It's never an indictment, much less a conviction. Yeah, let's see. Operated racetrack, 1940-42. Swap machine business, 1940-45. Married, Havana, 1948. Got all you need, Danny? Yeah. Thanks, Sarge. Just make sure we keep a tail on him until I say different. Can you make it to the fights tonight with me, Danny? I'm sorry, baby. I got a date. A date? Lieutenant, at your age? At my age? Oh, I say it's business, Sally. No kidding. But you could do me a favor. Tell me, why should I? Well, listen. Listen, you know these unlawful citizens who take bets on various sporting events? Yeah. Well, of course, it'd be strictly out of line for me to know any of those characters myself. Are you kidding? But I would appreciate it if you could hunt one of them up. Place a sawbuck with them at the prevailing odds. Okay, a sawbuck goes on Perini. Uh-uh. I like Terry Rogan. Well, I don't know him personally, Danny, but didn't you hear? This is a sure thing for Perini. It's all over town. Nevertheless, Sally, do me the favor of placing my sawbuck where it'll do the most good... On Terry Rogan. Oh, no, 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 please, Danny. The boy goes on in an hour, and he's nervous enough now. Not but... as nervous as you'll be later if I don't get to talk to him now. Which is his dressing room. That one over there. You got a search warrant? Jokes. Danny, my insides are all churning around like a tornado, and now Which you is come his along. dressing room. Right here. Thanks, Jack. Look me up after the fight. Please, the no... Hiya, Terry. Hey, sit down, kid. I got news for you. Would you mind, Jack? Look, give me a... Oh, why wasn't I an insurance salesman or a bricklayer? Just a minute. Come in. Oh. It's you. We had a date, remember? Well, now, don't 
don't tell me you haven't got a radio. Uh, I'm just going out, Lieutenant. I'm, I'm meeting some friends until after... Oh, I, no, no, no. You can't do this. You can't stand me up. We made a date, remember? Yeah, but I... Oh, no, goodness gracious. Look, it's after ten already. The fight would have started. Ah, there's the radio. Hey, don't tell me you weren't going to listen. I, uh, I turned the radio off. I don't like fights. I, I don't like to listen. This is going to be a good fight, Miss Lindsay. You may Coming be surprised. Screen. And there's a left to the body from Rogan. And Perini takes another to the head. And another and a hard to the body. Like a whirlwind. And now Perini's trying to tie him up across the ring. And Terry Rogan gets in the left hook as they break. Yeah, this Rogan's really got killer in him tonight. They didn't tell me this was a grudge fight. But uh -oh, there's a right to the head and another. And a left to the midsection of Perini. What's the matter, Perini Miss Lincoln? The and now he's down. Perini's down. Three. Four. Five. You surprised, Miss Lindsay? Six, seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Terry Rogan wins by a whirlwind knockout in 117 of the first round. And what a contender for the world weight title this boy, Terry Rogan, is. They only fall over, and here is Bill. I don't think you figured it that way, did you, Miss Lindsay? I'm very glad for Terry, and glad it's over so You quickly. know something? He probably never told you this, but I'm the guy that taught him how to use his right in more ways than one. Mr. Clover, I I've got to go to, to, to meet him. I, I promised to meet him after the fight. I know you did, Miss Lindsay, but you see, by now he knows that you're not going to meet him and never really meant to meet him. What do you mean? You know we're engaged. Oh, I hand it to you, Miss Lindsay. You're a good performer. The trouble is your imagination is a little too rich for your blood. <laughs> you got going on that hard luck story about the hard coal mine. But there's no hard coal near Pittsburgh, Miss Lindsay. The hard coal is up around Scranton. But, uh... And about your old man dying in a mine cave in... There were no fatalities from mine disasters near Pittsburgh 19 years ago, like you said. Oh, no, I know a lot about you. Well, I lied about my age. I figured that possibility, Miss Lindsay, because you're such a good performer. I wanted to give you all the best of it. Then when Sherman showed up, you remember Sherman, Miss Lindsay? The guy you said you never heard of. Oh, you had to go call him by his nickname, Big Sig. And you never heard me call him that. You, you, you just... Bluffing. You've got nothing to go now, on. Now, last night, if you'd said that, you couldn't have been smarter. But since then, Miss L., I had a chance to ask some questions around. Oh, police routine. <laughs> well, I say, but let's not get, let all this talk upset our evening. Why, we got a date, remember? Yeah. A date? Yeah. You think we can be nice about this? Yeah. You and I are going to step out together. We're going to a place that stays open all night. A place on West 47th Street called the 16th Precinct Station House. Big Sig is waiting for you there. And you wouldn't want to keep your husband waiting, would you, Mrs. Sherman? <laughs> well, good work, Danny. You sure you got a case? Uh, nothing on the kid that'll convict him, but the other two. Yeah, the file we got from Hot, Hot Springs ties the two of them up. They were married a year ago in Havana. Yeah, must have been rough on young Rogan. <laughs> no rougher than it was on me. Had to be the one to tell him. First, he was just sitting there, bawling like a baby, you know? I've seen the girl. I know how he must have felt. Yeah, yeah, but that kid's a fighter. I could tell. The tears still wet on his face, he gets down off of the table, and I look at him. And then I begin to feel sorry for Perini. The boy he's going to fight. Well, I hope the commission won't have to lift his license. Say, uh, how about the manager, Jack Siegel? Oh, he's in the clear. Never know anything about it. Uh, where are you going, Danny? I don't know. I'll walk around somewhere. <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing. Yeah? What's that? She told him after they were married, they'd open a dry cleaning business. The only thing she wanted to take to the cleaners was him. It's midnight on my beat now. The street's in full swing. If you want to get to the top quick, Broadway is the place to do it. But there are plenty of guys around. Angle guys. Weisenheimers. 
digging holes to help you fall back to the bottom. I can only hope I find them. Those guys figuring angles on the gaudiest, the most violent, and the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, transcribed with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The quick twilight of winter has drained off Broadway flowed in the side streets, for an instant lingered on the sea edge of the steel island, and somewhere a switch pulled, a dynamo released. The avenue strikes fire, and the night has begun. End of a winter day, and you enter the room and died with it. Or the other thing, flung yourself into nighttime, and the loudspeakers to sob for you, and the crepe paper man dolls to dance for you, and the hawkers with the guided tour. Nighttime, kid, a way of life. And at headquarters, the file on the day's violence, close it. The desk, clear it of empty coffee container, tray of cigarette butts, the unfinished report dealing with alley assault. Staple it, put it in tomorrow's drawer. And the man who waits for you is a man of infinite patience. Take all the time you want, Danny. Well, thank you, Gino. Take the whole evening to close shop if you want. Well, I'll be ready in just Do a... not take into consideration for a minute that even now, Mrs. Tartaglia is biting her knuckles, tapping her left foot like this... Because the lasagna is sagging. Oh, Gino, I just want to... It goes without saying, Danny, how pleased we are to have you to a dinner at our house. After so many invitations extended, so many rejected for this well, and I'm that. ready, Gino. Get the lights, huh? And then we'll go, huh, Danny? And I will stop on the way for a bottle of wine. Danny, consider you worked hard today. Consider the lights are out. Consider... Danny Clover speaking. I'm dying, man. You want to come watch? Who is this? It's running away from me, man. You come watch how Joey Condon... Me, Joey. Where? West 49, 2312. Hurry, man, or you'll never make it. A man, Gino, hurt, dying. I'm sorry, Gino. I... Danny. Squad car now, and nighttime ride. Broadway. And leave at Crowd Ebb down 49th, 10th Avenue, and park the squad car. Look for an address. Find it. Rooming house available to transients and those tired enough to want to take advantage of the monthly rates. Name Joey Condon on small directory and small vestibule. Room 5. Corridor. Come on in. It's open. Open to the world. Everybody who wants a sight to see. <laughs> Ain't I a sight? Who did this to you? Ain't I a sight? I'll get some help. Oh, wait, wait. I ain't gonna be alone when it happens. Don't go nowhere. Cut like this. Just tell me who... Things that happen, cut like this. The way it flows out of you. I'm dreamy. You get, you get sleepy for the whole world. You don't hate nobody. You don't feel any. <laughs> Furnished room on West 49th. Cubicle of limbo. And decor to match. Wall where phone was. Pencil scrawled with the lonely names. First names of women. Some underlined. And end table. Cigarette charred where solitude had been ground and blistered into veneer. Other things... And this, the man who had lived it. A man named Joey Condon, dead of a knife wound. And do now the things of death. The call to headquarters to report it. To say, come for it. And search of a dead man. Wallet and loose cigarettes. And separate card and cellophane. 
Joey Condon, member of the Musicians' Union. And another call, and a voice that says, Joey worked the pinwheel club on West 5-2. Joey was the trumpet man there. Joey's had it, fella? And hang up, and in corridor, the familiar sound. Foot scrapings of the violence collectors. Meet them. Tell them about it. Leave them with it. And nighttime becomes the pinwheel club. And the rhythm of night in the narrow room is Dixieland. And the man who owns it all just can't stand still. It reaches him, he says. Every night, you'd think I'd get crass and jaded. But every night, it reaches out to me. What I told you, Mr. Robert... Avery. Say Avery to me. All right, Avery. What I told you, that hasn't reached you yet, huh? About Joey? Yeah, about Joey. I'll level... You're nothing. You know why? Tell me, Avery. You're nothing because you came running to tell me Joey isn't going to be here tonight. He's dead. I don't need that. What? One of the boys in the band don't show up. Nobody cries. Me, who bought them, I don't cry. They don't show up. We know they got reasons. Last night was Joey's turn. To be honest with you, I didn't expect Joey for a week. What are you talking about? Last night, some people took Joey right out of the band because they couldn't stand it anymore in a public place. Had to let Joey happen to them in their own place. Who did? The Woods. Charlie Wood, Laura Wood. Went mad for the horn. Took it out of here to a party last night. You know where they live, Avery? Ask the hat check girl on the way away from me, huh? She's very kindly to all. On the way away from me, huh? Nothing, man. Hi. Take a drink, bottles inside. What'd you go away for in the first place? Come on. What am I doing holding your drink? Take it. No, thanks. Where's your lady? Huh? You went out to get a lady, didn't you? This afternoon with the rest of everybody? All the ladies went out to get lads and all the lads to get ladies. Routine to keep the party going, right? Got three days worth of bottles. Started last night. Let's see, we can hold out till, uh... Hey, don't you remember anything? Your name's what, isn't it? See, you remember. Your wife's... Uh, Laura, see how good you remember. The party started at the pinwheel. See? And that's where you met Joey Condon. Where's Joey? You know where Joey is. I haven't seen him since... I... Since when? Hey, I haven't seen you either. You know something? What? You weren't at the party last night, today either. You didn't go out of here looking... Police. Oh, What for? Nobody's making a disturbance here, sir. Even Joey put a mute on his horn. When's the last time you saw Joey? I'm going to think about it. Um, I'm thinking about it. Right ahead. He didn't have fun, I guess. He left. About four o'clock this morning. Was here maybe three hours, and then he left. Where's your wife, Mr. Wood? You think I'd send Laura out? Well, then she's home, huh? Sleeping. Laura's sleeping and waiting for the fun to happen again. Go wake her. She's tired. This party's been going on. Yeah, I know, for nearly 24 hours. Go wake her. What for? I want to talk to her. You going to wake her or do I just barge right in? You don't believe me, huh? I'll show you. Laura. Cut it out. Bed's not been slept in, Mr. Wood. You know where she is. You tell me. Laura's not here. Hasn't been for a long time. For how long? Long, long. For how long? Well, she'll come back. She she left with Joey. You made me tell you. You made me say what my wife did. Went out. Where did they go? I don't know. Find her for me, will you? Find her. Please find her. 
And wait for him some more. Till the time when the concern wasn't distilled from booze. Till he began to finger the old scar on his cheek. Till he could tell me this. About five foot three. Blonde, 25. Wearing a mink coat and a dress. White. And a beauty mark. I'll get you a picture. And leave there. And back to headquarters and put out an all-points bulletin for Laura. And from one lead, legwork. Woman fitting description seen walking Lenox Avenue this afternoon. Cab driver reports fare answering description to Bank Street in Greenwich Village. Bartender in Greenwich Village reports selling a fifth of scotch to such person about 8 o'clock tonight. Desk clerk in Greenwich says he wasn't committing himself but try room 312. Three flights up and you gotta walk it, mister. Straight back to the end of the hall to your right. And uh, would you mind taking this bottle of scotch up to her she just ordered? Give the bottle and hold out your hat for a tip. All right, don't take off your hat. Here's a dollar for you, anyhow, to show you how. You're much. Laura Wood, aren't you? Yeah, here's some more money. Buy yourself a trumpet. Come back and play. Like Joey? Nobody can play like Joey. He's dead. You sure? Sure. I wanted you to be sure before I gave you an impression. Now I'll give it to you. Joey's dead. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Now that the inauguration is history, CBS Radio is looking ahead and planning for another great event of 1953, England's coronation. Yes, when Queen Elizabeth is crowned mid the traditional pomp and ceremony that has accompanied British coronations for centuries, CBS Radio will be on the scene. A great squadron of reporters and observers will bring you every important highlight of the historic occasion. In politics, in world affairs, in great moments of history like the coronation, CBS Radio is first because CBS Radio News plans far ahead of the headlines. The chill wind puffs down from the river. Broadway is a place of regret. The new dreams made for the new year show their first fray. And the golden girls are wrapped in fur coats someone else could afford. It's the time of the galosh, the noisy radiator, and the cold linoleum on the bare feet. And the mornings are filled with the numbing hours and dead cigarettes in bottoms of coffee cups. It's January's end. Snow time, muffler time. The time to get an invitation from your sister-in-law Bernice in sunny California instead of just snapshots. The winter room where I was, my part of police headquarters, new morning, new details. Detective Mugovan lighting his new pipe, and then a shiny Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Good morning, Danny. How are you this morning? Hi, Gino. Did you give my apologies to your wife? She understood, Danny. I told her what happened. She went over to her rocker, rocked, and when she was finished rocking, she said she understood. She told me to convey to you the message that her good Italian food awaits your pleasure at any time. Oh, thank her for me. I did. Detective Muggerman? Yeah, Gino. You're invited, too. Just as long as there will be no repetition of what happened the last time. I promise. It was only wine, Muggerman. How could I'm you... telling you for the hundredth time, Gino, I wasn't drunk. Then how did you do what you did? Gino. All right. I won't tell. Danny. What did he do at your house, Gino? Danny, Mrs. Laura Wood is outside for an interview. What did Mugovan do? Mrs. Wood, having spent the night in the pokey, is now in a sober condition and will be most happy to talk to you. This way to see Danny Clover. Oh, please sit down, Mrs. Wood. That'll be all, Sergeant. How do you feel? Well, next time, don't drink so much. I need you. You may need me, Mrs. Wood. 
You see, if you're innocent, you might need a cop to prove it. That's why you might need me. Innocent of what? Don't you remember? Joey Condon was murdered. You think I did it? Did you? You can drop dead if you like. I'll say, oh, my. Well, what can you expect, Danny? Your husband's a rum pot, too. Poor cops. I'll send you both National Geographic magazines and a fifth of seltzer. What were you doing in that hotel, Mrs. Wood? Drinking. Just wander around town and booze it up, huh? Yeah. I before last met a trumpet player. You know who, Joey Condon. Took him home with some people, then we left, did pieces of the town. We two and another fella. We got off for a while at Joey's place. Joey was through. But I kept going, me and the fella. Oh, I'm a girl with stamina. But then you'll never know. What fella? Can you imagine a jazz hound watchmaker? What fella? Name's Georgie Prince. Winds watches all day. Unwinds all night. Took me to listen to records. Georgie's place over his clock shop on West 28th. That fella's a walking mainspring. Mrs. Wood's lawyer, Danny. Show him in. And counselor to Laura Wood is a glistening man. Curve of sun on gold rim of glasses. A newly shaven and powdered cheek. On freshly pink fingernails flying open the zipper of the briefcase. The yellowed smile. The brief legal type curtsy. The ritual of the writ and sign on the dotted line for girl. Receiver, offer an arm, and when girl murder suspect like Laura pats tenderly a counselor's cheek. Duh, baby, baby. No gleam and glisten like it anywhere in the world. And they leave. <laughs> when the tenderness and light has trailed away, check a name against city directory, confirm an address, go there. And on a shop window slapped against basement brownstone, the name George Prince and a function, watch repairs. And inside, a man sits behind a glass partition, peering into a delicate mechanism of a lady's watch, bites a lip, does something to it, views it now with naked eye, then... <laughs> He's nice. Very nice. Uh, yes? Anything I can do for you, sir? You, uh, Georgie Prince? Uh, Look around, all alone, no one to help me. That makes me Georgie. Police. Uh, get out from behind that thing, Mr. Prince. You'll be able to make out the badge better. Eh? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so used to working real close, my eyes. Uh, eh, you sure please, all right, sir. You sure are. But, but why? A girl's been telling me about you, Mr. Prince. Me? A girl told you about me? I, I did a watch for her? Who? What? Laura Wood. You know Laura Wood, don't you, Mr. Prince? I don't think so. She told you about me? You were with her last night. What are you yes. with? Yes. Yes, I was with her last night. For a while, that don't make me know her. That, that kind of girl, you don't know her just from one part of the night. It'll take a long time. Impressed you, huh? Very, very much. And Joey Condon. Joey Condon, Mr. Prince. He was a part of last night, too. You, Laura, Joey. A very fine jazz musician. I read in the paper he was killed last night. I want to go to his funeral. It should be very big. You kill him? No. No, I... I'm a watch repairer. Nights I go places where I can go crazy, forget what I am, be somebody else. I don't kill. I've, I've thought about it, but I couldn't kill. Last night you went to a place like that, Mr. Prince? Oh, lots of them. Lots. With Joey and with Laura. She was his. I was along because Joey said I'd, I'd give Laura laughs. Then... Then what? In Joey's room, the three of us for a while, drinking, screaming. Then all of a sudden, it, it wasn't me she was laughing at, but him, Joey. And she says, uh, you're nice, Mr. Prince. You and me, huh? That's what she said. And you left Joey's place with her? Lots of after-hour places Laura knew about, just me and her. Places I never dreamed. And then I took her back here to listen to some of my records. Around morning, she started laughing at me again... Scratches my face, hard. Runs out, leaves me standing there. Uh, hey. Uh, what? You see Laura again, tell her I didn't mind. I didn't mind one little bit. Danny? Hey, wait up, Danny. 
Just on my way to your office. What do you got? Some rundown on that sweet character, Mrs. Wood. Oh. Very sweet character. I said, oh, Margovan. That's not the secret word, huh? Okay, run down on Mrs. Wood and E. Laura Brennan. Married Charles Wood three years ago. That's fine, fine. You stop me again when... Sometimes I get you in a bad humor, don't I? Is that all you got? She has a record. Record narcotics. Took a cure. Oh, and something else. A man once signed a complaint against her for cutting him all up. Cutting him? Yeah, with a bottle. man signed the complaint before Laura was brought to trial to withdrew it. That's interesting. What man was that kind? Chap owns a pinwheel nightclub named Avery Roberts. Uh huh. You've talked to him for quite a while once before, haven't you, Danny? Long enough so that he'll remember me, Mugovan. It hits you how different this joint is when it's empty, Mr. Clover. Hits me right here between the eyes. You want to listen to me, Avery? I know, I know. You're going to say to me, Laura. Uh huh. I was told you signed a complaint against her. For the bottle bit? Yeah, I'll show you. I'll unbutton my shirt. See? Funny bit she did on the torso, huh? Then you withdrew the complaint. And it eats you why. Uh-huh. It made a thing. What? It made a big thing in the newspapers how a girl cut me up with a broken bottle. Pictures and everything, especially pictures of Laura. Look, Avery... You said it eats you why, didn't you? Why I withdrew the complaint. I'm telling you why. Because Laura had her pictures in the paper. It's a slogan, Mr. Clover. A picture's worth more than a billion words. And a picture of Laura in the New York dailies and a rundown on her type excitement, it's only natural. What is? A fellow of the type Charlie Wood crowds me against the bar the next day, presses a wad of printed matter into my empty palm and says... For withdrawing the complaint against your girl. Charles Wood, her husband? Charlie boy. Avid reader of the daily papers. Student of photographs. Buyer for a lot of pain. A week later, he married it. What else? You don't get around much, do you? Just tell what else. Let me see now. Uh, There was a cutting of a little piano player in the village. That was with Laura's high heel. That was two years ago. There was the wrapping of a French horn around the neck of a French horn player, I forget who. And there was a scar on Charlie's face, just for Charlie alone, solid year ago. That's what else about Charlie. Yeah. You're not coming back here anymore, huh, Mr. Clover? That's good. That's real good. Well, hi. You didn't drop dead. You want to try for it inside? Come on in. You come for the fifth of seltzer. I know a funny bit that goes with Where's your husband? Oh, he'll be very good in a bit. I'll call him. A little later. I want to talk to you. For what? Joey Condon. One of the other times you said that name to me, I went like this. (laughs) Only louder. Let's pose this name, then. Avery Roberts. You gonna do what to a name? Pose it? Then what am I supposed to do? Get your husband. Sure. I've had him, now you can have him. Charlie! Shul! Carlo! What do you want? Get in here, pet. We got company. Bring around a ball of yarn sometime. I'll show you why I call him pet. Laura. Him, pet. I was just pitching you. What do you want here, Clover? I just want you to join this discussion we're having. Oh, Pet here's a real big joiner. What were you talking about, Clover? A man named Avery Roberts. What about him? I'm trying to figure out why you paid him off to drop his complaint against your wife. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Wood. That badge you carry makes you have a big mouth spread, huh, Clover? Tell him, Pet. Tell him why you settled with Avery. Ah. You saw my picture in the paper, Mr. Clover. He read about me. Now you know, Clover. Now you can be on your way. And Laura appealed to you, huh? I married her, didn't I? Sure. My pet got me out of hock, and I'm a grateful girl. Mrs. Wood, hmm? you've got quite a record. Leave her alone. Man wants to talk about me, pet. I don't mind. Shut up, Laura. How'd you get that scar on your face, Mr. What Wood? What difference is your that? Your wife, huh? We were drinking. There was an accident. I'm sorry, pet. 
Another thing I can't figure. What are you talking about? Your wife. I told you, leave her alone. When she drinks, she gets violent. That's my problem. And he's happy. You know what I do to my pet, Mr. Clover? Why don't you shut up? Why don't you get out of here? I fascinate him. He told me. When she gets drunk, she gets violent. When she... I've been a good girl for years. Then a trumpet player sets you off again. Look, all we did was have a party. Must have been a pretty dull party, Laura. Yep, a lot of dull. So you left it with a trumpet player and another man. The little watchmaker didn't matter. Charlie knew that, didn't you, Charlie? What are you trying to do to me, Laura? You followed them, didn't you, Mr. Wood? What are you trying to do to me, Laura? It's done, Pat. You followed them, and when your wife left, you killed Joey Condon. Listen to me. What? Well, Pat? You... You, you just listen to me. We're waiting, Pat. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. The things that have happened. What things, Charlie? Married to you. And what you made me do. You know something, Mr. Clover? You know something. What? Can you imagine a man being jealous of her? I was. Pet. Charlie. Carlo. Get away from me. Get away. Aw. All I want to do is kiss you goodbye. That bit. Come along, Mr. Wooden. The other streets never paid off, so you walk Broadway. And Broadway is different. It twists you into the nighttime and whirls you in your puppet dance with the spinning lights, rocks you, and tosses you up in the air, and bangs you against the gutter. And you can't quit, because this is the street that never does. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Laura and Whitfield Connor as Charles Wood. Featured in the cast were Sidney Miller and James McCallion. Bill Anders speaking. My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the exciting drama of people who walk the great white way, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. <laughs> The miracle of June slips down over Broadway like a golden gauze, and the street slows down for the burst of sun. It's the time of vacation schedules posted near the water cooler, and the words, the magic names, Catskill, Far Rockaway, Atlantic City, and you wonder how she'll come to you this year, on a sand dune of portable radio, or with a tennis racket and golden legs, or on a horse. It's the time to turn on the dream, cotton candy time, and carnival. Bleachers and hot dog with everything time. It's happened. It's here again. It's June. And in the afternoon in the East 60s, June gets an assist from the management. White stock in bowls on the lobby desk, gladioli in vases on card or tables, and ended abruptly at the doorway number 312. 
where death had intruded, where I was, where Detective Muggerman was. This man was found here in his living room by a newsboy, Danny. The kid I talked to. The door to this apartment open? Uh-huh. Left the money for the week's paper delivery on that table right inside the door. The kid would pick up the money, lock the door on his way out. No money left today, so the kid walked in a little way and so... Yeah. Shot up close with... Looks like a thirty-eight caliber. Yeah, about that. Been dead about two hours, huh? Place this time of shooting around 3 o'clock. You know who this man is? Sure, positive identification. Name is Harry Moore, age 41, construction contractor. Firm of Moore and Nelson. No financial worries, no known enemies, no... That's real good, Margovan. How'd you find out so soon? His wife. She's in there. She see it happen? No, she came in here a few minutes after I got here. Let's talk to her. Sure. Mrs. Moore? Mrs. Moore? Well, this is Lieutenant Clover, Mrs. Moore. He'd like to speak to you. Oh, you can't come in here. This is my bedroom. I'd just like to ask you a few questions, that's all. I, I feel very much better, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Huh? Mrs. Moore was at a tea lunch in Danny. She told me where. Mrs. Moore had six cocktails. I think it was only five. I was going to tell you because I don't want to lie to any policeman in the world. About your husband, Mrs. Moore. Harry's dead. This man told me Harry's going away and never coming back. And I must be very brave about it. Do you have any idea and why... someday, if I'm very good, I'll see Harry again. That's the kind of answers I've been getting, Danny. She doesn't look real drunk. You feel fine, huh, Mrs. Moore? Head's not spinning, nothing like that? Fine. Clear-headed. Oh, I'm not drunk, if that's what you mean. Not at all. I know what being drunk's like. Yeah? Oh, I do feel a little dizzy. And I know why. Harry's not with me anymore. Harry's dead. And I know it. And I know it. And I've got to think about it. Watch her as she turns away from you. The motion, tenuous, suspended, dance-like. Then a sudden twist and contortion as the sobbing wells like something from childhood. Watch her as she moves swiftly to a couch, throws herself onto it, and mutes her sobbing in a silken pillow. And it ebbs from her. Then she is still. Then sleeps. And this is the escape of the wife of the dead. Leave there. Leave now to check an alibi. Learn that Vivi Moore had attended the wives and girls' tea luncheon from one until four. The cocktails had been served, and poor Vivi had got tipsy and giggly and had to be put in a cab and told the way home. And thank the woman who was bored and exhausted with having arranged it all for the wives and girls. Then to the construction firm of Moore and Nelson, and the information from a weary draftsman that he was overworked, that Mr. Nelson was supervising the current job at 30th and East River, out in the sun. Then the skeleton of steel patterned and laced and riveted against the backdrop of river. The man with the straw hat tilted far back on his head. Yeah, I'm Nelson, Steve Nelson. Got something I can do for you? Police, Mr. Nelson. One of my boys, huh? Rough crew. Lusty. I'll go bail for any one of them. Pick them up and bring them to me. I'll go his bail. Not the crew. Harry Moore. I'll do likewise for him. Any time, any day. Got to tell you, though, as long as I know him, you're the first cop that ever said Harry Moore to me. That's going to do him any good? No, he's dead. He's been murdered. We found him in his apartment, shot with a thirty-eight. We figured it happened to him around 3 this afternoon. 3, this p.m. I was up 40 stories. There. You have a gun, Mr. Nelson? No gun. But ask my boys, they'll tell you I've got a whip studded with hot rivets. <laughs> they talk like that, and I'm so good to them. I ought to tell you something, Mr. Clover. What? About Harry. Not really any of my business. No skin off of my tell back. Tell me what? About Harry. About how for a week now, maybe ten days, my boy has been leaving me alone to handle this job. Hasn't showed up at all. I couldn't figure it. Harry's the type guy who was always right in there, made with a rivet gun, with advice, with bandages when somebody was hurt. Couldn't figure it until... Until what? One of my boys, one of the crew, spied Harry walking Skid Row. You know, the bar, eh? Goes to show you're never alone in this town. Harry walks Skid Row, there's always a guy to tell you about, a slumber guy. You know what he was doing there? Worried me, too. So one night I went down, cornered Harry in a bar, said, Look, pal. <laughs> That's as far as I got. 
Look, pal, I said, and then I dried up because I figure Harry's life is Harry's life. We were partners, not man and wife. I bought him a drink and said, see you, pal, and walked out. You know his wife? Really? Yeah, I know her. You know her? I talked to her this afternoon. The child that walks like a woman, huh? <laughs> that really. How'd she get along with her husband? Harry told me once. Said Vivi was a romance from football grandstands in school and nighttime bonfires. He married her. They got along fine, he told me. Sometimes ice cream and cake, sometimes champagne and off-the-shoulder gowns. <laughs> that Vivi. Quit in time, Mr. Clover. See you when I can knock off, huh? So back to headquarters now, to the photo lab. Obtain a picture close up of Harry Moore, only slightly retouched. Take it and ride the night streets to the Bowery. Go to the places, the bars, and the back rooms dedicated to knock rummy, to regret, to limbo, to the biggest beer in town for a dime or six empties. Show the picture. The shaking of the head means no in all the mother tongues gathered together here. Meaning, never saw the man. Meaning, you never been in here. Meaning, you're a cop, so get out of here. Walk the streets, show the picture, get the stairs. Get the stairs and the whispers and be walked away from. The policeman, the intruder upon the ten-cent heaven. And at the time when one day slips into another, the time of the sprawled man in the doorway and the bus stop deals. <laughs> and a little after that, after midnight, walk into another place, Benson's it's called. Walk up to the bar. The man behind it flicks a corner of soggy rag to make clean the area of an elbow. What's yours? Police. I know. Why? Here, uh, take a look at this picture. Ever seen this man? Why? Homicide. Uh-huh. It would be. Have you seen him? You said homicide. You mean he killed somebody? He's dead. No, I'm confused. Him? Dead? When did you see him? Homicide's about as big as it can get, right? That's right. That's why I'm telling you. Yeah, I saw this guy days ago. I don't remember how many, maybe a week. Came in there as for Joe Cano. I pointed Joe out to him. Who is Joe Cano? Big guy. Comes in here for the brew. Huh? Joe was there when this guy came in. I pointed Joe out to him like I told you. He walked over and talked to Joe. They went out together in a friendly manner. Joe's a big guy. Tough. Dumb, but tough. I was surprised. Where do I find this Joe Cano? I can tell you where he lives, if that'll help you. Uh, down the street. Second house from the corner, this side. I brought a bottle to him once, third rear. This guy dead, huh? I'm really confused. Joe was here, so you walk right in, huh? You Joe Cano? Big Joe Cano. Big. Big. What'd you bring to see the show, kid? Pennies. Buttons. Let me see. What's the matter with you, Cano? You hurt? Turn on the light, kid. You're gonna see a show. Turn it on. You're bleeding here. Take your hands away, me. Ah, you spoiled it, kid. You went and spoiled. He, like, crawled in under the tent and grabbed the look for free. You've been shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You take a seat, kid. Watch this. Watch me. I'm gonna show you how a big man dies. You watch this. You, you know something? All of a sudden... A few real small real... Broadway's My Beat. 
Written by Morton Fine and David Friedgen, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. <laughs> The June morning is a sheen on Broadway's pavements. The street is lustrous with the glow of chrome and the brilliance of glass, reflecting the summer walk of women in their morning trials. And Broadway leans against the neon railings, and times, handicaps, makes odds on how promises will run later this day, when the track is faster and the weather clearer. And the other diversions, the ones from out of town in flowered prints, the straw bonnet woven for big city wear veiled and tilted to the angle safe on crowded subways. The non-crushable linen, the freshly laundered seersucker, and the white purse clutched tight, held close to the body. So make your pick, kid, and walk up to the window and play it across the board. It's June, the month of the winning ticket. And at headquarters, the June morning has Sergeant Gino Tataglia in it. Hey, Danny, you know what? Hmm? What? That Joe Cono. The big boy you found shot up. Well, what about him, Gino? Sinking fast at police hospital, Danny. Still in shock, still unconscious. Dr. Sinsky don't hold out much hope. Wherever I am, Gino, you'll let me know when I can talk to him. Goes without saying. I've been thinking, Danny. I come up with several items about this, Connell. Hmm? Like what? Like he is on the regular schedule of roust by our boys. Our boys got the sneaking hunch this Connell is a gun for hire. A freelance hood who works for anyone with the price. Well, they got something to build that on? Two sentences for assault. Brutal. Vicious. No apparent motive. None that our boys could prove, anyway. This gives them these hunches and then Cano. Mm, well, what else? What else is, according to many previous tests by prison psychiatrists, this Cano is immature for such a big boy. IQ reports a child would be scared to bring home. Another thing, Danny, from technical, also an Encano. Well, any time you feel up yeah. to it, you know. Yeah, from technical. The report that the gun that killed Harry Moore also played hard with Big Joe Cano. I see. Uh, you get in touch with Mrs. Moore like I told you? Police hospital checked me a little while ago, Danny. Mrs. Moore is in the waiting room, cooling her heels for you. Like at your request, I got in touch with her to do. You did fine. Thanks, you know. <laughs> Other times. Yeah. Quiet and flowery. But then I think what happens here. Pain, sorrow, and crying out. I know what that means. I cry out. Sometimes at night I do that. And I sit up in my bed. Rowan comes to me and comforts me. Yeah, now that's your husband. I know. Before that. All the time. Since I was small. No one comes to me. We're going to go in this room, Mrs. Moore. I want you to look at a man. I want you to tell me... What man? Why? Why do you want me to do this? You must remember, it's my job to find out who killed your husband. Yes, that's right. Mrs. Moore? Yeah. Have you ever seen him before? He's very sick, isn't he? Very sick. He's going to die, isn't he? The doctors are doing all of it. I, I... I would like to touch his face. I know he can't hear me. Maybe the touch. Somehow he can feel it. Know how sorry I am. Have you ever seen him before? No. Mrs. Moore, this man was seen with your husband a few days before Mr. Moore was murdered. I did. And, uh, Mrs. Moore, the gun... That shot your husband, shot this man. Yes. Poor man. Do you know why your husband was with this man? Oh, no. Please, take me out of here now, Mr. Culver. And leave there, walking the gleaming corridors of the hospital again. Mrs. Moore takes your arm and smiles up to you, sadly, apologetically, sighs. Then thanks you when you put her in a cab and tip your hat to her. Find a restaurant and coffee now and watch the fat fly on his slow trajectory across the menu painted on the window. Make a pattern with the bottom of the coffee mug on the enameled counter. And think. 
A man respected, Harry Moore, dead. An assassin, Joe Connell, dying. And the questions, why and by whom? What chain of circumstance? Back to headquarters with it. Why and by whom? Hey, Danny, wait a minute. Let's go to your office to give you something. What have we got? Routine check, Danny. Bank account of Harry Moore. Oh, what about it? A week ago, he made a withdrawal of $1,000, even. And? Three days ago, Mrs. Moore made a withdrawal, too. Separate accounts. She withdrew 2000 And what? The day before yesterday, she put it back. Make sense to you? Uh-huh. A lot. Hey, Danny, you down there? Yeah, what do you want, Gino? So dark in these hallways, you can't tell out of from diesel, bub. Anyhow, Dr. Sinsky just called in the hospital. Joe Connell is dead. Oh. The good doctor said Joe opened his eyes and said, I couldn't take money from her. Not from her. And died. That mean anything, Benny? Everything. That's all I needed to know. You remember Detective Muggerman, don't you, Mrs. Moore? Yes, of course I do. Well, why shouldn't I? Uh, please, uh, come in. Thanks. Thanks. How are you feeling, Mrs. Moore? Oh, very well, thank you. No more six cocktails at one sitting, huh? <laughs> I told you I only had five. Oh, that's right, you did. I'd be very pleased to fix you something. I make a nice martini. My husband Harry taught me. Whenever we had guests, I'd mix the martinis and bring them in and pass them around. Harry would be proud. He'd say, my little girl made these. And the guests would all smile. And Harry would say, no, I mean it. My little girl really did make these. Now, shall I fix you up? No, nothing, thank you. Do you know why we're here, Mrs. Moore? That man you took me to see at the hospital. How is he? He died a little while ago. I've been sitting here all day making phone calls, arrangements for Harry's funeral, making out lists. When I set my mind to do anything, anything at all, I can do it. Mrs. Moore. Yes? Mr. Clover asked you a question. He wanted I to know. I know he did. He asked me if I knew why you gentlemen were here. I suppose you have your reasons. You'll tell me. One of the reasons was to tell you Joe Connell died. But you said that. You've already told me that. He killed your husband. And now he's dead. This man, this Joe Connell. Do you know why he killed your husband, Mrs. Moore? No. Or who told him to kill your husband? No. You're not drunk now, so you can think clearly. Do you know why he killed your husband? No. No, I don't. I don't. You've made all the arrangements for your husband's funeral, haven't you? I told you. Do you have a maid here? No. No, I don't. Beautifully kept apartment. I do it all myself. And I shop, and I budget. Harry used to say, there's nobody like my little girl to run a house. I do it all myself. But why don't you come off it, Mrs. Moore? Why don't you tell us about your husband, about Joe Connell? You're a capable woman. You're not a little girl. No more. No more. That's right. So it's all right to tell us about your husband and Joe Connell. I don't know what you mean. Honestly, the way you're talking... How did you and your husband get along? We were man and wife. He called you little girl all the time. No, not for a long time. We had a big argument. One day he screamed at me. This little girl bit got on his nerves, huh? Listen, I'm me and I'm nobody else. I'll tell you just what I told Harry Moore. I'm me and I'm nobody else. Harry wooed me, he won me. And I'm the kind of girl he married. Up to his neck. Cut it out, Michael. We know all about it, Mrs. Moore. How your husband searched the Bowery and finally found the man he was looking for, Joe Cano. Harry did things. A lot of things. He didn't have to tell me. A man has his privacy. I know that. Did you know he hired Joe Connell to kill you? Paid him $1,000 to murder you because he was sick of you? Did you know that, Mrs. Moore? Yes. One day when I was on the street, Joe got out of a car and walked over to me. He pointed a gun at me and told me to get in the car. I did. By the time we got to where we were going, 
Joker away the gun. We were laughing. You and Connell got along, huh? I never met anybody like him. He told me people thought he was dumb. But he wasn't dumb. I knew that right away. He told you why he picked you up, didn't he? He said Harry had given him a thousand dollars. I told Joe I'd give him two thousand dollars not to kill me. Joe said, all right. But when I got the money from the bank and gave it to him, Joe wouldn't take it. Oh, we got along fine. How? We went to the movies, Penny Arcade. Joe wanted to take me to Coney. But I said later, after. After what? Joe told me he was going to kill Harry. After that. Joe told you that and you didn't do anything about it? Harry wanted me dead, so why should I help Harry? Tell me, right? But Joe and I figured that out together. Tell me, how did Joe get shot? His room. The evening after he shot Harry. He was showing me how he did it. He said, I took this gun and I shot him. I said, let me see. He gave me the gun, showed me how to work the safety catch and everything. I said, like this? And I pointed it at him. And he laughed, and I laughed. I said, bang. And I must have pulled the trigger. Joe stopped laughing. And he said, you'd better go home now. Lights plume upward into the sky on Broadway, and night bursts open. The swarm starts its dance down the canyon street, and a little man stalks the heels of a drunkard. The place of darting eyes, of the fleeting smile, and whispers in the wind, and crowd and roar, and the empty hand. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a swamp that'll drag you breath by breath into its shadowed pools, or it's a meadow shining with golden light. It's a place and a time and a loneliness that reaches out for you, then beckons you into an airless room and locks the door. You get out or you don't. Either way, it's Broadway, My Beat. A man dies in silence and in dark, and the city sets up a shrieking clamor, and you're part of it. You you ride a scream through the crowded, heat-heavy streets, and then you hit a dead end. And it's a building, and a room at the top of the building, and it's a man lying in the center of the room while other men take notes on the history of his dying. All right, Joe, get one from this angle, huh? Yeah, hold the light while I focus, will you? Hiya, Danny. Okay, that's good. Got it. Now get a shot of all that food. Oh, what a banquet this guy hey, Danny, out from. Danny, come over here. This will interest you. It never interests me, Doc. What have you got? Al Dane, the novelist. Ever read any of his stuff? No. Neither do I. The wife does, though. Says she's mad about him. But she went mad over Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Well, let's have tea some other time, huh, Doc? Tell me about Dane. Hey. Yeah, well... Hey, first tell him about me, huh, Doc? Tell him about me. Oh, uh, yeah. Danny, this is Clem, Clem Pic- Picasso. Yeah, that's who I am. Picasso. Picasso? Haven't I heard your name someplace? Sure you have. Clem Picasso, the painter. I paint flagpoles. That's where it was. You were painting a portrait of a flagpole for Dana, is that it? No, you don't understand. I'm the real article. Let me tell you about me. Yeah. If it wasn't for me, you guys wouldn't even know Dane was dead. Tell me more about yourself. Well, I was painting a flagpole on top of this building, see? All of a sudden came a gust of wind. I grab hold of the pole, drop my pail of paint right through that skylight there, see? I look for spilled paint. I find a dead man. 
That is the experience that happened today to Clem Picasso, flagpole painter. Unforgettable. Uh, it'll live in my memory, too. Uh, you got anything to add to that, Doc? <laughs> Only this, Danny. This room is a fortress. Dane must have built it on top of his penthouse for a retreat. It's ventilated by an air conditioning system. The only source of outside light is that skylight, and that's at least 30 feet from the floor. Mm -hmm. There's no phone, and the room was locked and bolted from the outside. Dane couldn't get out. This place is bare. No writing materials, nothing. Yeah, like a tomb. Maybe he needed this kind of atmosphere to think. Maybe. All the boys found when they broke in here was Dane and that table, loaded with food, all jarred. Fruits, chicken, all sorts of good things to eat. What's the matter, Doc? You hungry? Just tell me how Dane died. He died of starvation, Danny. Huh? Yeah, all that food, and he died of starvation. Curious man, this Val Dane. Huh, Danny? I could have dropped it right there. Val Dane, I told myself, had committed suicide by starving himself to death, thereby obtaining new material for his next novel. That's what I told myself. That's how much sense it made. And that's why I couldn't drop it. In New York, hardly anybody dies in a vacuum. A man as famous as Val Dane never does. There has to be a close friend or relative to break the news to, and in a case like this, to question. It wasn't tough to find out that Val Dane had a wife, now divorced, and a city directory said she lived on West 79th Street. It was apartment 105. As simple as that. Yes, what is it? You're Mrs. Dane? Well, only approximately. Mr. Dane and I are divorced. I've kept his name for my son's sake. Uh, you're... Uh, Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Oh, how interesting. We've never had a caller here from the police. Won't you come in? Thank you. I do hope you'll stay until Jimmy comes home. Jimmy is my son, Mr. Clover. I'm sure he'd love to hear the experiences you'd have to tell him. Uh, in here, the living room. Yeah, that's quite a collection of glass toys there on the floor. Clowns, building sets, animals, and all in glass. Jimmy must be an unusual boy. Oh, yes, he is. That's all I have left in life, Mr. Clover, to make him happy. Uh, there's something I have to tell you that might make you quite sad. About Jimmy? No, it's about your former husband, Val Dane. He's dead. Oh, I'm so happy. Well, I mean, I'm relieved. I was afraid with Jimmy being on the streets... Then it might... doesn't affect you, Mr. Dane's death? I think I should be more sad if I read in the papers that a man I never met had died at the age of 93. I see. No, you don't, really. How could I feel sorrow for Val Dane? He was a miserable ten years thrust into my life. Why do you say that? Because he was a talented egoist. He cared nothing for Jimmy. He cared even less for me. We lived for him. He lived for Val Dane. Uh, when did you see him last? Two years ago. In that horrible cabin in the Adirondacks. He, he forced us to go there so he could write. And one more thing, Mr. Clover. Yes? When you write your report about me, put this down. Put down... Joanne Dane, Val Dane's ex-wife. She's glad he's dead. I didn't bother to tell Joanne Dane that her former husband had starved to death. I had a feeling she would have enjoyed that too much, and death doesn't need laughing at. But when I hit Broadway again, death was screaming at me in big black letters. Val Dane had become public property for a nickel a copy. You got the funny papers, too. I called headquarters and asked Sergeant Tartaglia if anything new had turned up. Something new had. Get back to your office right away, the sergeant said. There's a guy who wants to see you. He's hysterical. The sergeant wasn't kidding. Something in my office makes you laugh like that? The pollen, maybe? I can't help it. It's rich. It's the richest one I've ever heard. Okay, okay, come out of it. Who are you? Uh, my name's my name's Brooks, Lyle Brooks. <laughs> Lyle Brooks, huh? Tell me gently, what's so rich? Oh, if I think of it again, Lieutenant, I shall roll in your floor in continued convulsions of hilarity. And think of something real sad, like a right to the jaw, and tell me what's on your mind. Why, why, Valdane starved to death. Don't you think that's funny? No? Well, I think it's funny. What tickles you about a man's death, Brooks? About Val's death? He was such a pig, and he starved to death. Well, that lieutenant is humor. Category, ironic humor. What's your interest in Val Dane's death? I'm his ghost. Ghost, huh? Battaglia! Yeah, Danny? Now, what do you want? Book this guy for impersonating a human. 
Hey, that's a serious... Jo- right huh? now. The Taglia, book him. Well, sure. For impersonating the human, huh? Come on, you. Policemen have a sense of jest, too, I see. Come on, you. So I'll explain. I am Valdane's ghost. You're doing it again, Brooks. His ghost writer. I did much of the writing which is credited to our so literary Mr. Dane. That's why I came to give myself up. To give yourself up, huh? Did you have anything to do with this dying? Assuredly not. But you might think so. I hated him. Val Dane cheated me time and again. But this time was the biggest cheat of all. Uh, what's he talking about, Danny? I'm talking about the great fake, Val Dane's latest book. I wrote at least half of it, you know. Got no credit. Val said I would get credit. What are you trying to tell us? Just this. If Val Dane met with foul play in any way, I should head your list of suspects. Me and Cynthia, of course. We mustn't forget Cynthia. Oh, we can't forget her. Cynthia who? Cynthia Troy. Why, everybody knows she's the woman in the great fake. Heavens, do you mean to say you haven't read the book, Mr. Clover? Mr. Clover hadn't, but Mr. Clover did. The Great Fake, new novel by Val Dane, available at your favorite bookstore, $3 the copy. I bought it, noted it carefully on my expense account, and went home and curled up with $3 worth of vitriol. Because that's what the novel was. A book of hate, a sneering book, a book without humor. There wasn't a person in it, only caricatures dipped in acid. And the leading woman of the novel had been dipped deepest of all. It tweaked me. The next morning, I just had to see her. I'd been expecting a call from the police, Mr. Clover. Drink? Uh, no, thanks, Miss Troy. Then you won't mind if I do. Uh, no. I realize it's before noon, but then I haven't had my breakfast yet. You sure you won't have a drink? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, just why had you been expecting a call from the police, Miss Troy? <laughs> because I have no doubt about your intelligence. One thing you must know in my business is never to underestimate anybody. You mind if I ask what your business is? The same as in Val's novel. I give parties, Mr. Clover. I arrange that the unfortunate rich be impressed by their leisure and their wealth. By opulent and clever parties, Mr. Clover. For an opulent price, Mr. Clover. Now the question, Miss Troy. Why was Why I... were you expected, Mr. Clover? <laughs> the answer is a question. How do you get a man to starve to death? I've been asking myself that. You think somebody got Val Dane to starve? Undoubtedly. Val Dane was a man whose only love was Val Dane. He was too jealous of his love to kill himself. He would never commit suicide. Then you think he was murdered? I uh, believe I implied that, don't you? Did you kill him? <laughs> the idea titillates me. Yes, it's a rare thought. <laughs> Ask me that again, Mr. Clover. Look, Miss Troy, the social graces aren't one of my, uh, social graces. In your circle, how do you tell a lady to quit stalling? By telling her. Then let's quit stalling, huh? Very well. You've uh, read Val's novel, yes? It made a fool of me, didn't it? Is that why you killed him? Locked him in that room and starved him to death? I should like to have done that, Mr. Clover. The idea... Yeah, I know. It titillates you. Uh, you've started a train of thought, Mr. Clover. I should like to have locked him in that room and spent days of ecstatic joy watching Val Dane starve. I went back to the clean, almost domestic air of the police laboratory and waited while the lab boys checked and rechecked the coroner's report. No matter how you shook it, it came out that Val Dane had died of starvation. Then it caught up with me what Cynthia Troy had said. It would have given her days of ecstatic joy to watch Dane starve. There was only one place anyone could have done that. That was from the roof and through the skylight of Dane's death room. I took a uniformed officer with me because maybe that kind of ecstasy leaves a clue. Danny, I've been over every inch of this roof. There ain't a particle of it that ain't intimate and familiar to me. I'm also sick of the sight of it under my nose. Uh, okay, officer, you can get up off your hands and knees now. Uh, thanks, Danny. You know, Danny, maybe it'd help if you told me what it is we're looking for. I don't know. Thread of cloth, a cigarette butt, the smell of hate. The smell... Huh? Hey, Danny, you dizzy from the altitude or something? <laughs> no, no. You can go now, officer. I won't need you anymore. Okay. Hey, you know, it's kind of pretty up here. Huh? All the lights of the city. Gee, that reminds me. I think I'll take my wife to the top of the Empire State Building. It'll be like a second honeymoon. 
Well, so long, Danny. Don't stay too long in the night air. Yeah. There has to be something. Something. Hmm. Didn't make sense what I saw. A piece of scotch tape stuck to one of the panes of the skylight. I leaned down to examine it. And then there was something that did make sense. The sound of someone moving toward me. And then I... I whipped out my gun and ducked behind the jet of the skylight. And then it found me. When I woke, a sickly dawn spread itself over the roof and over me. I took inventory and found I was missing two items. A valuable hunk of skin from my right temple. And a piece of scotch tape. Just that. Scotch tape. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. A thrill a minute. High tension suspense from the word go. Dramatic excitement that builds and builds until it explodes in a smashing climax. That's Inner Sanctum. The great mystery show that's another of CBS top-notch Monday night programs. You'll find Inner Sanctum one of the most entertaining spots on your Monday night listening schedule. And remember, Lux Radio Theater returns next Monday, August 29th, for its 15th year of great dramatic presentations. Inner Sanctum, Lux Radio Theater, every Monday night over most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. Morning on Broadway is like any other August morning on a thousand other main drags. People are caught up in a salary to be earned, baseball scores and the heat. You keep moving and do the best you can. The best I could do was to try to push my way through a brick wall. Progress was practically at a standstill. But by now, one thing was obvious. I had a murder on my hands. Val Dane had been found starved to death in a locked room with a banquet spread before him. That in itself was something to nick the curiosity. But when I got too curious, somebody had taken a shot at me. Draw a line and add that up and you get a six-letter word meaning foul play. At headquarters, after I had my head bandaged, Sergeant Tartaglia was terse and intelligent about the whole thing. I can't figure it, Danny. Now, don't try, Tartaglia. If you could figure it, you'd become invaluable to the department. You'd never get your pension. Did you get what I told you to? Yeah, one piece of frosted glass, just like you said. Thanks. Where'd you get it? Now, Danny, where would you get a piece of frosted glass at police headquarters? Out of the men's powder room. Uh, you better hurry up with it. Yeah. Now, well, we'll tear off a piece of scotch tape. Now, well, we'll paste it over the glass like this. Uh, what are you doing, Danny? Pasting scotch tape on frosted glass. It's the latest craze. Now we hold it up to the light. Look through it, Tartaglia. Get up close and look through it. Hey, now you can see right through it. The part of the glass with the scotch tape on it, you can see right through. Hey, that's a neat trick, Danny. It's also a clue, Sergeant. The skylight to Val Dane's retreat was frosted glass. Somebody stuck that missing piece of tape on the glass so they could watch Val Dane die. Uh Oh. Taglia, suppose you were locked in a room loaded with food and you were starving to death. What would you do? I'd eat the food. Unless what, Taglia? Unless nothing, Danny. I'd eat the food. Unless what, Taglia? Danny, I said I'd eat the food unless it was po... Unless it was poison, Danny. You're so right. Tartaglia, I want all the food found in Valdane's room transferred to the technical lab right away. I want every piece of it analyzed for poison. I want the analysis on my desk as soon as possible. Right. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. Glenn Close Meshikov, sir. Assigned to follow Cynthia Troy. Uh, Okay, Meshikov. What do you got? At 9 a.m. this morning, Cynthia Troy entered the Fifth Avenue apartment of one Michael Green. Who? Uh, I mean, cream. Michael Cream. C-R-E-A-M. Cream. You know, like in cream. So I took a plant in the hall. At 9.15, I heard loud voices, which at 9.20 become a heated argument. Who is this Merkel Cream? Oh, him I checked. He's a yogi. A yogi, huh? Oh, that's interesting. These guys go on starvation diets to get next to their souls. Uh, thanks, Machikov. Stick with Cynthia. Hey, Tataglia. Yeah, Danny. Get my bed of nails. I'm calling on a yogi.
The yogi with the homogenized name, Merkel Cream, lived in a rich, creamy Fifth Avenue mansion with a high money fat content. The outside stairs were covered with a thick layer of perfumed oriental carpet. When you rang, a girl made of copper with bells on the ankles of her bare feet and a jewel stuck in the middle of her forehead opened the door with a scented arm motioned you into the presence. The presence was a muscular man with the body of a professional football player, wearing a plumed turban and an imported English tweed loincloth. He sat in the middle of the floor, bathed in the celestial glow of a baby pink spotlight. And then the presence spake. You have come. Yeah, Mr. Cream, I... Speak not when I speak. You have come. You said that. You have come to attune yourself to the eternal harmony that lies six fathoms deep in the cosmic sea. You will go into the cleansing room. Huh? You will go into the cleansing room and there cleanse yourself and attire yourself in a loincloth. You will find a suitable array hanging from pegs. The uh, panther skin for you, I think. Look, Mr. Cream... Have no fear. They are sterilized after each use. Now go, tortured one, go. Look, Cream, I'm not here to cross your palm with silver. How dare you speak to Merkel Cream thus? How dare you, savage? That's me. Look into your crystal ball and tell me why you should scream at a tortured one named Cynthia Troy and vice versa. How did you know? Don't answer. I will answer for you. You are omniscient, clairvoyant, like the me that is the true me. Like the me that is Danny Clover, New York police. I got a hunk of protoplasm named Meshikov who floats under windows and soaks up things like a fishwife's brawl between you and Cynthia. But you are clairvoyant. The Cynthia underneath Cynthia is a fishwife. She pays you to tell her that? Cynthia Troy is a disciple. Disciple fall out sometimes, as you know. I've heard. And Val Dane, he, he was a disciple too. What did you do to Dane, Yogi? Put him on a starvation diet for his eternal harmony? Then you've read his book. Yeah, he gave you a paragraph. Let's see if I can remember the exact words. The Yogi, a vicious parasite, a jeweled vampire, a stinking phony. Did I quote the exact words exactly, Yogi Cream? Dane died in a way that pleases me. He died in an agony of hunger. What does it matter if his exact words are remembered? To him or to me, what does it matter? Yeah. Get up, Cream. You're coming with me. I got a feeling you can give me better answers with your pants on. Do you believe that I'm a fake? You believe what Dane said of me? To put it bluntly, Cream, yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Maybe Dane killed your lush racket with his bestseller. Maybe you knew it would. Maybe you arranged for him to die. Let's go. Help me up, Mr. Clover. Yeah, cosmic harmony makes you weak. All right. You know I can't afford to go to jail. It would ruin me. Let go of me. If you move, Mr. Clover, I'll break your back as if it were a stick of wood. Let go of me. A little trick I learned from a man on Amsterdam Avenue. Ten judo lessons for 20 bucks. Worth it, don't you think? Ooh. Don't you think? I got my lessons for free. Well, send them back. They're no good. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. <laughs> now, my way, Cream. Let's do it my way. Oh. Well, what do you know? The yogi found cosmic harmony. Has to be a phone in this dump. Yeah. Headquarters, Tartaglia speaking. Tartaglia, this is Danny. Send a stretcher to pick up Yogi. Mr. Merkel Cream? Yeah, he spilled out of his bottle. One stretcher coming up. Hey, Danny, we got a report on that food. Yeah? Give it to me. Well, I was about to, Danny. You know, it is very interesting. But, Tagli, if you don't talk fast, order a stretcher for yourself, too. What about that food? Well, that's what I'm telling you. So interesting. It was not poison, Danny. Baldane's food was not poison. <laughs> Until the yogi was in condition to talk to me, I had to talk to myself. What kind of man was Val Dane? That was the big question, the important question. Locked in a room long enough to starve to death and he refused to touch the food, the unpoisoned food at his fingertips. Why? What was the mentality of the man? Once, long ago, he had been human enough to marry, to have a family. Maybe that was the clue. Once somebody loved him. Maybe his ex-wife, Joanne Dane, would be calmer now. Maybe she could divorce her memory from ugliness. Yes? Who are you? I'm Danny Clover, a police detective. Who are you? I'm the landlady. What can I do for you? I want to see Joanne Dane. 
Joanne's not in any trouble. She's a fine girl. What kind of trouble would she be in? Anna, I didn't say she was in any trouble. I just wanted to talk to her. Well, she ain't in. Where is she? Oh, Joanne's out for a walk. With Jimmy? Jimmy? What are you talking about? Her son, Jimmy. Mister, you got the wrong address. Joanne's got no son. Nobody lives here by the name of Jimmy. Say, what kind of a detective are you anyway? Yeah. What kind, Clover? Let's go find out. Oh, here are the vital statistics you asked for, Danny. Yeah? Hey, when are you going to take me to see South Pacific, Danny? Oh, any day now, doll. I'm just waiting for that inheritance. Oh, Danny, stop pulling my leg. Here. Know the vital statistics, Danny. <laughs> Read it to me, doll, because your voice is like honey. Read it to me. <laughs> Get him. James Dane, age four, son of Val and Joanne Dane. Died June 22nd, 1947. Cause of death, accidental poisoning. Death spasms took four hours. Remoteness of cabin and Adirondacks made it impossible to reach boy in time to help. Signed, Dr. James Robeson. Hey, hey, Danny, where are you going? I haven't finished. Danny, come back here. I've got some things to settle. I was out when you called before, Mr. Clue. Yeah, I know. Joanne, your landlady said you'd gone for a walk. With Jimmy. Jimmy loves to walk on a sunny day like this. Where's Jimmy now? Out playing. Joanne, I asked you before. Now, don't lie. When was the last time you saw Valdane? I won't lie. A few weeks ago, as I told you. A few weeks ago, yeah. Another question. Why did you go to see him? To ask him for money. I, I hated myself for it, but Jimmy needs clothes. You see, he'll be going to school this fall, and... I see. Joanne, did you take anything with you, anything that you gave to Val? Well, I... I I don't think so. I can't remember that I did. Food? Why... Uh, food in jars, chicken, preserves, things like that? Well, now that you mention it, Mr. Clover, I... Yes, I think I... Yes, Joanne, you told Val that food was poison, didn't you? Just before you left, just before you closed the door behind you. You told Val it was poison, didn't you, Joanne? What are you talking about? Just before you locked the door and bolted it behind you, you told him that. You pointed a gun at him and told him that. Why should I do that? Joanne. Joanne, listen to me. Jimmy is dead, isn't he? Jimmy dead? <laughs> Jimmy dead? Jimmy died two years ago. You know that, Joanne. No, what? I don't know what you're saying. The Adirondacks, one summer two years ago. Jimmy took some poison by mistake. There was no way to get help soon enough. You and Val had to watch him die. You're making all that up. You blamed it on your husband. You blamed him for bringing you there because it was so remote. No, no, no. It wasn't that way at all. Yes, it was. You left that food with your husband, Joanne. You told him it was poisoned. You knew he'd never have courage to taste that food after seeing the way Jimmy died. Your husband took his chances with starvation rather than suffer the way Jimmy did. Jimmy suffered? Jimmy dead? Yes, Joanne. He's dead. These glass toys are only a lie that you're making yourself Put believe. Put them down. They're Jimmy's toys. Your final revenge, Joanne. You had to watch Val die. Yes. You came back each night to look through the skylight. Yes. And finally, when he was dead, you came back to remove that tape. That's when you saw me. Yes. And I wanted to kill you because I was frightened of you, Mr. Clover. That's the only reason. I didn't hate you then. You've got to believe me. I didn't hate you. Joanne. But I hate you now. And I've got to kill you now, Mr. Clover. I've got to. Joanne, put down that gun. I'll kill you. <laughs> you. You broke Jimmy's toys. You broke them. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, all your beautiful toys broken, broken. All your toys. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. How can you forgive me, son? I'm sorry. Oh, you Hello. Beautiful. Give me the police department. This is Danny Clover. No, I don't want a riot squad. I want an ambulance. The doctor. It took 15 minutes for them to come, and in that time I watched the shadow soak up the remnants of her mind. How do you tell a woman her life is done? How do you fill it in reports? How do you make statistics out of it and file it in a ledger? How do you write sorrow as a number? How? Broadway's really living now. It's got a creamy yogi back in circulation. Cynthia is throwing a marvelous party for Patrolman Mishakev. 
And the ghost, Lyle Brooks, he's haunting another author. Broadway's jaunty now, and it wears a chip on its shoulder. It's flexing its muscles and daring the nighttime. And before it's over, it'll tear itself apart and laugh at its own agony. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, was directed tonight by Cliff Howell, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Into February on Broadway now, near the tail end of the winter wind, the frantic wind that drifts, that whips around corners, that gathers itself into squalls out of the secret hiding places it knows, then rushes down alleys, searching for what the world has left behind. And things happen. Earmuffs bloom under turned-down hats. Discarded newspapers wing low, then scurry over pavements and wrap themselves around hurrying feet. And home suddenly becomes where the coffee is. Wind of February... Beauty and nylon on a street corner. And above it, where I was, where Detective Dennison was, on top of Hotel Marquis, platform over the street ringed by neon advertising rates and a Roomba band, platform also serving the purpose of catching the body of a man who jumped or was pushed. Now hold the light over here a minute, Danny. I want to take a look at his wallet. Thanks. Name's Artie Blanchard. Home address upstate, Utica. Money in his wallet, too? Now let's see. Hey, look here. Five $100 bills. Uh-huh, about a half a dozen fifties. How much you find in this coat pocket, Danny? A couple thousand, I guess. I didn't count it. Must have been that much in his pants pocket, too. Uh, hold the light a minute, will you? Hmm? If these bills aren't real, they're close enough to it to make me happy feeling them. Nope. No what? This man didn't jump. All this money, why should Stick he? Stick around for technical, Dennis, and I'll see you later. And so it was this. Entertainment for winter night. Look down over edge of Marquis, and gathering to it, lifting face to it, the crowd people, anchored in shadow pools, wavering, blurring, floating faces on wind drift. But the constant thing, pierce and dark of neon reflected pinpoint and ring of staring eyes. And from swell of crowd, a shouter detaches himself, runs wildly the street, shouts violence, summons more spectators. And the whisperer, too, elbows crowd, walks to a doorway to edge of woman, makes his whisper, shrugs, comes back to spectacle alone. The entertainment, and leave it. Back into hotel now, and to hotel manager who offers his services freely, the use of himself, his master key, his shock. I, I, I can't get used to it. Happens on and off in this hotel. Last time, six years ago, a young girl... I, I took a whole month off. I just can't get used to it. It's Blanchard's room on this corridor? Uh, yes, yes. He seemed a very usual kind of man, Mr. Blanchard. Not especially out of the ordinary. Uh, for this kind of a hotel, I mean. He this was, was uh, his room, Mr. Hockstetter? Uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Will you open it, please? Uh, yes, I'll open it. I'll get it open for you. Yes, very usual kind of man. And his friend, too, the man who shared this room with... It, it... Oh, how unusual. How very... And all that money... All that money just tossed around like across the bed on the dresser. And, and here, a clump of it on the floor. Just leave it alone, huh, Mr. Hostetter. Huh? Oh, yes, yes, I, I didn't mean to. But, but you must confess it's startling to, to walk into a room, a, a man is dead out there, and there's all those bills just thrown about as if they were confetti. Tens, tens, hundreds, fifty. Oh, you were saying, Mr. Hostetter. Uh, uh, what sort of madness could have hit him? 
Well, maybe it was a kind of joy just before... I he... meant uh, you were saying someone shared this room with him. Uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, 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 Mr. Joe Tobin. Hmm. Uh, they registered here, uh, let me think, uh, yes, uh, uh, a week ago, from Utica. I believe it was Utica. I can check. Don't bother uh, yourself. From Utica, me and Hardy. Oh, Mr. Tobin. <laughs> I'm afraid we have rather saddening news for you. Uh, you Don't see... bother. I know about Hardy. Lobby dames are all excited with his name. What happened to him? One of your bellhops spread the word. You police? Uh-huh. I'm Joe Tobin. This was my bed and that one was Artie's. It's been like that for a lot of years now. Like what, Mr. Tobin? Hey, bank night in a hotel room, huh? <laughs> How do you figure, officer? Somebody shove Artie through the window, then toss door around like it was corn for your pigeons? I asked you something, Mr. Tobin. All that dough. Killers, Artie. What do you mean about me and Artie? How we were? Uh-huh. <laughs> Pals, friends, buddies, everything 50-50. Born and raised in Utica. Everything, but everything, half mine, half his. Finally kicked together 10 grand, come to this large town to buy a filling station. Artie had a brain. He said, filling station, Joe, in a year, double our investment. That's how we were. Everything 50-50. Except... Except what, Mr. Tobin? Except up to the point where it got squeezed out of him in a hotel marquee. That's where I cut out, and I don't die. I go back to Utica and live. You scared of something? That what happened to Artie can happen to you? How do I know what happened to Artie? Maybe it couldn't, but it won't. Utica's nice. Man can live there nice with five grand in the kick, real nice. Another question. Where were you tonight? Where have you been? <laughs> Very large town, lots of places to do. I did a bushel of them. Then I got tired, come back here, got the word about Artie. I'm still tired. You fellas mine, I lie down on my own bed, huh? And the dough on it, you can do One it. One thing, you. Mr. Tobin. Yeah. Yeah, I know. No you to get till I hear from you, huh? Oh. You know why? What? It ain't the same without Artie. That one little bit. Danny? Good morning, Gino. Yeah, what's the good word? Danny, if I am green this morning, blame it on my chlorophyll. That's a good word? On my soap, Danny, for I am not a greedy man. What are you talking about? This morning, before you came in, I counted $25,000 of which not a cent belonged to me. So if green is the color of Tartaglia, blame it on... That's how much money Blanchard had with him, not $25,000. On his person, plus what was found in his room. $25,212, of which not a sou was counterfeit. You know the last time I saw that much money, Danny? Oh, please tell me. When I visited my cousin Kendall. The one from Baltimore? That's right. The one with the bad table manners. Oh. The wealthy Tartaglia. He opened his safe for me once for my birthday and showed me. Can you imagine a man who can't even write his uh, name Gino. and ask him for the time of day you think he'll give it to Gino, you? Gino, please. With him, it's always just before 3 o'clock so he can go to the bank and cash another check. With him, it's all... Danny Clover speaking. This is Mrs. Miller. Yeah? Mrs. Dorothy Miller... 1612 East 27th. Yes, uh, Mrs. Miller, what can I do for you? I read this morning that Mr. Blanchard is dead, that you found him on his hotel marquee. Well, that's right. What about it? I was with him last night. My address is 16... I have it. I'll be right there. Of course you will. Bye. <laughs> of course apparent to you that I'm a widow. Mrs. Miller... You've but to look around you at this house, its femininity, its... its graciousness, the fact that there is nothing, no trace of a man in it. You notice? Not for many months now. On the phone, you said you were with Mr. Blanchard last night. I'm Let's coming see. to that. Do you mind? All right, go on. My husband, Les his name was, Les Miller, he died a year ago, and he left me this place... 
and a filling station, and his dying words were, Mary again, Dorothy, you must not remember things. Mary again. The filling station, Mrs. Miller, the one you were going to sell to Artie Blanchard? How could you have possibly known? Well, just tell me about Mr. Blanchard, huh, and about last night. But I'm coming to that. Let's make it now, huh, Mrs. Miller? If you insist. I've tried to get rid of that thing for months now. Not that it didn't bring in a nice income and all for a while, make it possible for me to do things, gay things I hadn't done when Les was around. <laughs> things Les would have died before his time if he'd known. But it became a yoke around my neck, and it began to lose money. After all, a woman is hardly cut out to compete on this level in a man's world. And you... And you know, offered it for sale, and Blanchard came to you to buy, and you went out with him last night. And... Of course. We set our deal, made arrangements to sign the papers today. He said something of a partner, and then he suggested we celebrate the occasion. Just Artie and I. He was... He was... Oh, what's the use of thinking about it? He's dead now. He was what, Mrs. Miller? You know, gay and flippant, little jokes, on team, sort of, and whispered into the ear. And I was having a very lovely time until... Until what? Until we went to a place I know on Broadway. A dance place with a jukebox and drinks in shadowy curtain little booths and Chinese food. And Tommy came up to us. Tommy? Tommy Jordan, sweet. He's a boy I met when I was doing Broadway one night. And Tommy remembered me. Tell me about Tommy. Sweet. And I remembered him, too. You know where he lives? On the second floor on West 43rd, corner of 9th Avenue. He once invited me to a party there, but, but of course I didn't go. And Tommy came up to you and Mr. Blanchard last night. And, and I introduced him to Artie, and Artie invited him to a drink. He was nice. And then something about a crap game passed between them. And suddenly I was alone, all over again. How oh, dear that, Artie. Yes, Mrs. Miller? Oh, but what's the use of thinking about it now? He's dead now. That's all, Mr. Clover. That's all I had to tell you people. But if you see Tommy, please be gentle with him. Tommy? Open up, Tommy. Who is it? Police, open the door. I don't need any. Go away. Come on, Tommy. Okay. So you're a strong man, so what did it get you? Get down from that window, son. One more step closer and I'm going to jump. Why? Get out of here, that's all. You jump, you'll wind up with a pair of broken legs, that's all. One story up, not so high. You want me to meet you down in the alley or what? Which is it going to be? Okay. Okay. Now... That's right. Now we'll talk. Don't hurt me. Nobody's going to hurt you. Don't touch me. All right. Are you Blanchard? That's right. That's who I want to talk about. I'll tell you everything. I started it. I'm just a punk and I started it. I talked to a man and... He's dead. A punk me. Started it. Just a punk. And he's dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When choosing a career, most people want to be sure that they'll have a job when they're through studying. That's why the nursing profession is such an ideal one for young women who are high school graduates and in good health. After only three years of study, graduate nurses can find plenty of job opportunities in many interesting fields. For information on your chances in the nursing profession, inquire at your nearest hospital or nursing school. <laughs> The finger of February sun traces the scars of a doorway, stains them gold, and Broadway listens. 
and walks carefully the winter of a room, opens softly to whispering of sun. This could be what was waited for, longed for, held in wind-driven solitude, when delight will be measured once more in heat shimmer and slow drift of white cloud, when a million suns will fling gold against pavement and lie on the cheeks of summer women. So throw wide the door, and you are mistaken. And mid-afternoon of February is the pallor of a Broadway boy named Tommy Jordan. And the room of Tommy Jordan, room of peeling wallpaper and light bulb shaded with photo from movie magazine and grimy souvenirs of his street, leather pillow, stack of magazines. Room where I was and Tommy and in a little while, Detective Dennison. You want something, Sonny? Cigarette? Glass of water? Name it, Sonny. It's yours. Go somewhere and die, huh? I'm oh, just worried about you, kid. The way you look. Last time I saw you, you were fancier. Younger, too. How old are you, Tommy? Older, like he said. I'm 19 since the last time he picked me up. You're going to let me talk? Sure, Tommy. You said you wanted to talk about Artie Blanchard. I didn't kill him. It's like I told you. Maybe I pointed a man on the way, but I didn't kill him. All right, kid. No argument. You're a punk, and you did something that got a man tossed out of a hotel window. That's a place for a man to die, on a hotel marquee. So we're agreed on everything. Take now, it easy, Dennis. Tommy? Last night I got word there was a crap game to be had on for fun lovers. Well healed fun lovers. When the word hit me, I found someone. Hit him with Body Blanchard? Him. Funny the way he walked right out on that Mrs. Miller. People like to know about things like that. I touch their shoulder, whisper to them about it, and they leave women. Where was the game? You know, I've been so nervous and excited since I read Artie was dead. Everything else just ran out of my brain. I clean forgot where the game was last night. Maybe this you'll remember. Who else was in the game? All I know is Artie. He gave me 50 for the tip. Look, he... Tommy, not forgetting you're 19 and all and you're pale and nervous and just a punk kid with dirt in your ears. Answer it, Tommy. Oh, look, what difference is a phone call now? Here, talk. Hello? Yeah? Yeah, this is Tommy. Listen. Give that receiver, give it to me. You gonna say something, Tommy? Uh huh. That's a good kid. Bob Murray kid. Tonight's game, 6 o'clock. Empty store on 10th Avenue. Moreland's novelty spelled right across the window. You got that? Uh huh. Whisper the word in a couple of ears. Oh, hey, another thing. No more hot seat totsies like that Blanchard. The gamesters are sad from this type. <laughs> Happy dreams, kid. Get your coat, Tommy. You're going out. So book him. Tommy Jordan, boy from Broadway, purveyor of odds and ends, tout to those with frayed imaginations. Conductor of tours round the clock with refreshments on the hour. Tommy Jordan, middleman for the moody. Book him and leave him. Back to the office, desk, pencil work. Work, segment of life devoted to the principle of the carbon paper and the triplicate to the coffee and cardboard container and the ham on rye, sips and bites between erasures, which also consumes time, which erases the day, which causes the night. Other chores, squad car with five policemen ride through city street, downtown to 10th Avenue, to empty store, once where novelties were sold. Park, place the men, two in front, two in back. Walk over to the front entrance with Detective Dennison. Yeah? Bob Murray? Yeah. Tommy said there was a game. Tommy Jordan. Hurry up in. Uh-oh. Just leave the door open, mister. The two boys in Boo belong to us. They're getting cold. Yeah. Come on in, fellas. Now, let's all of us go in. Such a good game we're having. Where do you guys have to low substitute? In the back. Yeah, yeah. Come on, I'll show you. You guys, I swear, every... Th fellas. A raid, boys. That's nice. It's real nice. Open the back door for them, officer. Take him downtown. I'm sorry, fellas. I you stay here, Murray. Snap it up, boys. Snap it up. Wait for me, Dennis, and I'll give you Murray in a few minutes. Uh, 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 is it just a little game? Yeah, uh, maybe a couple thousand on that table. So we're in that income tax bracket. So? So tell me about last night's game. A game? No different. About a man named Artie Blanchard. He wins. He's dead. Yeah? So I don't read the paper, so? You kill him? <laughs> I'm a hard loser, mister, but not that hard. How much do you lose? Mm, 12 G's, more or less. How much did Blanchard win altogether? I don't know. Cleaned everybody. Artie had a hot fist all night. Who was playing? Uh, just a small game. Yeah, I know, but who? 
Oh, let me see. Uh, Teddy, uh, Teddy Webster. The Lucas brothers, me, and Artie, that's all. You know where I can get in touch with these people? You're asking for my cooperation, huh? I asked you something. Wait, wait, sure, sure. I'll tell you where. I'm glad for the opportunity to help. Police, I'm looking for Teddy Webster. But I'm Teddy, for Theodora. Surprised? Yes. Delighted? Look, Miss Webster... Inside, inside there is a spring. You hear it? You hear the music? Come close to it. Come inside. All this day I've played it over and over and over. And there's the feeling I will burst. I'll explode. I'll find green grass somewhere. Miss Webster? Yes. How old are you? Put your hand here to my throat and you'd know. Eighteen, I've been told. Only at eighteen is it like... Sounds crazy to say this. Then you must say it. Were you at a crap game last night? Exciting. The shadows and the green table. Very, very exciting. A man named Artie Blanchard... I lost to him. And I think I kissed him on the cheek for it. Which does he remember, I wonder? How much do you lose? Ten thousand dollars. But I'm still ahead. Last week, I... Left won... last night, ten thousand. But I'm very rich. My father sees to that. And he lets me have this place alone, and he understands the things I want. Miss Webster. Yes? Artie Blanchard was murdered last night. Dead? But when I left him at the game... Which did he remember, I wonder? My kiss? I'm sure of it, the kiss. Let's go, Miss Webster. I'm under arrest for gambling? That'll be exciting, too. Very, very, very. <laughs> asking you to do is be quiet, that's all. Okay, let's try it softly, Mr. Lucas. How much did you lose at the dice game last night? How much uh, did... Please, you want to wake my brother? In about two minutes, yeah. Give him the two minutes. Uh, he's tired. He was figuring a system for Vegas. It tired him out. Very fine mathematical brain, but it tires him. How about last night? Did he get real tired? Not very, no. He hardly got to hold the dice. That Blanchard was all oh, very hot. My brother Ray must have dropped maybe 14 Gs. He stood there trying to figure out by mathematics how to stop this guy Blanchard. How much did you lose, Mr. Lucas? Compared to Ray, I practically won. I lost four Gs. Let's go wake Ray, huh? Oh, we have to. We have to. Ray. Ray, wake up. That's the boy. We're arrested, Ray. Hi, boy. Good evening, Mr. Tobin. This is Detective Dennison. Hi. Hi, how are you? Well, come in out of the draft. Hey, it's on the dresser. Well, I'm not going to tell anybody, boys. Pour yourself a drink. No, thanks. Well, what can I do for you? A few questions. Then what I can do for you is a few answers. Huh? Then I can go home to you to go. Anxious to get back, huh? As soon as you give the word. What are you going to do when you get back? Get warm, my way. Tell us about it. You got an eat about how it is in Utica? Matter of fact, yeah. Tell us, huh? You kidding? Look, Tobin, all this time we've been trying to be real subtle. What we really want to know is what you're going to do with all that money. My 5G. I hadn't thought about it. Might be a business. But you'll miss Artie, huh? Oh, sure will. Lots and lots. Nobody to go 50-50 with anymore. No. Nope. What are you going to do with the other 20000 Get him. <laughs> you got me with a question. What are you going to do with the other 20,000? Hey, Clover. Uh -huh. Are you sure you brought the right detective? This is going to sound real dull, too, Tobin. You want to listen? Well, we Utica fellas are polite. And... We got a ditty goes with that. You want to hear? I'll save it. You can write it on the wall at the pokey. Lots of poets down there. Here's the way we figure, Tobin. You and Artie, partners, 50-50 on everything you said to so yourself. Ah, I did that. So you're 5,000, Artie's 5,000, 10 grand altogether. Hey, that's good. Very, very good. Oh, this guy's a sweetheart, Danny. 
I'm going to enjoy writing him down. Ten grand, and Artie invested it in a crap game. I've talked to everyone in that game. Forty thousand dollars was lost, won by Artie. And? And this. Up against the wall, Tubman. Come on, come on, move. Oh, for what? Shake down, mister. Up against the wall. Turn around, face it. Uh, let's get your hands behind your neck, huh? That's the baby. Just what do you expect to find? Artie came back here with $50,000. 10000 half of it yours, and 40000 he won. We found half of it lying around this room. Where do you keep your wallets open? Uh, inside coat pocket. Oh, get it. Here, Danny, catch it. Yeah. Hmm. Bank draft of $5,000, Ruxton National Bank. Yeah, sure. I went down there this morning, got a draft for my money. That's an error? No, look. Yeah? I have to stand like this. Okay, turn around. What'd you do with the rest of the money? Ruxton National Bank, Dennison called. Right. This is the police operator. Get me the Ruxton National Bank on 5th. That's right. Safe deposit box, Tobin, is that where? Open account, is that what you did? Or is it in another bank? We'll find it, we'll check all of them. Or, or did you hide it? Well, first of all, we'll tear up this room as a matter of procedure. Oh, this is the police, sir. Let me talk to the head teller, please. Artie was going... Go ahead. Artie was going to steal it. Yes, that's right, sir. This is the police. Yeah, I'm glad to know you too, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, write down this name, Joe Tobin. Hang up. He... Hang up! Never mind. Go ahead, Tobin. He invested your money in a crap game, won, and all he wanted to give back was your original investment, is that it? Imagine a guy like that. Gambles my money without telling me, wins 40 Gs. All I wanted was my share, half of what he won. What you took after you killed him, huh? Threw his share right in his face. Then threw him out of the window. Well, sure. What do you expect? He was my part. A guy crosses a part. What can they expect? You got a 50-50 understanding, mister. Shaking hands with a guy. Buddy, guy crosses you. Kill him, huh? Sure. What else are you going to do with a guy like that? Broadway's given up now. The night is dying, and it's becoming another day. And for an hour, the fury lies sleeping. Then an engine will start, and a horn will blow, and people will run out from under the earth and beckon over their shoulders and, and start the fury all over again. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Anthony Barrett was heard as Joe Tobin. Featured in the cast were Barbara Eiler, Louise Lewis, James McCallion, Bob Sweeney, Benny Rubin, and George Peroni. Bill Anders speaking. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the trade winds blow in from the Hudson and springtime nuzzles against Broadway, it's a season of promise. It's the time for weather talk and what shortstops holding out for what reason against what team. The good time. The man at the orange juice stand whistles while he shellacks his coconut and chops his onion thin. And the fellow next to you at the counter gives you half his newspaper. And the blonde you met last night calls the office and tells you not to be angry. Have a smile. It's that time of the year. 
No smiles where I was, card or where the world ends. For death is cataloged on the other side of a swinging door, anteroom to morgue. The man in vigil beside me. As soon as I read in the paper about your people finding the girl, I had to see. I have to look at her, Mr. Clover. I doubt whether this is the girl you're looking for. Well, Mary Varden is about 32. She has dark hair that she combs straight back. Well, I know, Mr. Dorsey. We've got missing person, aren't we? For a week, you've been coming here. And, and the color of her eyes is blue. She's a very lovely person. Yes. Now, Mr. Clover, mm -hmm. this girl, this girl you're going to show me now. Not so... identified. Found in a cheap room. Asphyxiation. Faulty gas fixture. Probably accidental. Oh, what would Mary be doing in a cheap room? Oh, I'm trying to tell you. It... Well, please. Please, I have to see her. All right. I never expected to meet anybody like Mary in my whole life. I've been coming to New York regularly. But this trip I met her, that was two weeks ago. I asked her to marry me at the end of the first week, and she said yes, and then all of a sudden she disappeared. That was a week ago. That's why I've been coming down here every day to see if... Uh... Okay, Mr. Dorsey. Wait. Wait just a minute, though. Please don't let her be Mary. Go ahead, Mr. Clover. Well? Oh, the poor girl. Yes, sir. No, no. Truly, yes. she, truly, I'm sorry for this poor girl, and I'm thankful she's not Mary. You must understand, of course. Danny? Hmm? Yes, what is it, Sergeant? Mugovan just called. Homicide. Alley, back of West 3rd. Here, here's the address. Yeah. You all right, Mr. Dorsey? Oh, I'm all right. But, uh, I wonder... What? Uh, would anybody mind if I just waited outside? They'll be bringing other people into this place, won't they? Wait if you want. They'll be bringing other people in. Get me a squad car, Sergeant. Oh, hi, Danny. Mugman, what about him? Beaten, face, head. When we get him downtown, we'll probably find other marks. Looks like that kind of effort was made on him. Now, shine the flash, you'll see what I mean. Yeah. That brick over there, a little ways away from where his hand's reaching out? What about it? The blood stains on it. I figure it's what finished the effort, the thing that killed him. Where his hand's reaching Did out. you find anything that... Uh-huh, yeah, a couple things. Roll of bills in his pants pocket, 50 bucks all told. It's a robbery job. Let's see, cigarettes, uh, breath sweeteners in his coat, inside breast pocket, this wallet. Identification card, uh, name Tyler Gosden. Address Lane Hotel, West 39th Street. Case of action notify. That part's blank. Go finish up here, I'm Yeah, I'll make the time for it. <laughs> Just buzz me any time, Miss Tankersley. Uh, hold the phone, Miss Tankersley. There's someone at the desk. Uh, sir, just sign the register. It's right there by your elbow. Of course, Miss Tankersley. I'll bring it up myself. Bye. Sir, I said the register... Police. I want some information. Well, can it wait a bit? You see, I... Let Miss Tankersley wait, shall we? You sound pretty terse. You try it, too, huh? Some information about a guest in your hotel. Which guest? Tyler Gosden. Oh, what mad thing has he done now? Huh? Last week it was dressing as one of our bellhops, and Look, I, uh, all uh, I can say is that that wonderful couple who came here to spend their silver anniversary will never come here for their golden. Mr. Gosden was a prankster? He thought so. If you call using brown paper bags filled with water as bombs funny, if you call climbing into that potted palm over Mr. there... Mr. Gosden is dead. He was found beaten to death. Oh. Well, please understand... What? His funnies were never offensive, sir. At least, not to me, I certainly had no reason to dislike the man, so Who certainly... Dead? I... Well, sir, I wouldn't know that. I stand here behind the desk and offer the register and answer the house phone and do like that when I want a boy front. Uh, uh, never, never mind, boy. I was just showing the... That's all I do. Well, all you've told me so far about Mr. Gosden is that he was a practical joker. Well, that's all I know about him. He did these funny things and everybody loved him. Who were his friends? Well, he was friendly to everybody. Made everybody laugh. He had two very dear friends, uh, lady friends, who called often. And when he was out, they always left a number. 
So often that I think I know it by memory. That's good. That's very good. Uh, here, I'll write it down for you so it won't slip your mind. There. He'll really be missed, Mr. Gosden will, by those of us here. Sadly. Use the house phone for a call to headquarters. Check a phone number against an address. And in a little while, be given it. 58th Street, off First Avenue, near the East River. And outside, and city swelling now with night, the early night. The span to pace solitude, desire. Against a later time, when somewhere a trumpet will pierce, a woman will giggle, and full night will burst open. But now, the time of easier rhythms, the smiling search, and ride it uptown to a quieter street of river sounds and river longings, and a house softly lit, softly admitted to. Please come in. And into a room, lamp shaded in pink and fringed silk, and couch, velvet and rose pink. And in corners, cylinders of hand-painted glass holding sprays of flowering peach branches, pink blossoms, withered. And in a carved cabinet, radio tuned to the gentler air channels. And the woman of the house also. Oh, I could dance, I could dance, I could dance. Mrs. Pfeiffer... Dinah, the other name. So, I don't know. Dinah. And we'll get along famously. Oh, dance. I really could. This music is You so understood, good. didn't you? You understood I'm from the police. Yes, and you were called Danny. And you don't frighten me one whit, you don't, you and your police. I'm a deserted woman, you know, and I don't frighten easily. Look, uh... Seven years now, deserted. That Mr. Pfeiffer. Inveigles me into marriage, a glorious week of it. Then absconds with my heart, my dreams. Traitor. Deserter. And I, a woman alone, going on seven years now. You haven't found Mr. Pfeiffer yet, have you? That's what I've been trying to tell you. We found someone else. Tyler Gosden. <laughs> Tyler. That idiot, that clown, that love. What's the foolish fellow done now? Mercy me, if bail's required, I'll be only I to have... I found him in an alley. He'd been beaten to death. Tyler? Laugh a minute, Tyler? Beaten to death. Murdered. I'll cry. I really will. You see, I'm crying. I really am. Well, I'm sorry. You're sorry. He was fun. Tyler did ridiculous things. Once he put on a hat of mine, one of my fans, and performed. And other times, he... You're the one who's sorry. There are things I need to know about him. Things that, that'll help there. you. Now, I've cried for him. And I've remembered him in all the ways Tyler would want to be remembered. Now, what more could I possibly do? His friends, people Oh, who... I never knew his other friends. It was something that never stood between us. Tyler had come here, and Valerie and I had rustled up a little something. And Valerie? You knew about me and Tyler, and you didn't know about Valerie and Tyler? Tell me. Valerie Moore used to live here with me. All this pink, that was her idea. Where is she now? Well, let me finish, will you? Just a week ago, it's what we spatted over. I was so tired of all this pinky pink, and I told her right out. She spilled a pitcher of martinis right over my head. I ordered her out of my house. You know where she is? Tyler told me. Tyler said she had an apartment of her own on West 80th. 1924 West 80th. Dessert. That's what I am, dessert. All my life. First that Mr. Pfeiffer, after a week. And Valerie. Now Tyler. I'm gonna... I'm gonna... I don't know what, but I'm going to... Miss Moore? Miss Moore? The nighttime is in full possession now. 
In cubicle of room with the unlocked door, in the furtive dart and gleamings and probings of reflected light through a room into which fury had siphoned, had whirled, had torn apart, then stilled. Room where struggle had been, and reflected light fall on something else. On a woman in loose robe dangling from a light fixture, head thrown back in attitude of silent scream, and body turning slowly, swaying gently to the refracted rhythms of full nighttime. Night dance of woman dead. Of woman murdered. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. A new day of March opens wide over Broadway, holds in suspension its warmth, its winds, its pluming of sunlight, then lets fall. The process has begun, the process of the seeding of pavements with spring whisperings. And from the stifling platforms, out of shallow light reflected from walls of stained tile, the swarm, out of depths of earth where steel hurtles through pillared corridors, where chill underground winds race, the swarm. And at subway exit, pause an instant, bite a lip, lurch into the March day, and farther down the street and perform into office, into shop, in doorway. The day's opening flourish, hang the night dream on the time clock. And at headquarters, Sergeant Gino Tartaglia, a man with methods and devices of his own. Pardon me, Danny, but... Not enough sleep last night, Gino? I beg your pardon? Uh, well, what's the beg? You asked did I have enough sleep last night? I merely answered, that's all. Oh, uh, Don't mention it. I tell you, Danny, comes another spring, I am not going to place myself at the disposal of Mrs. T. Mrs. Tartaglia kept you awake, is that it? First, maybe the chiffonier was on the wrong side of the bedroom, maybe should be on the other side. So get up, hoist it to the other side, as I do not wish a debate. Then, of course, suddenly the bed is in the wrong spot. Should maybe be by the window so a lady could peek out and look on the moon in case she cannot sleep and so desires. So move the bed. Gino, uh... Come spring, Tartaglia suddenly emerges from his cocoon, sprouts the muscles. Every spring with Mrs. T and always at night when a fella... <sighs> and now you're awake, huh? <clears throat> Naturally. I you think so. If not now, where else? As follows. Concerning the deceased woman, Valerie Moore, whom you found hanging, a slight record. Oh? In December of last year, a matter of disturbing the peace in a Third Avenue bar. Pleaded guilty, paid fine, was released. In May of last year, an altercation with a neighbor. Seemed Miss Moore had lost her house key, was going around beating on neighbors' doors. Let me in, she yodeled. Book admonished, released. Such slight goings-on back a period of several years. Nothing big. Anything else? No, what else is? That up until a year ago was employed as clerk accountant in the mail-order firm of Metropolitan Products Distribution, Inc., Lower Manhattan, West 3rd Street. What else is? Has been living with a Mrs. Dinah Pfeiffer until a week and a half ago where you found her last night. Neither of these two ladies, one deserted, one divorced, employed, according to routine checks made by Detective Mugovan, as of now. Nothing else, sir. Who says this is what else? That up until his being beaten to death in an alley, Tyler Gosden was employed also at Metropolitan Products District Manager. Do you know? <sighs> A squad car will be there by the time you walk downstairs. Bye, Danny. Ride the morning now to 12th Street and find an address. And find a building directory just inside the doorway. Metropolitan Products Distribution Incorporated, four flights out. Past the dealer in stamps and old coins and through the glass door, the gray hair and serenity of a small man seated with a book and a smile. At next flight, collection agency, large man, ledger, and no smile. And upstairs again, Body Conditioning Institute, with sign proclaiming that a Mr. Wilkins, who military pressed 812 pounds at the Chicago World's Fair, will do just the thing for your particular problem with Mr. Wilkins' patented process. Up again, fourth flight. 
The long loft fitted with many desks and people. The young woman asks name and mission. Be directed to the office at the end of the room and be told by the time you get there you'll be announced. So past the desks and the people, and the mottos tacked to the wall having to do with thinking, watching clocks, and saving nine stitches. Office. Walk in. My name's Jeffrey Hopkins, Mr. Clover. Please be seated. Thank you. It's about Tyler Gosden, of course. That's right. Nobody needed him. Oh? Let's be honest now, shall we? Sure. This was his office. District manager. I said let's be honest. That's why I'm smiling. Go on. Now it's my office. Now that he's dead. Tyler Gosden was, let me see, a despicable man. Yes, I think that's the word. He played practical jokes. I've heard. Such as calling me on a Sunday afternoon and telling me I'd been transferred to Vincennes, Indiana. I'd pack and he'd call back. I've heard all about that, Mr. Hopkins. Right now, maybe you can tell me something about Tyler Gosden and a woman named Valerie Moore. Yes, I read of her dying, too. I'm sorry about Valerie. Oh, you knew her, too? After she left our employ, she came up here a few times, waited for Tyler. I did my best to entertain her. You liked her? How does a married man like another woman? An attractive, vital woman. One that circumstance demands that all he can do for is demonstrate how to take apart a key puzzle. I admired her. She was honest. And she and Gosden were friends. And what else can you tell me? The day before yesterday, Thursday, yes? Arthur Ellison was in the office. Who? Mr. Ellison, one of our salesmen from Richmond. He said he had once met Valerie through Gosden and he wanted her address. I got it out of Gosden's desk and gave it to him. This man's name was Arthur Ellison. Huh? Do you know where I can find him? We've got an arrangement with the Ruxton Hotel. Rates. You might try there. I think that's all the help I can be. Please excuse me, Mr. Clover. Howdy. Hello. What can I do for you, friend? You Arthur Ellison? That's right, I am. I'm from the police. Name's Danny Clover. I guessed it. I was wondering whether to go back to Richmond or just sit here and wait. Come on in. Thank you. Didn't you wonder about coming down to police headquarters and tell us what you know? A little bit. Then I figured why I rush things. Maybe you could clear this up without me. You were out with Valerie Moore last night, weren't you? Yes, sir. Okay, let's start from there, Mr. Olson. Well, I... You what? Got in touch with her. Why? She's a good sport. Nice lady to take out when you're in town. A lot of fun. Met her once through Tyler Gosden. After that, I made it my business to get in touch with her when I hit New York. You hit New York Thursday. Yes, sir. Went up to the office, worked for Metropolitan Products. Yeah, I know. Went up there, checked in, picked up some new samples, also Valerie's new phone number, called her, made a date for the evening. And you uh, tell me about it. Up here, right where you're sitting, she said. Told her a few jokes I heard on the road. I had a few drinks. Valerie said, come on, let's do the town. I said, hold your horses, honey. I asked a friend up. She says, friend? I said, hold your horses, honey. She said... Had you asked a friend up, Mr. Ellison? Sure, old friend from the road. Salesman in Notions. Ran into him in a restaurant we salesmen like to eat at. Told him to stop up for a drink. Who's your friend? Johnny, Johnny Dorsey. What's the matter? Nothing, go on. Well, funny thing happened. Johnny come up all right. Sweet guy, I like him. Lonely kind of guy, mostly. You should have seen. Seen what? Well, he comes up, and as soon as he gets in the room, sees Valerie, she busts out laughing, screaming, rolling on the floor laughing. Mm -hmm. What did Dorsey do? Just stood there, I guess. I said something funny, like, I've been waiting in the morgue. Then Valerie really laughed. and Finally, she got out of control of herself and said to Johnny, boy, is the joke ever on you? Johnny turned around and walked out. What about you and Valerie? Finished the drinks, went to floor show. I left her at her place. I come back here. That's it. In here, Mr. Dorsey. You remember Lieutenant Clover, don't you? Oh, of course. Hi, Lieutenant. Well, I'm all right. Well, sit down, Mr. Dawson. Thank you. Thank you. Detective Muggerman tells me that yesterday you waited a couple of hours at the morgue, then you left. Well, one woman was brought in, but she was older. It 
wasn't Mary. What did you do for the rest of the day, Mr. Dorsey? I wandered. I looked into the crowds. And... For Mary, huh? I'll always look for her. Tell us about Mary, Mr. Dorsey. I've already told you. Do it again. What do you want to know? How you met her, kind of woman she is, your plans about marriage, things like that. Well, you know, in my line of business, uh, that's traveling, uh, you meet people. And Mary was different. How? Shy. She was gentle. I found that the woman I could talk to, one who would listen to me. You know, I've been a long time on the road, and that's never happened to me before. So you asked her to marry? A half hour after I met her, I made up my mind I was going to, and a week later I did. But you see... Um, see what? Well, a man like me, he's always looking. Every person I meet, if a man, I say to myself, can this man be my friend? And if a woman, can she love me? And if she can, then I can love her. Now, sure, we understand that, Mr. Dorsey, but a couple of things you've sloughed over. Well, no, no, I haven't. Like how you met Mary Barton? I told you. Yeah, but you didn't mention Tanner Gosden's name when you told us. Well, I didn't think I... Oh, let's get off it, Mr. Dorsey. Gosden's been murdered. I know it, you know it. So let's have some details, huh? Well, the only thing I know is Mary's gone. What do you mean, gone? Well, she's vanished. I can't find her. You know that. Yeah, we thought we knew that, but not anymore. Uh, Danny? Yeah. Let's take a walk, Mr. Dorsey. Around this corner, Mr. Dorsey. Oh, Mr. Dorsey knows his way. You think you found Mary? You tell us. You tell us. <laughs> this is the yes. woman you were going to marry? Yes, the... I've seen it happen a lot of times, Mr. Dorsey. The murderer stands where you're standing, says he's sorry. Well, I... I'm not sorry. Okay, Muggerman. I'm not sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry. Well, let's go out in the hall. We'll I'm sit there and sorry. talk for a minute. Sorry. Sit down, Mr. Dorsey. Yeah. some water, Muggerman. Yeah. It all goes back to Tyler Gosden, doesn't it, Mr. Dorsey? Yeah. Well, the kind of man he was, practical joker. He was the kind of man... Here's that... your water, Mr. Dorsey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Dorsey, you want to tell us about it now? We'll help you. You met that woman through that sterling humorist, Tyler Gosden. That woman, Valerie Moore. Big joke was introduced to you as the sweet, shy, lovable lady you could talk to, Mary Varden. I waited so many years, I... I thought that finally I'd... Yeah, we know. Valerie Moore was just posing as a woman named Mary Varden. Practical joke, instigated by a prankster. Yes. They had their joke, and now They're I... They're dead. Because you killed them. They had their joke. I fell in love with a woman who never existed. She disappeared, and I looked for her, and I found her. You know, drinking with another man. And she laughed at me. And she told me the joke was on me. And it was. That was Thursday night. And Friday morning, you killed Gaston. Friday evening, you killed Valerie. That's a real busy Friday, Mr. Dorsey. You don't play jokes with a man's life. That's all a man's life. Well, what else has a man got? I guess many people like me, they realize early that their life is over, but they keep on living. They hope and they look, and in between, they just go on and try to laugh at anybody. You know, make jokes. That's why I meant it, and I want you to believe it. For what I did to those two, I'm not sorry. Let's go, Mr. Dorsey. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. A place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over. 
make a memory. The street is littered with odds and ends. Fit them together any way you want. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Howard McNear was heard as Mr. Dorsey. Featured in the cast were Mary Jane Croft, Byron Kane, Rye Billsbury, and Paul Fries. Bill Anders speaking. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. soft fall of June, and Broadway's heart beats fast. The girls press gently against currents of summer wind and wear the glimmer of morning sun on their hair, and their lips scarlet, moist. On their shoulders, golden dance of light, and their perfume is of summer fields, which mixes well with Broadway's own exotic odors, sear of electricity, wash and cool and scent of air-conditioned air, steam mist drifting from manhole covers, and Broadway follows close on the heels of summer morning, turns a corner, punches the time clock, darkens the day. Time of the transients, their place of sleep, Duane Hotel for transients, side street just off Broadway, rooms dollar and a half up, weekly rates also, place of desk gouged with the transients mark, place of dust on mirrors on which names and numbers have been scrawled, place of a room where a man lies wounded, dying across in a door bed, and where Detective Dennison was, and I was. Nothing, Danny. No baggage, suitcase, briefcase, cardboard box, nothing. Not even shaving things or a toothbrush in the bathroom. Uh-huh. A thing, huh, Danny? Well-dressed man. Expensively dressed. Silk shirt. Cheap hotel. Stabbed in the back with a grimy knife. You talked to the clerk, Dennison? Yeah. But he said what? He said this man came in last night around one. He said this man registered as Charlie Brown. A name which conjured up old memories for the clerk and made him request payment in advance, which this man paid. One day's worth, which is what the clerk said. He was alone? Uh Uh-huh. Clerk said he was alone. As to visitors, clerk got drowsy around two. Can't see with his eyes closed. Mm. Found this in his wallet. Mm, Let me touch two, huh? Mm -hmm. Must be $500 in easy dimensions. Feel real nice, don't they? Dennison, uh... Yeah, yeah. Robbery's out, huh? It looks that way. Found this in his wallet, too. A business card. Lane Incorporated. Gadgets, mechanical funnies. George Lane, owner. George Lane matches his driver's license. A man makes mechanical funnies. Carries five C's pocket change. Look at it one way. There's no percentage in it. Look at it another way. You call the ambulance, Dennison? Clerk said he'd do it for me. Clerk said it'd be a real pleasure. So I let him. He did. And it happened then, the siren, the trailing in of the one-noted song, the shrill tone that shatters a city's traffic and lets through a self-propelled white enameled box designed to carry newly stabbed people as comfortably as possible. And the man near death becomes suddenly an object of respect. So stand by solemnly while he's lifted up and carried away. Instructions to Dennison then, and leave. Leg work and the offices of Lanes Incorporated. Show the badge and be nodded to a chair by a young woman who tiptoes. And a few minutes later, be tiptoed into an office in Limed Oak and 
Photographs of lawn sprinklers that turn themselves off, kittens that turn themselves on, and life-size baby dolls that say mama, and smoke. Be permitted a minute of amazement, and the door opens, and your back is slapped. No gadget, but a man. And how are you? My name's Harry Webster. Oh, fine. I'm... Danny uh, Clover. You gave your name to Miss Senker, remember? And Miss Senker gave it to me. How are you, Danny? What's your position here, Mr. Webster? You asked to see the fellow in charge, didn't you? I'm the fellow in charge. Well, that is while George Lane is away, huh? As soon as he comes in, I take off my suit coat and I'm a foreman. Mr. Lane's had an accident. Accident? Uh, no, no, that's the wrong word. He was stabbed. He was found in a cheap hotel with a knife. The Lane that owns this place is George Lane, Mr. Clover. Quite a wealthy man, a man who doesn't stint on anything his heart desires, so you see that... Anyhow, we want you to go to police emergency hospital and make identification for us. You just stick around. Mr. Lane will be in. You boys have got the wrong man. Well, let's just go on the assumption we haven't. Well, if we do that, I don't know what to say. Nothing comes. I'll help you. Who would want to stab him? Stab? George? I know who'd admire him, everybody. I know who'd respect him, everybody. And everyone would have a good word for him, but stab him. Stab him? When was the last time you saw him? Last night. Oh? He was uh, to my house for dinner. We gave him a little dinner party. Me, my wife, my kid. Celebration. I've been working here 20 years, so I have... How did Mr. Lane act last night? Oh. <laughs> well, that means what? I went under the table about 11. My wife put me to bed. Uh, look... I got an idea. What? I'll call my wife and tell her you're on the way over. You want to know how George was last night? Don't ask me. At 11 o'clock, I heard the clock strike 11 o'clock, and I felt myself sliding Just under. write down your address for me, huh, Mr. Webster? Yes. Well, I've been waiting for your step ever since Harry called. Just minutes ago, a man walked through the hall, and I opened the door and asked him if it was you, and he just grinned and winked. I, I was very embarrassed. May we go inside, Mrs. Webster? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, please come inside. Oh, dear, I, I tried to straighten up the place in the short time since Harry called, and myself, too. Harry should have had sense enough to ask you to wait around just a little while, so it I... It doesn't could... matter, Mrs. Webster. Oh, no, I... I don't suppose it does, does it? George hurt and wounded, dying like some lonely animal. Mrs. Webster... Now, don't you play games with me, do you hear? No games. Because Harry told me all about it on the phone, and I'll match what you said to Harry and what you say to me and what Harry said, because he told Mrs. me... Mrs. Webster... And Harry doesn't lie. He never fibs. Now, that's one thing you can say about my husband, Harry. You through, Mrs. Webster? Well, I, I'm upset. I... I tell you that so you know I'm just terribly, terribly upset. Because of what's happened to Lane? But George is dying, isn't he? We don't know yet. We're doing all we... And all you can do or want to do or dream of doing for George Lane won't be enough. No? Yes. Oh, George is an attractive man and strong, a wonderful man, a man with a sense of humor, too. So funny. So very funny. You should have heard the funny things he said when Harry passed out last night at his own party. His own party for his boss, George Lane. Twenty years of faithful, devoted service, and Harry gives the party. And Harry Webster passes out at 11 o'clock. Oh, George did such a funny thing. What did he do, Mrs. Webster? Oh, well, when Harry just sort of oozed down under the table, George did a magic trick with the tablecloth, just yanked it out from under everything and draped it over Harry and planted a stalk of celery in Harry's hand. Oh, isn't that funny? Isn't that very funny? No, not very. Well... I thought it was funny. Even Sylvia finally laughed. Sylvia? Sylvia, my daughter. Even she had to laugh finally, the way her father looked. And the funny dance George did around... And your daughter was at the celebration, too. And what's more, George offered to take her home. And she accepted. And I was very proud, I can tell you. I even tried to wake Harry to tell him his own daughter was being taken home by... Oh, but Harry, Harry was dead to the world. I had to drag him bodily Then your and... daughter has a place of her own. And a job of her own. The 58th Street Record Shop. My daughter's very independent. And... Oh, but... If... If George took her home... 
And it was last night that George mm-hmm. was... Thank you, Mrs. Webster. with you and all those records. Thank you. Hey, now, you, sir. Is your name uh, Sylvia Webster? That's right. I'm Miss Webster. Oh, I'm Danny Clover, police. That's all right. I'd like to ask you a few questions, Miss Webster. That's all right, too. Earlier this morning, George Lane was found with a knife in his back. Just a minute. Now, you were saying that George Lane was found stabbed and you want to ask me some questions. Isn't that right? Did you stab him? That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? Stab a man, get yourself in a mess. Just when Mr. Sussman gave me a raise last week. May I ask how old you are, Miss Webster? Twenty. I look older, don't I? I've suffered. All the books I read, girls 20 years old suffer. So, like them, it's been a constant battle to keep my face from wrinkling. Why don't you live with your parents? In the books, Mr. Clover, the books, all girls 20 years old rebel. They go off and live by themselves. Their mothers weep, daddies fold their arms and look off into space and think, what kind of ingrate have I reared? A 20-year-old girl who wants to live alone. Mr. Lane took you home last night, didn't he? I was flattered. Did you find him attractive, Miss Webster? I can only assume, Mr. Clover, that since you asked the question under these circumstances, you've only seen the old boy when he'd been stabbed. You ought to see him without a knife in him. Was there anything... Mr. Lane took me home. Handed me up the stoop, held a lighted match near my purse while I located my key, opened the door for me, and made a wish. And? It didn't come true. I closed the door in back of me and left him to face the bitter night alone. Mind if I ask you a question? Go ahead. Is Mr. Lane dead? No. Would you like to see him? I'd love to. But Mr. Sussman left me in charge for the entire day. Think of it. My first day in charge. What an opportunity for a 20-year-old. Just tell him hello, huh? Thanks. Danny? Uh, Dr. Sinsky? How is... I took a moment outside Mr. Lane's room, Danny, to grab a smoke... I didn't wish to... Didn't wish to what, Dr. Sinsky? To intrude on the grief of his visitors. <laughs> I did everything I know, Danny, but... Visitors? Who is? A Mr. and Mrs. Harry Webster. They told the desk they were old friends. Mr. Webster said you had Let's wished go to... in, huh? Clover. Yes, Mr. Webster? That's George, all right. That man there in the bed. George Lane. man I worked for for 20 years. A man... My wife's crying because... Danny? A man we've admired, respected, a man... Just a minute, uh, Mr. Robson. What is it, Dr. Sensky? Mr. Lane is dead, Danny. That was a remarkable man. A truly remarkable man. A man I never was. A man I would have given anything to be. All the things I'm not... <laughs> Don't do that, Harry. Because you're right. You're just so right. A wonderful, wonderful man is dead. <laughs> listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Tomorrow night, where you will be expecting your date with Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective, listen for a special program starring Dick Powell and Amos and Andy. Hear the dramatic feature titled The Iron Mortar, describing four generations of progress in the drug field. This Sunday night on most of these same CBS radio stations. In the sunlight of a new morning in June, Broadway leans against the subway exit before going to work and makes the last memory about the long night past. There was the bottle of beer in the corner bar and the reflection of the girl in mirror and how she accepted the light you offered her and not your friendship. And the wilted salad 
and the siren songs of the disc jockeys, and spasms of sleep, and fragments of dreams, when you were skimming the lagoons of Manakura, and later when your brow was being stroked in a South Sea Island way, and the best dream of all, the one you had been trying to remember for months, shattered again by the alarm clock, lost again, because it's a new morning again. And for me, the new morning was police headquarters and Sergeant Gino Tartaglio. Danny. Come on in, Gino. Well, what's up? Go ahead. Be bright and sunny. Oh, trouble this morning, Gino? June is the cruelest month. Hmm? You know who said that? Mrs. Tartaglia. She can't sleep on June nights. Gino. So she keeps me awake. She keeps telling me she hears music. Gino, please. And I have always been very proud of my hearing, Danny. I hear no music. She keeps nudging me and says, you hear that? You hear that? Violins. So help me, Gino. Once I think I heard a trumpet blow, but I wasn't sure, so I went back to sleep. But that was last month. Uh, but what am I bothering you with? Let's get down to things at hand, shall we? If you please. <clears throat> Run down on results of legwork by the good detective Dennison. The deceased George Lane was known as a big man with the maidens. Some people who knew Bez described Mr. Lane as dynamic and, yeah, let's see, powerful. Also, at one juncture in his life, he was all but snagged. Snagged? He was once engaged to be married to a Maidy Carson. Detective Dennison has jotted down her address, which I give you now. Thanks. So, what do you think, Danny? About what? About Mrs. D. About she can't sleep at night in June. Just wait till July, huh? Yes? Miss Carson, Lady Carson? That's right. I'm from the police. I, uh... Oh, you people must be very thorough. I didn't realize. That's right, Miss Carson. And you found a wounded man who then died, and because of that, you scraped through files and things, and you discovered I was once to marry that man. Lady Carson and with George Lane. That's right. Well, then do come in. Somewhere in all that mess of magazines and newspapers, there must be a place to sit. Thanks, you know why the mess? Well, Miss Carson... In all those magazines, all of them, there are ads for relief organizations who have children on the market for adoption. Look, I... And I've been shopping, browsing, so to speak, and I discover French children are very polite and still, and little Italian boys are nice, too, as are the Greek children and the Polish. I tell you, I... What? So many to choose from, it's very difficult for a girl to make up her mind. That's how Lane's death hits you, Miss Carson? Oh, no. When it hit me like that was when George Lane would not marry with me. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? You know anything about George? Other than he's dead, of course? A few things. You know he was a powerhouse? A veritable powerhouse. A sweeper of girls off their old patterns. A challenge to men. All things his opponent. Men, women, things. And George always won. And to the losers... The spoils. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a bar where once three years ago a girl sat waiting for her fiancé and George Lane, distinguished, gray, bulky, and harmless, introduced himself, bought said girl a drink, invited said girl for a little jaunt in his sports car. Said girl, me. Finis, the end. Then he wanted to marry you. I wanted... And I talked it over with my fiancé, and he said, how he, could he compete with a man like George? Why, once at Coney, we were all together, the three of us, and... And what? Well, simply that George out-pitched, out-hammered, out-coastered, out-photographed my fiancé. So, fiancé said, go marry the man, and I said, please, George. And George humored me, bought the license, tore it up a week later. And so... Go on. So I went back to my boyfriend and said, Paul, forgive, forgive, forgive. Paul didn't. Can't imagine why. Paul, uh... Paul Tyson. He has a home and everything on 23rd Street. Home and everything. 
I've been watching. One more question. You killed George Lane? No. Look, you get around. You ever run across a nice orphan in the market for a mom? You tell him about me, hmm? I'm nice. I'm kind. I'm... Uh-huh. That's what I am. Goodbye, Miss Carson. Uh-huh. Bye. I've got no regrets, Mr. Clover. Nice wife, nice kids, nice view here from the office window. You notice the view? Yes, I did, Mr. Tyson. Now, uh, if you'll... Sure, uh... I would have married Mady before George Lane came along, that is. It's a matter of pride after that. What do you mean? She threw me over for him. Then Lane whirled her around a few times and pointed her back to me. Pride. I told her to go away. You want to tell me about George Lane? A very strong man. A very great hand wrestler. After what he did to me in front of Mady, I went out and married a woman taller than I am, and all my children are small for their age. There's a very psychological novel in there someplace. Did you kill George Lane? He scared me to death. That's a motive, isn't it? No, I didn't kill him. And you mean what you said, Mr. Tyson, about no regrets? Why do you ask? Well, maybe just clutching a straw now that you're married, a nostalgia for Mady, and the reason you didn't marry her motive? Nothing like that, Mr. Clover. Nothing's left of what I once felt for Mady. When she came back from George Lane, she wasn't Mady anymore. Oh? She was suddenly a, a sad woman, no more spirit. She even started to wear gray dresses with high linen collars. Tough about her. Didn't matter to me. I've got a wife and all the kids I want, and I'm very happy. I'm too happy to murder anybody, Mr. Clover. Know what I mean? And hit the street again. An early afternoon of summer, riot of summer, and quiet places of summer. Side street of hurdy-gurdy man. And the June dance of a wise little monkey. Red cap, little bells, and a very special routine for lady watchers. And a quarter in the cup, and a pat on the skull from a lady watcher, bare-legged and sandaled. Watch it for a while longer, and walk away from it, toward river. And consider a crisscross of lives. George Lane's with Mady Carson. George Lane's with Paul Tyson. George Lane's with Mr. and Mrs. Harry Webster, and with their daughter. George Lane, murdered man who made small dyings for people he touched. The Summer River for a while, then back to it, because there's nowhere else. The job, headquarters. In your office, a woman waiting for you. Hello, Mrs. Webster. You wanted to see me about something? Yes. About my husband. About Harry. What about him? About Harry and George. Well... They'd known each other a long time, 20 years. Go on. From the time I had my daughter, Sylvia, all the time she was growing well, up. Well, Mrs. Webster... Please. All right. When, when Sylvia was a child, George Lane was a better father to her, actually, than Harry ever was. What are you getting at, Mrs. Webster? Please. George brought her things Harry never dreamed a little girl would love. He read to her, played with her... Brought a look to the child's face Harry had never seen and, and could never understand why. You're trying to tell me... And with me, George danced well and laughed well and made up naughty little sayings and and then... Then what? Sylvia's grown up now and George noticed it by the way he offered to take her home the other night and... What I've come to tell you, Mr. Clover... What? I think... My husband, Harry, killed George Lane. If he did, he should suffer for it. Isn't that right? Doesn't an evil deed deserve... Where's your husband now? With my daughter. Her apartment on West 12th. That's all, Mrs. Webster. Now, you, you won't tell him that I... I don't care. Tell him if you want. <laughs> I'd like to talk with you, Miss Webster. Okay. Well? Can we go inside? I'm a busy little girl tonight. I've got company. Your father won't mind. Oh. Well, you know he's here, huh? Okay, come on in. 
Pop? Hi there, Clover. Good evening, Mr. Webster. We won gambling, Mr. Clover. Just a little father-daughter gin game. Loser runs down to the corner and buys a quart of ice cream. Grab a chair. We'll make it three-handed. Mr. Clover says he came here to talk. Oh, that's fine. To me, Pop. Oh, oh like that, huh? It's like what, Mr. Clover? Oh, I'd better go. That's all right, Mr. Webster. Stay. I want to talk to both of you. Hey, now, you son. Your wife thinks you might have killed George Lane. Yeah. Yes, I figured she would. Did you? I told you he was a man I respected more Oh, cut it out. Well, it's true. Is it? Sure, I told you. But you still haven't told me the answer to the question, Mr. Webster. I didn't kill him. That only leaves your daughter. (laughs) The heat must have got to Then who else would you say it leaves, Miss Webster? Pop. The heat really got to him, didn't it? Why don't you level, Pop? Huh? About George. What you really thought of him. Listen, why don't you tell Mr. Clover how you hated George? I've already found out some things about him. Like what? That he was a dominating man. That he destroyed everything he touched. Did you find that out? How did you feel about him, Miss Webster? Look, yes, I hated him. All my life, he made me feel small, unimportant. He paid my wages, and when he felt like it, he took over my family. You know he took your daughter home after your party? Look, you didn't let me finish. Don't get crazy. Well, he didn't let me finish, and I want to finish. I went to his hotel and I killed him. See what's become of my father, Mr. Clover. He, he's become ridiculous. Pop, Pop. It's a truth, Sylvia. You know what kind of a hotel George was killed Sylvia. in? Sylvia. The cheapest joint he could find, not his hotel. Sylvia. Where he wanted me to meet him. Shut up. Where I met him. Where I killed him. You know why? You know why, Mr. Clover. Like everybody else, I fell flat on my face for him. Twenty years he was building me up to being alone with him. Please, Sylvia, you just shut up. Instead of going home, he said he had a place he wanted to show me. I would have gone any place with him. Worshipped him, Pop. He took me to that place. I stretched out my arms to him. And all he did was laugh at me and started to walk out. Destroyed me. And that's all he wanted. Sylvia... I'm sorry. No, listen to me. I'm glad you did it. Yeah. But I should have done it. You couldn't. You didn't have the strength. He destroyed you long ago. It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. Walk it slowly. Lean your heart against it. Shop for the kicks, the bargains, the heartbreak. Until all explodes in your face. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Barbara Eider was heard as Sylvia and Herb Butterfield as Harry. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, Irene Tedrow, James McCallion, and Lou Merrill. Bill Anders speaking. Broadway's My Beat with Anthony Ross as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway's my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. That's the street I walk, but today trouble is waiting for me in the squad room in the 47th Street Station House. 
Lieutenant Clover? That's me. Well, they Danny told me. Clover. I, told me out front I'd find you here. You've got to help me. Sure, sure. Hey, by those tags on your shoulders, I see you two fellas are in New York for a convention. <laughs> What's your trouble? Well, you see, I've never been in the big city before, and, well, I've heard about things like this happening, but I never thought it would happen to me. A girl is trying to blackmail me. Blackmail? That's right. Now, now there's nothing to it, but if my wife finds out about hey, it... Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, young fella. Now, uh, make me acquainted with you first, and then we'll listen to your troubles. Oh, my name's Peter Daly. I I'm stopping at the Cleveland Hotel. Exactly two hours, my wife arrives in New York. Hold on now, hold on. Where are you from? You sound like Kansas. No, Arkansas. Well, that's close enough. Who's this gent with you here? I'm his friend, Lieutenant. The uh, name is Ben Cotton. Uh, Pete asked me to come up here to the station with him. Uh, sort of uh, moral support, poor devil. He... Ah, you from his hometown? Uh, yes, sir, Little Rock. We're partners in a little business out there. We've been in New York a week now, Pete and I, attending a convention. Oh, here. boys, boys. When will you out of towners learn how to relax in New York without getting into trouble? You attend a convention, you gotta go unconventional. Oh, sir, I, I don't even know that girl. She's a stranger to me. Huh? Well, well, then I don't get it. I don't get it. Just what did happen? Well, a lot of the boys, after yesterday's convention session, went down to the hi-hat club and... Well, I'm standing at the bar, Lieutenant, having a drink. Minding my own business. The bar was pretty crowded, and this red-headed girl takes a place next to me and asks for a light. And I give it mm, to her. Lesson one. When a strange girl asks you for a light, zip your wallet. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. What then? Well, a little while later, the nightclub photographer passes by, and this redhead stops her and says to her she'd like her picture taken, right there against the bar. And just as the photographer is about to snap her picture, this redhead takes my arm with a laugh to include me, you see, and, well, I was feeling pretty good, so to enter into the fun hey, of the hello, thing... hello, sucker, she must have been saying under her breath. So, now uh, you both listen to the birdie. Yeah, and when I got back to my hotel, I thought nothing more about it. This morning, I got a phone call. From the redhead? That's right. Oh, uh, she'd sell you the picture for a price or show it to your wife, huh? That's right. <laughs> Why, she wanted $500. I don't have money like that. How'd she know you were married? Well, Lieutenant, I never told her I was married. Hardly said a word to her. What? Well, then how did she well, know? I don't know. Why, she even knew my wife was arriving in New York at two today. Uh, can you beat that, Lieutenant? Go on, go on, Daly. Well, she told me over the phone that unless I came across with the money, she'd mail that picture to my wife today. So what'd you tell her? Well, I told her I wouldn't give her a cent. Why should I pay her? Look, Lieutenant, believe me, I I'm a happily married man, and I haven't done anything wrong, but what'll my wife think if she gets that picture? Daly, what's the name of that redhead and where does she live? Well, I don't know that. She didn't tell me. Well, then how did she expect you to get to her with the dough? Well, she said if I was agreeable, she'd tell me where I could leave the money, and she'd later leave the picture in the same place. But I told her nothing doing. I'd go to the police first. Then she hung up. Well, you did the right thing by coming to the police. Well, but if she sends that picture to my wife... My wife's an understanding woman, Lieutenant, but after all, it... Oh, if I could get my hands on that girl, I swear I'd kill her. Hey, I'd... hey, hey, go now, on, Pete. Go boy. on, pick up your wife at the station, Daly, and relax. I'll drop into the hi-hat club, see if that redheaded is known over there, and, uh, and Daly, <laughs> make sure your wife puts you on a leash. Yes, yeah, Sergeant, what's up? Look it all over for you, Lieutenant. <laughs> Broadway Towers. Detective Dom Tom Donnelly's already up there. Apartment 5E. Some dame there. Found dead, Lieutenant. Looks like murder. How do you like that? Just when I was staring up at the skyscrapers wishing I was a pigeon. <laughs> all right, let's go, Sergeant. Broadway Towers. <laughs> Who is she, Tom? Name Rita Rondell, Danny. According to the building superintendent. Redhead, huh? Yeah. Fractured skull. Hmm. Body was discovered by the super, hmm? Yeah. No witnesses. No one seen entering or leaving. Hey, look over that back room, Sarge. Right, Lieutenant. So you found off the phone off the hook, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like the whole scuffle was over that phone. Yeah. Hey, what's this written on the calendar here, Danny? Bobo, 1 p.m. Yeah, let me see. Bobo. <laughs> Could be some guy. 
Ask around the stem, Tom. Any characters named Bobo. Okay. You say Doc places a death about 110. Huh? Right. <laughs> well, whoever a visitor was, boy, they had quite a tussle. Say, Danny, look here. I found some photographs hidden in the bottom of this drawer. Take a look. Hmm? Well, what do you know? What's the matter, Danny? Hey, you remember that nice guy, Daly, from Little Rock, came in the station house this noon about a blackmailing redhead? Yeah? Yeah, this is him with Rita Rondell, taken against the bar at the Hi-Hat Club. Look. Yeah. Yeah, how about uh, that, huh? <laughs> this must have been the dame who was trying to shake him down, and this... This is the frame-up picture she meant to sock him with. Yeah, so this is the redhead. <laughs> and me, I'm looking all over for her. Open and shut. Remember, he said he'd like to kill her? <laughs> Never can tell. He didn't look that man. Ah, well. Like I always say, share Shayla motive and you got your man. <laughs> Shall I bring him in? Hey, hold your horses, Tom. There's no evidence he had anything to do with this, but... I better drop in on him and have a little chat. And question him, huh? Yeah, yeah. Anything else turns up, let me know. And check Bobo. Right. I'll keep in touch. Ah, <laughs> uh, poor Daly. I feel sorry for him. And with a wife just arrived in town. Tom, this is going to be a heartbreaker. Especially if the little lady from Arkansas answers the door. <laughs> Mrs. Daly? Yes. Uh, is your husband in? Why, yes. He's just lying down for a bit. Who shall I say? Uh, is... Mrs. Daly, I'm Lieutenant. Well, here's an old Artie. Clean forgot our, our appointment, fella. Huh? Oh, darling, I want you to meet Art Smith. He, he was my lieutenant, third airborne. <laughs> the old dog. Imagine meeting him at the convention after all these oh, years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Smith, just imagine. You two must be thrilled. I guess New York's the place one meets all You're the... right with you, Art. I just put on my jacket. Uh, and... Yeah, okay, I I'll wait. Uh, how do you like the little missus, Art? Oh, just fine. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, ma'am. <laughs> Step on it, Pete, huh? Uh, uh, it won't, won't take a minute, Art. Why? Where are you boys off to? Oh, uh, Cookie, I forgot to tell you, I promised Art I'd have a, a cup of coffee with him. You know, catch up on the old gang. Uh, he, he leaves for Cincinnati in a little while. Uh, Mrs. Daly, does your husband often go to conventions alone? Oh, heavens no. This is the first time we've ever been separated in the three years we've been married. Oh, I see. Ben Cotton, his partner, was going too, so there was nothing to worry about. Besides, I know that Peter wouldn't even look at anyone else. Oh, let's go, Art. <laughs> All right, Peter. Let's go down to that coffee shop and have that little chat. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk right here in the lobby. Yeah, okay. That's one sweet wife, Daly. Yeah, you can say that again. You can see why I didn't want to let on you were a police officer. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Well, Lieutenant Clover, did you ask in that nightclub like you promised to find out if anyone knows that red-headed blackmailer? She hasn't sent that picture yet. You wouldn't be kidding me, mister, would you? What do you mean? When did you see her last, this, this Rita Rondell? Oh, is that her name? You found that out. Well, why, last night at that bar. You didn't go to her apartment today? At one o'clock, say? Well, you know, son, if you're on the level with me, I'd, I'd be about the happiest guy on earth. What do you mean, Lieutenant, if I'm on the level? What's up? Rita's dead, son. Dead? Mm-hmm. We found that picture you were talking about in her apartment. What happened? Oh, there was a scuffle from the look of the place, and... She fell against something in the struggle and fractured a skull. I don't know. Probably accidental, but there'll be a manslaughter rap for somebody. My gosh. Well, who do you suppose? Daily, right now, I don't have any idea, but my men are going over that apartment inch by inch, police routine. I I'll get a report just as soon as I call headquarters, but before I put in that call, were you or were you not in Rita Rondell's apartment? Well, no. Well, I told you before, I didn't even know where she lived. Good, good. Come on, now let's walk over here to the phone. I'll call headquarters. And if nothing else turned up, you can go back upstairs to your wife. 
Yeah, she'll think it's funny, my leaving her to talk with you so soon after she gets in New York. <laughs> yeah, you wait outside the booth, will you? I'll only be a minute. Clover. Sergeant, anything turn up on the Rondell Dame's place? Uh-huh. Yeah, I see you. No, you didn't. It's nothing else, huh? Out where? Oh, then he... I see. Thanks, Sergeant. Bailey, where's your hat? My hat? Your hat. Well, I, I must have left it up in my room. Shall we go up and see? Well, I'm not sure. Maybe I lost it. That's right. You lost it at Rita Rondell's apartment. What are you driving at, Clover? It was found on her fire escape. Has your initials. Well, lots of people ha have initials. Okay. Then let your wife identify it. No. No, no, I'll leave my wife out of it. I'll, I'll tell you where I lost it. Come to think of it, I, I, I remember now. Yeah, yeah, at that bar last night where I met her. That's right. I, I missed it when I got back to the hotel. So, so, so either that girl or, or, or someone else picked it up and... Well, maybe that explains how... Brother, you killed me. You were wearing that hat in the station house this noon. I'm sorry, Daly. I'll have to take you to headquarters. I'm charging you with manslaughter. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. We'll continue in just a minute, but first... Sunday nights on CBS are famous for their top comedy with Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, and the other great comedians, for the splendid drama that Helen Hayes brings each week, and for the appearance of one of the greatest detectives in modern times, Sam Spade, created by Dashiell Hammett. Sam Spade's approach to crime detection has now become the pattern for many another sleuth. But none so well combines the hard-boiled view toward a fast dollar, the down-to-earth appreciation of a well-formed ankle, and the readiness with a wisecrack. A bestseller in the fiction field, Sam Spade's Adventures on the Air are now among the top-rating mystery shows. You will find here tonight and every Sunday night on most of these same stations, Sam Spade, ready for rough-and-tumble action and a battle of wits in the best Dashiell Hammett tradition. And now back to the 16th Precinct and Detective Danny Clover. Why, th this is awful. I... Look, Lieutenant, I'm from Daly's hometown, and I've known him for years. Why, he, he couldn't have had anything to do with this. Mr. Cotton, I, uh, yeah, I know you're Daly's friend, and I, I know how you feel. I simply phoned you, seeing as you're a friend of the family, to notify Mrs. Daly of her husband's arrest. Yes, of course. Well, she wasn't in her room when I stepped by, so I rushed down here as fast as I could. Those two are so much in love... Lieutenant, I, I I just don't have the heart to tell her. Mm. Any luck this time, Tom? Nah. Try to persuade Daly again, but no soap, Danny. See, Mr. Cotton, we well, we offered to allow your friend a few minutes to call his wife, tell her himself about his arrest, but <laughs> he says he can't do it. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Cotton. Says it'd kill him to tell her. Why don't you tell her? Oh, she's such a sweet kid. She's going to take this awful hard. You see... In a way, I feel kind of responsible for this, uh, being here with Ben. I, I just don't believe I could face her. Tom? Unless it's an order, Lieutenant. I'd rather be included out. Okay. I guess a policeman's job can include almost anything. Uh, I'll get over there right now. Oh, uh, oh, Tom, come here a minute. Yes, Lieutenant? Yeah, Danny? You didn't find any guy anywhere named Bobo. No Bobo. No Bobo. All right, then that's that. Okay, fellas, I'm on my way. Oh, believe me, this is going to be tough. Breaking the bad news to the little lady from Arkansas. I'm coming, Peter. Peter, I... Oh, why, it's you, Mr. Smith. Where'd you two boys get lost? Where's Peter? Isn't he with you? Uh, well, uh, no. Uh, no, Mrs. Daly. Uh, uh, say, let's go inside. I, I want to talk to you. But I, 
I don't understand, Mr. Smith. Where is Pete? Well, the fact is, Mrs. Daly, Where, for you goodness sit... sake? Well, I mean, the fact is, Mrs. Daly, I'm, I'm not... I looked uh... downstairs for you two and couldn't find you anywhere. And now you come back alone and... Do tell me, you frighten me. Has something happened to him? Mr. Smith, I thought you had to catch oh, a train. Well, now, you see, that's just what I wanted to explain, Mrs. Daly. I... Oh, <laughs> I get it now. You went to a bar instead of the coffee shop, so you missed your train and he... <laughs> oh, Mr. Smith, why didn't you say so in the first place? <laughs> you had me so worried. Oh, well, no, I'm sorry, ma'am. Where is I, he? I... Is he in bad shape? Well, you he... just bring him back here, no matter what condition he's in, and I'll take care of him. Maybe some coffee would help. Do you hear me, Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith? Mrs. Daly, I'm not Mr. Smith. What? You're not... I... It was all just an act. I'm sorry. I mean, your, your husband called me that when I came in before, and, well, I played along. An but... act? What in heaven's name are you talking about? And who are you? Detective Lieutenant Danny Clover, ma'am, of the 16th Precinct. Your husband... Oh. oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here, let me help you. Hey, perhaps, perhaps you better sit down. No, I'm all right. Please go on. Something happened to him. An accident or something. Is he hurt oh, badly? Oh, no, no, he isn't hurt. Oh, that's good. Uh, ma'am, uh, your husband is under arrest. Under arrest? Peter? Nonsense, what for? Well, you see, it, uh, well, it dates back to before you arrived, uh, naturally. You see, last night he got into a jam at a nightclub. A jam? I mean, that is, uh, th there was a girl at the bar next to a him. A girl? No, oh, don't get me wrong there, ma'am, in, in that respect, I assure you, but it's, it's something else that happened, and, uh, oh, now, Mrs. Daly, let me tell you the whole story he from the wouldn't. beginning. He wouldn't do anything. No, but please don't get me wrong, ma'am, I You mean he got mixed up with a girl, but he couldn't. Oh, no, no, it's not that. There, there was this red-headed... red, -headed... red -headed. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait. <laughs> oh, I'm no good at this sort of thing, Mrs. Daly. Go on. Well, look, it was all a framed-up thing. Your husband came up to the station this morning and, and told us the whole thing. Your husband was blackmailed. Blackmailed? But you said he was framed. Yeah, well, as far as the red... I mean, the girl is concerned, there's nothing to it. Oh, of course, I should have known. He was framed with a picture taken at a bar and, well, to protect you, to keep you from seeing that picture. Well, oh, he... well... A picture? What would I have cared about an old picture? But there's nothing to it. Everything's all right. But you said Peter was arrested. Well, you see, ma'am, to keep you from seeing that picture, I figure maybe he went up to that girl's room and uh, there was a little fight or a struggle or something, and this girl fell. Oh, she's hurt. She's dead. Dead? She's dead. Oh, no, he didn't mean to, to, uh... Well, it's a charge we call manslaughter. Manslaughter? He didn't... He couldn't have killed anyone. Does he say he didn't? Yes, ma'am. He denies he was even in her apartment, but you see, there's some evidence Then that... I believe him. And you've got to believe him, Lieutenant. My husband's never told a lie in his life. He's incapable of lying. Ask anyone in Little Rock where he's loved and respected, and they'll tell you. But, Mrs. Daly, the evidence I don't care what that... evidence you say you've got. His word's good enough for well, me. Look, Mrs. Daly, and I'll I... tell you something else, sir. If he was guilty, he'd have told me so. In our whole married life, he's never held back one single little thing. Lieutenant, my husband didn't kill that girl. And if he says so, he was never even up in her apartment. Well, ma'am, I'm glad to hear you talk like that. I was pretty sore your husband was holding out on me, but maybe there's a chance he was telling the truth. Could be he was framed again. I'll go back and have another talk with him. I'll be praying, Lieutenant. Yeah. Yeah, Mrs. Daly. You do that. Danny? Danny, Peter Daly's confessed. Confess? Oh, no. I just visited him again in his cell with his friend, Mr. Cotton, here. Darned if Daly no, didn't no, say... Wait, 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 wait a minute, Detective Donnelly. Peter did not confess, uh, at least not to killing that girl. He just admitted that he went up to her apartment and he saw a line with her head in the kitchenette against a milk bottle. She was already dead. That's an old one, Danny, you know. She was already dead. Lieutenant, you've got to believe him. I'll tell you what. I think I'll have a talk with him myself. <laughs>
Hello, Danny. They told you, Lieutenant Clover? Yeah. Yeah, so you were holding out on me. You were in that Rondell Dane's apartment. Oh, I... I was afraid to admit. You know, you should have told me everything right from the beginning. Well, after I left here this morning, I stopped back at the hotel and she called me again. Said she'd settled for $25. So I figured it'd be worth that much to get the thing over with. I didn't tell you about it because I... Well, I was afraid it'd get in the paper. <laughs> It'll make the papers now all right. Go on. Well, she gave me her address. I went up there and the door was partly open. Mm -hmm. I didn't go in. But I could see through the open door, and she was lying on the floor. When you were talking to Donnelly and your friend just now, are you, you told them she was lying with her head in the kitchenette. Oh, no, I, I couldn't see her head. Oh, I see. Then what'd you do? Well, then I heard someone coming. I got scared, so I ran down the fire escape. Mm -hmm. Oh, please believe me, Lieutenant. Poor Joan, she, she comes to New York for once in her life, and this has to happen. Daly... How long have you known this Polly of yours? Uh, uh, what's his name? Cotton? Yeah. Oh, way back from school days. How does he get along with your wife? Oh, fine. Oh, you see, Lieutenant, he... Well, he and Joan were sort of engaged at one time. Before I met her, that is. Naturally, when Joan and I fell in love... Oh, well... so that's the way it goes, huh? Uh, did he marry someone else? No. Ben's still a bachelor. Still a bachelor, huh? What's so strange about that? Well, what do you know? Lieutenant Clover, you back again? This is the third time today. What gives? Uh, like this, like that. Hey, a couple of perfectos, lover. Did you come in here to see me, or uh, did I see you keeping an open eye on that gentleman from 305 that just got on the elevator? Hey, you know him? Shouldn't I? He smokes cigars. Uh, his name's Ben Cotton from Little Rock. I think I'll go up and have a word. Mm -hmm. Give uh, Bobo my best. You know, for an out-of-towner, the tips he hands out... Oh. Bobo, did you say? Yeah, Bobo. You know how it is at these conventions, uh. the nicknames you pick up? I've heard some good ones, but Bobo, that kills me. Everyone around here calls him that. Oh, thanks, Sally. Thanks a lot. Thanks for what? Oh, nothing, lover. I'll be seeing you. Oh, why, Lieutenant Clover. What's the matter, Mr. Cotton? You going somewhere? Uh, uh, why, uh, what do you... I see your suitcase is all packed there on the bed. Oh, uh... Uh, yes, Lieutenant. Yeah, I'm going back home. Bobo. Uh, hmm? A note on Rita Rondell's calendar. Probably expecting some guy named Bobo at one o'clock. You know any Bobo? Why, uh, well, that uh, happens to be sort of a nickname of mine. I picked it up here at the convention. Why? Well, you said you didn't even know the girl. You know the inside of Rita's apartment better than Peter did, Bobo. He didn't tell you her head was against a milk bottle. Oh, I never said... So you arranged for Rita to bump into Peter like at that nightclub. Get a picture taken with him. And then she was to send it to his wife. I'll tell you why you arranged it, too. You were in love with his, with his wife. You wanted her to think the worst, maybe, and throw him over for you. Come on, come on, come clean, Bobo. All right, all right. I was up to that double-crossing redhead's apartment, but, but I didn't mean to kill her. Let's have the story. Well, I... I told her yesterday I'd give her $100 if she could manage to get her picture taken with him and send it to his wife. Oh. And then Miss Rita pulled a fast one. Asked Daly for $500 for it. Yeah, that's right. Uh. But when Peter went to the police about it, uh, I got scared. So you went up to her apartment today at 1, huh? Yes, I did. To make her call the whole thing off. And she demanded from you the price she was asking from Peter, 500 That's right. And when I refused... She threatened to expose you to your friend Daly. Began to phone him at his hotel. Yes, yes. That's just the way it happened. I, I struggled with her for the phone. I gave her a push, and she fell. But I, I, I swear, Lieutenant, it was an accident. Ah, so that's that. <laughs> well, okay, Lieutenant, I'm ready to go to jail. But I, I, I don't know what got into me. Trying to do something like that to my best friend. Mm, the old triangle, huh? Well, you see, I, I've been in love with Joan for a long time. Longer than Peter. But he came along, and she married him, and... Well, ever since, I've been hoping... And, Waiting for a chance... Chance to break them up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I didn't mean to go so far. I, uh, 
once I got into it... You got into it, all right. Yeah, I guess I've been a real number one heel, huh? Mister, that's the greatest understatement since... Ah, come on. That's us, Joan. All right, Peter. Lieutenant Clover, I... I don't know how to oh, say We'll it. never be able to thank you for all you've done. Oh, right? skip it, Arkansas. Hey, just promise me one thing, will you? What's that? Well, I mean, you've come to New York. Uh, this is the first time for both of you, isn't it? That's right. Uh, you've had a pretty rough time. You got one impression of New York, the wrong one. Come back and give it another whirl, will you? That's a promise. <laughs> I want to see you both again, you know. So you know, Miss, I don't often meet somebody like you. Why, the faith, the, the, the trust you have in your husband is... Oh, you see, Lieutenant. We're in love. It's getting late now. A million lights have gone out. But I, I'm thinking about people. On Broadway, in Arkansas, good bad. They get into trouble here like everywhere else. Only maybe here it's just a little bit easier on the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's September and the summer sighs away, Broadway is festooned with the colors of fall. The pastels of the cotton dresses mix sadly with the brown and gray of the flannel. And here and there, Broadway's shapely foliage turns to plaid. It's the time of the quickened step and the crumpled travel folder and Coney dyed beaver. And the September song is a deep-throated sound, the mob voice, the hay fever, and the oysters being torn from the half-shell. Another season, kid. One more three months band to get where you're going. And the autumn days have their six o'clock in the morning time, the just beginning another day time. It was a street where Broadway turns a corner into the 40s, where I was, and Detective Mugovan, and a woman. She's in here, Danny, this car. Right there on the floor in front. Who is she? Well, I don't know. No identification, no handbag. Just this. Hmm? Mm, car registered to Edward Bishop, 1110-160th. Uh-huh. Slip was in the glove compartment. Who found her? Officer Kaplan. Tagged it late last night for traffic violation, parking. Five o'clock when he was going off duty, he noticed the car still wasn't moved. Opened it, looked. Found her under that blanket. I'd say she was about 27, huh? Shot once in the back. From up close. Yeah. Death probably instantaneous. Um, here they are, Danny. In the front of the car, Doc. Hey, you're a new doc, aren't you? Uh, don't move her, doctor. Wait for the photographers. But don't just stand there, doc. You gotta... <laughs> you get used to it, kid. This kind of thing happens a lot. <laughs> And the cluster of the walkers to work, the people of the subway, glad for the delay of the dead woman, the dead woman who lies at the beginning of another day, stops it for a time, holds it, the desolate pause, the time for turning back. But the hungry day will not wait. The subways are empty and must be filled. The clever machines in the offices long for the fluttering caress of quick fingers. Can't stop for the dead kid, a buck has to be made. Give someone else your place in line. 
And in the corridor of the address on the registration slip, a woman in a raveled coat sweater sweeps away the night litter and autumn mists, gathers them on a dustpan, throws them into the street. You ask for Edward Bishop, and she shrugs you to a scarred door at the end of the hall, watches you as you knock, waits with you for the door to open. You're an early bird, mister. Police. Huh? Oh, my. The woman drops her broom, scurries away to tell her friends and neighbors. Early bird out to catch a worm, huh, mister? Not me, not for something I've done. I never do anything bad. You, Edward Bishop? Oh, not me. Mr. Bishop's my roomie. Uh, he gone and done something naughty? Come in, mister, and tell me all about it. Where is he? Oh, out frying his nightly kettle of fish, I presume. His bed ain't been slept in. No? Huh? Oh, oh my, that, that hollow you see in the bedclothes is where I tried it. Uh, I'm an experimenter. Long as he wasn't in it, I thought my roomie's bed might be better than my own. It wasn't. Mr. Bishop's gone and done something naughty, huh? Do you know where he is? I want to tell you something about Mr. Bishop, my roomie. He's a tight-lipped man. Rock face, I call him, when he ain't looking. That's because he never whispers a secret to me or shares a coke when I offer him part of mine. He just lets me dab his hanky with cologne sometimes when he's going out for a heavy evening. He had a lot of them, evenings like that? Well, for a man who has to shave twice a day, he has more than his share. You wouldn't know with whom. Oh, I might. But first you tell me what my roomie did to you. Maybe you'd find it cozier down at headquarters. Maybe that Japanese kimono you wear makes it... You're getting rough. Hello there, mister. I'll tell you what I know, then you tell me what you know, huh? My roomie's been squiring a lady by the name of Anna Compton. You know her? Oh, just to talk to on the phone. A lovely voice. Haunts you. When'd you talk to her last? Oh, two or three days ago. I'll tell you just how it was. She kept calling here evenings, asking my roomie to call her back. Uh, just leave her name, Anna Compton. <laughs> my roomie, squiring a married lady. Bishop never shared anything with you, and still I'll you... tell you about that, too. Her, her haunting voice made me nervous. I told you I'm an experimenter. So one day I sat down with the phone book and called every Compton there is. Then a man answered and said his wife Anna wasn't home. Who was calling? <laughs> of course I hung up. Then you know her address. In the New Rochelle phone book for everyone's eyes to see. Now it's your turn. What did Mr. Bishop do? A woman was found murdered in his car. Oh my, oh my. That's as naughty as you can get, ain't it? Mr. Blackburn said that. Then Mr. Blackburn reached over to my lapel, pinched off a piece hanging from the buttonhole and dangled it accusingly under my nose. This is the way I left Mr. Blackburn. Then back to headquarters, issue an all-points bulletin for Edward Bishop. Then down one flight to the photo lab, be handed a picture. Tuck it in the black notebook where you've jotted the name of Leo Compton and his address in New Rochelle. Then the ride there to the community where the houses have the built-in attitude that violent death never visits here. In the next street, maybe it happens, or to a friend of a friend, but it never happens here. Anna? Anna, is that you? Lost your key? Anna, where have you been? Oh. Is your name Compton? Leo Compton, that's right. I'm from the police. My name is Danny Clover. Oh, uh, yeah? Uh, mind if I come in? Well, I guess so. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute there. Yeah? Police? Mr. Compton. It's about Anna. It's about Anna, isn't it? What's happened to her? Listen to me, Mr. Compton. All right, all right. I'm listening. I... Is Anna your wife? Yes, yes, yes. This... Uh... This woman, this picture I have here. Yes, that's Anna. Yeah. How did you get that? How'd you get Anna's picture? I wish I knew some way to say this. Anna's dead. We found her this morning. She'd been shot. Oh. She. Her body's at the morgue. Anna. I've got to ask I you. I know, I know. She didn't come home last night, Mr. Compton. No, no, you're wrong. She came home. Anna came home to me. At... It was my fault, really. I sent her away. I told her I didn't care. And the things I said to her, the names. Suppose the last words you ever said to your wife were names like that. What happened last night, Mr. Compton? Well, she came home. It was about seven yesterday evening. And she had the bracelet on. She was wearing a bracelet when we found her. She had the bracelet on. And I asked her where she got such an expensive bracelet to wear. And she said she got a bargain. 
A bargain. What do you mean? From her boyfriend. Oh, she told me, and it told me all right. And listen, listen, you know what I did? I called him up. I'm not narrow-minded. Things can happen just because it's your wife. It doesn't mean it can't happen. I called her boyfriend up, and I told him to come over. I'd pay him for the bracelet. Did he come over? Oh, he came over. And it was stunned all right. And I wrote a check for the bracelet, $200. Don't you think Anna wasn't stunned? Mr. Compton. Do you know what she did? She left with him anyhow. Bracelet, check, she, and him. And that's when I said... What was the man's name? Bishop, Edward Bishop. He's an auctioneer for the Hunter Galleries. Oh, there's something else. Yes? I'll call for Anna. I'll take her out of that place where she is. Come in off the Avenue of the Americas, mister. Behind these dirty shop windows, there are bargains. Edward Bishop work here? He did, till he killed himself a woman, ran up a parking ticket. You know all that for sure. I know Eddie. He works for me. The pitchman to end all pitchmen. The spiel that kills. That's uh, Eddie Bishop. He talking to buying something you don't like, mister? You said he killed her. Why? You're a cop, aren't you? Come inside. I'll brew you something warm. It gets cold for everybody on the avenue. No, uh, leave the door open. A looker might want to come in to browse. That's how it is in the world. Lookers, browsers, handlers, then walk out. Just like my Eddie. You want a sip of the warm brew? Why did you say he killed her? (sighs) It's in Eddie to do a thing like that. It's what's about him that fascinates a girl. That and the clever way he handles an auctioneer's hammer. I could show you a three-time bruise. Three times in your soul on a man like Eddie. You read in the papers a woman is found dead in Bishop's car, and that makes you know he's a murderer. That and the way he spoke my name sometimes after we closed up the shop. Zoe, he'd say to me. Zoe killed a long day for me. You don't argue with a man like Eddie when he talks like that. You knew Mrs. Compton? When the summer began to fade, Eddie started talking to me about her. How she looked when she walked in one day to bid on an object of art. Then how she looked over a cocktail at a corner bar. And then how it was with the lights of Coney on her face and in Eddie's car on the long way to New Rochelle. All this my auctioneer told me. That's how I know the dead Mrs. Compton. I'm glad for her. You never saw her with him, It was last night. I watched from behind the counter. I saw her shove her wrist at Eddie. Eddie put a bracelet on it, one he'd bought from stock. I thought it was for me. Right in front of me, he did it. If it was like that for them, why would he kill her? Who knows? Maybe she rubbed him the wrong way. Maybe she asked him for it. Eddie was a man to oblige a lady. All right. Thank you. Uh, Do something for me, mister. What? You find Eddie Bishop, give him my message. Tell him I want an invite to his execution. It's been a dull season. Danny? Over here in the squad car. You got something, Muggerman? Well, maybe, maybe not. Guy was found dead in the building excavation over on 3rd. Nobody wants to touch him. Yeah, let's go. Drive down the ramp, Muggerman. Yeah. Well, this sidewalk superintendent's really got something to stare at now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what happened, mister? Him. Him and a scoop happened. Half hour ago, I decided to scratch this ground. First scoop full of shovel come up with was him. Hey, let's get it down, huh? Sure. I 
Okay. Yeah, real good. I'll take a look, huh? Shot, Danny. Now here's a wallet. Yeah, look at this. Check for $200 signed by Leo Compton. Uh-huh. Pay to the order of Edward Bishop. Edward Bishop? He's the man we figured murdered Anna Compton. Yeah, the man we figured murdered Anna Compton. What? Well, what'd you say, Danny? Nothing. I didn't say anything at all. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Singers Alan Dale and Sarah Vaughn will be Steve Allen's guests on Songs for Sale just a little later tonight. Once again, Steve will be playing host to four amateur songwriters and their unpublished songs, one of which will be chosen for nationwide hearing. For merriment and melody, hear Songs for Sale later tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations. <laughs> September morn dips a dainty toe into a Broadway billboard and unshivering gazes down upon a street that only yesterday was choked with summer. But the refuse is there, where summer has passed and left pieces of itself. In the scratch and warp of summertime blues still screeching out of the loudspeakers, the sunny mannequins, wax slightly melted, waiting in shop windows to be replaced by the fall and winter models, the faint odors of the sun-warmed perfume, the souvenir of the golden girl who walked right past you, turned a corner, vanished into a place where summer never dies. A place not open to you, kid. Only autumn's ahead of you, kid. Start using it. It's already given you two murders. A woman in the front seat of a car, a man scooped out of the earth on the teeth of a steam shovel. What more can you ask? September's showering her gifts on you, kid. Take them. They're all yours. And at headquarters, Sergeant Tataglia brings you your share of them. Holds them from you with a smile that shows he slept well last night. The accumulated bottoms on the murders, Danny. In these papers, I tease before you. And have a good night, Gino. No complaints come to mind, Danny. The evening was a fulsome one. Father McCleary came to call. A pleasant time was had by all, as is our usual procedure. Yeah, Father McCleary is a fine man. Salt of the earth. I asked Mrs. T to break open a bottle of Mogan Dovered wine. He don't even blink an eye. Sips with you, talks with you, brings presents for the Tartaglia brood. This is a man who also brings you the gift of restful sleep. Remember me to him, Gino. Roger, we'll go. Now to the papers I am about to bestow upon you. In them you will find a report from Technical, to wit. The bullets that killed Mrs. Compton and Mr. Bishop, Technical States, came from the same gun. Mm -hmm. Markings are identical. The rundown on the past histories of Mrs. Compton and Mr. Bishop is contained in reports from interested neighbors and relatives gathered hey, by... Uh... You'll spare me a moment, Mr. Clover. Look, you. Standard operating procedure is to knock when one desires a moment of Danny Come Clover's... in, Mr. Compton. I've come to demand something, Mr. Clover. And I intend to. Not leaving here until you give it to me. What would that be? Anna's bracelet. The one that... Well, everyone's dead. It belongs to me. Because you gave Bishop a $200 check for it? I stopped payment on my check. After all that, that Mr. Bishop did give it to Anna... I needn't have made that stupid gesture. And now she's dead. And he's dead. Yes, your wife is dead. You loved her, you told me. The bracelet's mine. You want to quibble about it? Have me spend money on lawyers? You're right, me... Mr. Compton. It's yours. Take it. We've no more use for it. We have photographs. You understand. It's not the money. It's only that if it once belonged to her, it now belongs to me. It's a kind of... Remembrance uh, of the dead? Well, I'm not going to think about it. I have enough trouble living in an empty house with no one to uh, scrimp and save all my life, share it with Mrs. Compton. And the cost of things, Mr. Clover, it's outrageous food, furniture, clothes, and transportation. You know what cab fare cost me from New Rochelle? Five sixty. It's outrageous. You could have come in another way. Oh, yes, and be mocked at, pointed to, as the husband of a murdered woman. They put my picture in the paper, you know, and that makes me a curiosity, a freak. You didn't tell me when I last saw you, Mr. Compton. What did you do after your wife left you with Bishop? 
What's that? I said, what did you do? Go anywhere? Talk to well, anyone? Well, of course I talked to someone. A man's wife walks out on him when he's given her all this. Who? Mervyn Mago. He's an old friend from boyhood. I go to him whenever I'm in trouble. He's a professional helper. He's in that business. He makes money by helping people? He runs a mission on East 40th. You'll like him, I think. Well, thank you, Mr. Clover. You were easier to deal with than I thought. Danny, a man's wife is murdered and he comes back for... Danny, you think... It's something to think about, huh, Gino? It was something to think about. Consider a man whose wife had been murdered. Consider, in space of 24 hours, his tears had dried, the shock of death had dwindled into something much more negotiable. A $200 bracelet, for example. The grief tempered by the high cost of taxi cab fares. Leo Compton had motive enough to commit two murders. His wife because she had run out on him, Edward Bishop because he had run with her. Motive, certainly. So check on his story. Item. He was a man who needed companionship at the time of stress. Specifically, he liked to talk to a man who ran a mission. Go to the man who ran a mission and ask questions. Glad you came to see me, Mr. Clover. I really am. So am I, Mr. Magel. A dozen checkerboards and a few back-issue magazines. You'll admit that I do the best I can. Then there's always the coffee and donuts. The boys expect them. Standard fare for places like this. Sure. Now... Uh... Once I got a bright idea. Put in a ping-pong table. Build it myself. You know, ping-pong for the boys. A little physical exercise. What happened? The boys didn't understand about ping-pong. Took down the net. Made a backstop out of the old magazines. Well, I confiscated the dice. <laughs> Loaded. How often does Leo Compton come down here? Sometimes often. Sometimes not for months at a time. Whenever Leo feels the need. Need of what? Someone to talk to. But why do you? Because he doesn't have to explain himself to me. The embarrassment of bearing himself to someone doesn't have to be done. I know him, Mr. Clover. I know him well. That's what I want you to tell me about, Mr. Mago. I guess it was 20 years ago I met Leo. We went to the same summer camp in the Catskills, a charity camp. I was his big brother assigned by the counselor. You know, the older camper. I showed him how to put a French tuck in a bed. His swimming buddy, you know? Uh-huh. And since then, when, whenever he got into with trouble... With himself or with the world, he came to me. I like to think I'm necessary to Leo. I can understand. Leo is a product, Mr. Clover. The making of a living, the background of poverty... Even now, now that he's fairly well-to-do, it still eats him. What does? Even at camp, the pattern was there. He would organize little card games after lights out, wouldn't play himself, but took a cut from every pot. That sort of thing all his life. I see. Tell me something else. When his wife ran out on him, he came down here to talk to you. What did he say? Not a whole lot. He told me the story. I listened. That's just about all he wanted down here. He told you and then he went home, is that it? Not right away. He told me, and then the boys started to straggle in for their coffee and donuts. He joined them. He always does. He ate four of those donuts, Mr. Clover. See you for a minute, Danny. Oh, sure, Mugovan. What is it? I want you to talk to a man. Yeah, come on, Mr. Scott. This is Mr. Scott, Danny. Mr. Scott, Lieutenant Clover. I do. Uh, well, sit down, Mr. Scott. Sure, right there. It'll be fine. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Scott. Give the lieutenant the bracelet. Thank you. I uh, thought it was the right thing to do, Lieutenant Clover. I saw the man's picture in the paper mixed up in a murder, and then that he should all of a sudden the come, to me, Mrs. come up was to me of all yeah, people, and out, out of the side of his mouth off of the Where did you get this bracelet, Mr. Scott? I told you, didn't I? Oh, I'm sorry. Would you mind telling me again? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Scott. Please do. Well, here I was walking toward the subway entrance on 59th Street, and he come up to me. Who did? The man whose picture was in the paper about his wife's being slain, that's who. He means Leo Compton. I mean Leo Compton. He plucked my sleeve. He offered to sell me this bracelet. He said he was making deliveries for a jewelry concern, and the bracelet was left over, and nobody seemed to know where it come from. Uh-huh. Uh, how much did you pay for it, Mr. Scott? Ridiculous price. He asked $5.60 for it, and that's what I give him. You might as well know, too, that he kept turning his face for me, but I certainly recognized him. That's why I've come here. Uh, Mugovan, write Mr. Scott a voucher for five sixty, dollars and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Scott. <laughs> You 
you call me in, Danny, and you ask me to step over into a department that's not strictly mine. And, uh, why don't you wait for the reports from technical? Huh? All I want is an opinion, Dr. Sinsky. Whose toes would you step on if you give me that? Gordon of technical. <laughs> All right, so he deserves a toe smashy once in a while. What do you want of me, Danny? You examined Mrs. Compton. The bullet wound, yeah. the, the type of wound where it was in her back, is it one that would bleed freely? Oh, yes, Danny, but... You know these things as well as I. Why do I just you got ask? these photographs. Uh -huh. Look at them. The inside of the car where Mrs. Compton was found. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Sinsky? You know as well as Tell I Tell me Danny. anyway. I, I want to be sure. It is obvious that the loss of blood in the car was slight, which makes it to me apparent that the woman was not shot in the car but somewhere else and then put into the car and... Uh, I'm a doctor, Danny, not a... A detective? I didn't mean it to sound like that. Yeah, not... yeah, I know. Thanks for the opinion, Dr. Sinsky. It's all around in the backyard. Go through the gate. I hope you appreciate me crating all this stuff for you. Why, it's you, Mr. Clover. Moving day, Mr. Compton? Huh? Oh, no, no, no. My wife's things. It's hard to live with. I see. Giving them away, huh? Well, not exactly. Selling them? I saw an ad in the paper where they buy merchandise. Like... Well, yes, yes, I'm selling Anna's clothes. Why? How much are you getting for them? Why? I'm curious. Why? Five sixty for a bracelet worth two hundred. A man like you to do that strange. How do you know about the bracelet? The man you sold it to got scared. The bracelet was mine to sell. Why should he get scared? That's not the point, Mr. Compton. The point is why you should sell such a valuable bracelet for so little. You could have gotten more. I got what I wanted. Yeah, I guess you did. You broke even. Bishop gave your wife the bracelet, so legally it's yours. But you'd paid him for I it. I told you that. You gave him the check so we'd find it on him. So your story of what happened the night of your wife's death would hold up. What's that? But with Bishop dead... The bracelet legally yours anyhow. Why should you be liable for the check? His estate would have the check cashed. Well, that's right, I did. I, I gave him a check for Stop it. Stop payment on it, too. That's right. Why should I spend money I don't have to? Sure. You see what I mean, don't you? Sure. You know, you're a funny man, Mr. Compton. Well, I guess people say that about me. I don't care. You're so careful with money, and you're an honest man. But you couldn't stand having that bracelet around. It was a symbol of what your wife did to you. So you sold it for the cost of your cab fare, even all round. <laughs> That's how much you know. I lost plenty. I lost my wife. You're a funny man. I told you my wife had a boyfriend, and I was ready to forgive her. She walked out on me anyhow. Oh, she would have come back, don't you worry. You'd about already that. killed her when you called Bishop. But I ki I told yeah, you that... Yeah, yeah, I know. I told you how it was. I said then that... Then when Bishop arrived, you killed him, too. Wrote out a check and stuck it in his pocket. Put your wife and Bishop in Bishop's car as if she'd left with him. She did, I told... Oh, you didn't listen at all. I could call technical. They'd find blood in your house, no matter how hard you scrubbed. You don't understand anything. I worked hard all my life. I put my own price on things. My wife belonged to me. She was mine. And nobody gets her. Not for a $200 bracelet, they don't. What do you think I am, anyhow? Let's go, For Mr. a bracelet? What good is that? What did she need that for? As if it were something. I'm a hard worker. Things I own didn't come easy. What's going to happen to them now? Mr. Clover, you better get in touch with Mr. Mago. He'll know how to advise me. Well, he's just like a big brother to me. It's the journey to the end of all the other streets in the world, this Broadway. You turn a corner and you're there. Walk it slowly. Lean your heart against it. Shop for the kicks, the bargains, the heartbreak. Until it all explodes in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, 
most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world, Broadway, my beat. Broadway's my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a marketplace of the wanderers, the displaced, a glittering bazaar where the stalls are lighted in neon, and you can buy, you buy an identity or a reason or a memory that was stolen from you. You think it belongs to you, but you're wrong. The hawkers of the night sold it, but only for the minutes of the night. More you must buy all over again. It's Broadway, my beat. Your squad car stabs, tears, rips through the city, and its wail is a piece of broken glass that slashes across the city's face. And you see the terror, silent and quick, in the blur of the city making way for you. And finally you're there, in the place of the violent dead. It's an expensive room in an expensive hotel, and a dead girl lies sprawled on the floor like an exhausted child. And her dress makes a blob of crimson in the room. There are shadows in attendance. Then one detaches itself and clutches onto you and screams. You'll believe me, won't you, mister? I don't know who you are, but you'll believe me. Someone's got to. That Take girl... your hands off the man, Mr. Jeffrey. Don't pay any attention to him, mister. He's greedy. He's, he just wants it all cut and dried. The girl murdered, and he says I... said I, take I... your hands off the man. Oh. All right. I'll sit down. See, I'm cooperative. Just sit down and shut up, Mr. Jeffries. That's right. That's a good boy. You must be Clover. I've seen your face, heard your name. Oh, and you? Joe Graham, house detective. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Clover. I'm usually gentle as a kitten without paying guests. But Mr. Jeffrey... Are you from the police, Mr. Clover? I'm glad. I'll tell you exactly how it happened. I'll tell you everything. Get back in I... your chair, Mr. Jeffries. I'll tell a detective. I'd rather hear it from Mr. Jeffries. Oh? To each his own. Go ahead, Mr. Jeffries. Tell the man the way you told it to me. I was taking a shower, Mr. Clover. That's all I was doing. I was getting ready to go out to dinner. I'm a salesman, Peerless Leather Goods Company. And I've been with the company for ten years. Badge of merit for my enterprise. Stick to it, if this. You were taking a shower, uh, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, oh, yes. Well, I dressed. I come out of the shower, and there she was, just like that, lying on the floor. Well, I was shocked. I tried to wake her, throw her out. But she was dead, choked to death. How do you know she died that way? What, the marks on her throat, the bruises. Didn't you see them? You must have seen them. Who was she? I never saw her before in my life. May I? Thank you. Huh? Girl's Elaine Hill, fixing the perfume shop in the lobby. Won a prize for being such a good sales girl. A week on the town, a plush room in this plush hotel. Everybody in the hotel has seen her and knows her, but not Mr. Jeffries. A beautiful girl like Elaine. Never saw her, huh? Mr. Jeffries never... How did she get into your room? The door was unlocked. Oh? Yes, well, that doesn't mean anything, does it? I... I left it unlocked because I'd ordered a drink. I, it was brought I, to I, you? Yes. And that's how I can prove I didn't do it. Just at the moment the bellboy brought the drink, he just walked in. Just at that moment, I was coming out of the shower. We found the girl again. Just ask him. That's all you have to do. He can prove I didn't do it. The bellboy, Graham. Who was he? Fred Chandler. He's at your disposal any time you want him. Keep him that way. Where's the girl's room? Down the hall. I'll go with you. Just give me the pass key. Then you believe me. You believe I didn't do it? You'll have to be taken to headquarters. Oh, you can't! You can't do that to me. My reputation, my business, all the years I've worked. You can't. I won't go. It goes like that. Violent death produces its own after images. The people who are suddenly thrown against it are scared, they're cooperative, they're uncooperative. It bores them, depending upon their own attitude toward violence and their own conscience. Milburn Jeffries was screaming when the police let him out of the room. Joe Graham was grinning when he gave me the hotel pass key. Me? 
The sense of sorrow for a dead girl is a luxury that a policeman allows himself in the moments in between. It took a moment to walk down the corridor to Elaine Hill's room. She ain't here anymore, mister. Yeah, I know. So bye-bye. On your feet, friend. What are you doing here? Gaze at me and you shall know. I'm sitting here smoking a cigarette. You gaze, now on your way. Police. Oh, a magic word. You see, I get up, I stand at attention. Have a whim. Go ahead, have one. I'll make it come true. Bellhops get paid for making whims come true. They stick you in his uniform and... Yeah, and champ me with your name. Fred Chandler, Bellhop. Who is it, Fred? Fred? Who are you talking to? Oh. Police. My name's Danny Clover, Miss... Lee. I'm Anna Lee. I work here, you see? You're a maid? Oh, no. The cigar counter's where I really work. Downstairs in the lobby. I'm on my supper hour. A supper hour. She's my girl, so she likes to be with me, so she's helping. Yes, I'm helping Fred. Helping him do what? Oh, I get it. You're collecting information to help you solve a mysterious crime. I'll unfold it for you. Helping me do what, you say? Helping me pack Miss Hill's clothes. Who told you to do that? Lane Hill. She was checking out. She said, see that my clothes are packed. She give me a dollar. Puts me on the obligation. Personal obligation. Now that she's dead, my work still goes on. Leave her clothes alone. Officer Florio will take care of them. One more thing, Fred. Quiz me? Were you in the room when Mr. Jeffries discovered the girl, the dead girl? Jeffries said that? He said that, huh? He fibbed. He told a big, big fib. I brought in his drink, and there he was, standing over Miss Hill. Yes. Yes, that's the way it was, Mr. Clover. That's just the way Fred told me it was. Fred's telling the truth. He's not in trouble, is he? Fred's not in trouble, Mr. Clover. Don't worry, Miss Lee. Fred's not in trouble. But keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on each other, huh? The girl's hand touched Fred's sleeve, and he flicked it away. Then he crossed the room ahead of me, opened the door, and bowed me out. Around Elaine Hill's death, there already grew the fungus of lies, of half-truths, the weeds of a new violence. To tear them out, I needed to know more about Elaine, how she lived, how she worked. There was a man who could tell me part of it, a man named Nicky Laszlo, dealer in perfumes in the lobby. All I know of Elaine, Mr. Clover, is beauty she was. Employee of myself, but nevertheless beauty. Sheer exquisitatic. In my spare time, I coin new English words. Mr. Laszlo, I... Pardon me. I want this would be put in the official records. You keep such records? Of course you keep. In this country, everybody keeps. Uh, Mr. Laszlo... I want you should put down salt on the person of Elaine Hill... The perfumes of Nicky Lashlo smelled better than on person of any other person. That, you see, is my eulogy over my poor dead Elaine for publication. Touching. Change smelled to had more fragrance. That has more sorrow in it. Agreed? Agreed. There could be sorrow in it for you, too, Mr. Laszlo. Is already. I deserve more. If you don't answer questions directly without coining new words. Agreed? This is your country. I am only here on good behavior. Question me, Mr. Clover. Think back. Did Elaine ever say anything to you? Do anything that might show that she was afraid? Of being killed? Of being killed. No, not once. Except only once. But not, I think, of being killed. Of what? She didn't tell me. Didn't tell you what? Answer me, Laszlo, before I Before you hurt me? I tell you. Last week came call from room 302... Wanted Elaine to exhibit perfume personally. This 302. Elaine took quickly atomizers, went and came back. With atomizers. But with tears in her eyes. I asked her, what? She told me nothing. Just cried and blow her nose. That's all. That's all? That's all, Mr. Clover. The whole thing. All. And it goes on. Elaine Hill had been called to room 302 to sell perfume, and she returned with a tear. I went back upstairs to the lobby and spotted Joe Graham. I told him to find out who occupied room 302 last Thursday. It would take some doing, Joe Graham said, because the books were snugged away for the night. But he was just the boy who could find out anyhow, he assured me, because he had influence around here. 
I assured him that was Dandy to let me know. He winked, and I went back to headquarters. I got as far as sitting at my desk. I shattered you into your office, Danny. I see you did, Tataglia. Why did you? To offer you the hand that helps. All right. Help me, Tataglia. Who killed Elaine Hill? Uh, Huh? Who killed Elaine Hill? Danny, you're fighting me. You know, I I have a new approach in the solution of, as it were, crimes. You want to hear? Tell me. Give out word to the newspapers that you will arrest the criminal at any moment. Only don't say what moment. This makes an emotional person like a criminal emotional, nervous. And seeing that the die is cast and the vice is turning, he will give himself up Pardon me, Tataglia. or hang himself. Well, what do you think of it? Danny Clover speaking. Joe Graham. Here's one, Danny. Nobody registered in room 302 last Thursday. The room was empty. You're sure? He asked me to find out, and I found out. Sure, I'm sure. Don't look the way you're looking, Danny. I got juicy news. Like what? Tell you what. Have a shave with me and I'll tell you. A shave? What are you talking about, Joe? In the barber shop in the hotel. But it's after midnight. The shop's closed. Sure, but I got influence like I told you. Look, Danny, I'm going off duty. I got a date. I got to shave myself. Join me, huh? For the juicy news, huh? For the juicy news, huh, he said. And he hung up. It took ten minutes for the squad car to get me to the hotel. In the early hours, the building stood like a sullen pile against the night. The nighttime was beginning to die in the lobby. The dimness had started, the talk more hushed. There was no laughter. Downstairs, the light bled through the lowered blinds of the barber shop onto the tiled floor. And somewhere far away in the world of the bar, a band had settled down to a waltz tempo. I walked to the door of the shop, opened it. Joe Graham was standing there, back toward me, propped against a corner, a hand resting on a tray of tonics and towels and brushes. Joe! What's the matter with you? Joe! What was the matter with Joe could never be fixed? The unfelt pain forever stamped on his face told me that. The unseeing stare and the blood... Joe Graham was dead. There's a thing about Broadway... At lunch hour, it takes its murder spliced between nibbles and a hot dog and washes them down with cream soda. The deaths of Elaine Hill and Joe Graham were spectacularly headlined, so Broadway nodded approval and reached for the onions. It's these usual things that gives Broadway assurance, all's right with the world. The only thing Broadway has to worry about is the hours between now and quitting time. In my office at headquarters, Sergeant Tataglia stood in the center of the room, shifted his position a few times, cleared his throat... <clears throat> then ask me a pointed question. Uh, what time is it, Danny? Why? Well, no particular reason. This question was just an opening gambit for the conversation which is about to ensue. You tricked me, huh, Tataglia? Oh, but, Danny, I've been standing right here before. You're trying to catch your attention. For ten minutes as the crow flies. Okay, what is it? Reports gathered from hither and yon into the here. Mm-hmm. To wit, the boys from Technical are even now examining the clothes of Elaine Hill for possible clues as to the reason for her decease. Go on. In the matter of Milburn Jeffrey, the leather goods salesman apprehended at the scene of the crime, also to wit, he is now under the excellent care of Dr. Sinsky. Oh, what's the matter with Milburn Jeffries? Oh, the occupational disease of all those who are arrested as suspects for murders. He's screaming to let him out of jail. He's screaming he ain't guilty. He's screaming he's a victim of cruel fate. So? The other tenants are complaining about all this screaming. So, between Jeffrey screaming and the others complaining, our pokey is indeed a veritable mishmash. Uh Now, tell me what's news about Fred Chandler. Of Fred Chandler, the bellhop, I have the following report. Fred Chandler has been employed at his current place of business for nigh on to six years. No complaints. As far as can be determined, his story checks. And his girlfriend from the cigar counter, Anna Lee? To wit... Anna Lee is his girlfriend, has enjoyed this status quo for nigh on to two years. Uh, one more item, Tataglia. What about the owner of the perfume shop? 
His name is Nicky Laszlo. Tartaglia? Then Laszlo spent his time amongst the perfume at the time of the crime. Check. But I know something maybe you don't know, Danny. Like what? Elaine Hill shared an apartment with a lady who ran the photography salon at the hotel. A lady named Millie Starr. Did you know that, Danny? Goodbye, Tartaglia. At the photographer's salon, they told me Millie was on the hotel roof taking publicity stills. On the hotel roof, Millie was doing just that. A small camera dangled from her throat and her mouth was full of pins. A tall girl, shivering in a swimsuit or rompers or something or other, had her back to her and Millie was pinning up something or other. Tuck here, tuck there. Three other models tried to arrange their photogenic little features on the cold asphalt of the rooftop. They were outfitted for a summer in the city on top of a hotel. One strummed a badminton racket, the other waved a canoe paddle, and the third ran languid fingers through the hair of a wax dummy dressed in McGregor clan shorts and McTavish clan dinner jacket. When the dummy turned out to be a man, I thought it was time to break it up, which I did by tapping Millie on the shoulder. Whoever you are, go away. We're busy. Okay, Teppy, you look real sexy now. Go drape yourself on a leg and I'll shoot you from here. I'm from the police, Miss Starr. Take the pins out of my mouth if you want to talk to me. Huh? Oh, yeah. Pardon me. Thanks. That's good, Taffy. A little more, um, dreamy. That's it. That's it. Now keep it. You, take this reflector and hold it just like this. Huh? The reflector. The reflector, like this. Oh, like this? Ichi Keen, you were born to it. Taffy, take a deep breath. Hold your stomach in. Good. Now relish it. Got it. Now dream somebody else. Maybe you didn't hear me, Millie. I said I was from the police. I heard you. Get into your uniform and I'll take your picture. You can put the reflector down now. Thanks. Elaine Hill, Millie. They tell me you shared an apartment with her. Oh, Elaine. Take a break, slaves. You may smoke. That's right. It's just what you think. The law wants me for murder. You want me for murder, Mr. Policeman? Maybe. But first, let's just talk. About Elaine? been trying not to do that. I've been trying not even to think about it. Why, Millie? Tell me why. Because you're a policeman? You think you understand? I can try. Try hard, Mr. Policeman. How do I tell you what Elaine was to me? A child? Like a daughter? Sometimes... You know, there's nothing written down anywhere that gives you the right to probe into me like this. We want Elaine's murderer. You want that too, don't you? That'll bring her back? You're making... Making me an offer? Catch the murderer and that'll bring Elaine back? How long did you know her? Not long enough. She came to me about six months ago. Wanted to be a model. I wanted to help her. She liked my apartment and I invited her to stay with me. When she got tired of modeling, wanted to work steady, she said. So I got her the job in Laszlo's perfume shop. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Why do you say that? She hadn't worked there a week when she started getting letters. That's unusual? Not for a beautiful girl like Elaine. You know the kind of letters. Anonymous. Words written in basic English. In some circles, I hear they call them love letters. You saw them? No. Elaine always burned them, then washed her hands. You didn't try to trace them? Didn't report them? No. That was my fault. I told Elaine it wasn't important. Told her it was a kind of flattery. She was so lovely. So... The postmark, you must have seen that. Where were they from? Why, from this hotel. On hotel stationery. You think... Call your slaves back, Millie, or you'll run out of daylight. Hey, Danny! Hey, Danny! Yeah? Hey, Danny, Danny. Okay, okay, here I am. What do you want to take there? I'm in a hurry. Ooh. Huh? Ooh, I'm catching my breath. I'm glad I caught you, Danny. John Gordon and Technical's been buzzing your phone all the time you are out. Let's go find out what he wants. Did he tell you what he wants? No. Uh Uh-uh. Just called. I answered the phone. He said, was you there? I said, no. He hung up. I've been spending half the afternoon listening to a stupid conversation like that. Come on. Hello, Gordon. Something I can do for you, Lieutenant? Tartaglia said you've been trying to get in touch with me. 
Well, no. Am I going to have trouble with you, Gordon? Why is it you're never around, Lieutenant? What do you do all day long? You've been calling to find that out, huh? I'll tell you why I've been calling. Here. Yeah, well, look at this. Go ahead. Read it. So, it's an autopsy report from Dr. Sinsky on Elaine Hill. I've already seen it, Gordon. And I know it almost by heart. It's part of it. Here. Yeah, right here. Hmm? Elaine Gordon was five foot three, blonde hair, no birthmarks, weight 119. My congratulations on your memory. You really proved it to me. Then why did you send these dresses down here? For usual reasons. Follow standard operating procedure, kid. Maybe you'll come up with an interesting fact that'll tell me why Elaine Hill was killed. These are not Elaine Hill's clothes. Somebody on your detail loused up, Lieutenant. I thought you should know. Somebody mixed up somebody's clothes with Elaine Hill's clothes. These dresses on my desk would fit a woman who weighed about 160, I'd say. Would be about 5'1", I'd say. What are you talking about? What? Don't make me repeat myself. These dresses cannot belong to Elaine Hill. Who brought these dresses back to headquarters to tag you? Officer Florio, Danny. Get him. Get him quick. Pataglia did. In ten minutes, Florio was standing in the middle of my office, wiping a crumb off his chin. He was just having a bite, he told me, at the hamburger stand across the street. Yes, he'd packed Elaine's clothes all himself, neatly. No, he hadn't stopped anywhere for a bite or for anything. He brought the suitcase with the clothes right to headquarters, right to technical, as I ordered. I thanked him, sent him back to finish his bite, got on the phone. Someone else had handled Elaine's clothes. I needed to talk to him. At the hotel, they told me he wasn't in. Try his rooming house. I did. At his rooming house, they told me he wasn't in. Try Anna Lee's rooming house. I did. On the fourth floor landing, I heard the sobs that came from Anna's room. I knocked. No one answered. So I walked in. You knocked, Clover. That was nice of you. But walking in? How do you know what can happen to you if you just walk in? What's the matter, Anna? Why are you crying? Because, because Fred... I'll tell you because, Clover. Because I come to take her out, dinner, a movie, dancing. Anything a little heart desires, that's why she's crying. My little Anna's overcome with it all. Not that, Fred. You know it isn't that. I want you to look good, honey. I want to be proud of you. When I walk into a restaurant, I want to be proud. Too much to ask. Get away from her, Fred. She's my girl, Clover. Makes you jealous I'm so close to her. Get away from her. A pleasure. Tell me why you're crying, Anna. Because he wants me to look good. You know how, Mr. Clover? Hmm? He brought over a girl's clothes. He wants me to put them on. He won't go out with me unless I put them on. He won't kiss me unless I put them on. Shut up. Don't come near her, Fred. The clothes. Where are they, Anna? Over there. On the bed. Wrapped in the newspaper. Elaine Hill's clothes, Fred? A dead girl's clothes. And you wanted me to put them on. Oh, Fred! Fred! What's the matter with you? What are Elaine's you... clothes, Fred? I bought them in a hock shop for my girl, Anna, because Anna's my girl. I want it to look nice, to look classy. Like a dream. Like Elaine? <laughs> you couldn't get near Elaine, so you killed her. You wrote her letters and she never answered, so you killed her. And Joe Graham, because he found out it was you who called Elaine to room 302. Was it like that, Fred? You're frothing at the brain, Clover. That makes you a mad dog. And the clothes. You stole them after you killed her, because that was all of Elaine you could own. You stole them and palmed some others off on the police. They told me the girl was found in a salesman's room. I was there when they told me. You put her there. You strangled her and put her there. Because you knew the door to Jeffrey's room was unlocked, that he was taking a shower and couldn't hear you. Anna? Give them to me. Give me your clothes. I'll show you how I wear them, Fred. Like that. Like that. Like that. Like that. Like that. Like that. I'll kill you. I'll cut you to pieces. I'll kill you. Drop the knife, Fred. Drop the knife. No. No more killing, Fred. No more. <laughs> You need me anymore tonight, Danny? Go home, Tartaglia. Come have dinner with us, Danny. With Mrs. Tartaglia, there's always plenty. Go home, Tartaglia. 
Я дай. April evening sighs down on the city like a phosphorescent dream. You walk it slowly because it's a twilight land. Then fingers claw at your elbow. A face leans close to yours and the words it whispers are a shriek. It's suddenly night and the world's exploded. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Included in the cast tonight were Virginia Gregg, Joyce McCluskey, Elliot Reed, Jack Crucian, Ed Max, and Anthony Barrett. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle... The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Nighttime of November, a special time on Broadway. Sense it, it's a new time. When the after images of early autumn are dying, cloaked already in river mists, chill and drifting. And sense this, that winter is already at a place not far away, drifting too, hung from a pale moon, scudding over the city and making new shadows. Hurry, it gets dark quickly. Where I was, darkness was cut across by the fingers of light, intersecting the beams of two searchlights, focused groundward. Destruction of building temporarily halted. Rush wrecking job stopped because of this. Remains of dead man found and report phoned to headquarters. This would be the cellar, Mr. Clover, where we found him. Under three inches of composition flooring. Uh-huh. What does it look like to you, Mr. Clover? Real puzzle, huh? Just a skeleton and all? Well, there's something we can tell about. You know, what I can't figure out, that satchel of money laying beside him. Must be over a thousand bucks in there. About that. Imagine lying five years under a cellar floor. How do you know it's been five years, Mr. Rogers? When I bought these three buildings to tear them down for a garage, I got a story about this one where we're right where we're standing. What story? Of course, we've torn down to the cellar, so you can't tell, but this one used to be a nightclub, you know. Mm, no, I didn't. Yeah, it was. That's the story, a scandal or something about this nightclub. The bank told me. Partner or something five years ago ran away with a payroll or something to California. Uh, what else? Nothing. Except that the other partner tried to hold on to the club, but it failed a year later. Bankrupt. Bank took it over four years ago. Couldn't lease it. Nailed it up. Anyhow, that's the story the bank told me. Well, it doesn't look like the man ever got to California. He was murdered. Sure, what else? He didn't just lie there and pull three inches of composition flooring over his head. Shot. Huh? Twice. See the bullet? The chest cavity? Hmm. Small caliber, twenty-two. And here, right arm fractured and beside huh. it, see another bullet. Bigger one. Yeah, thirty-eight. Shot twice by two different guns. Like I said, a puzzle. Well? Well, what? This is a rush job, Mr. Clover. You know that. Let's get this stuff out of here. Good morning, Danny. Say good morning, in case you didn't hear. All right, Dennison. Sit down. <sighs> Excuse me for saying it, but you look a little beat. Big night last night? No. Well, you're a single man, Danny. You're entitled to a big night. Were you going to say something, Danny? No. Oh. Then maybe this will interest you. Got a rundown on a corpse you found last night. What about it? Well, that's what it takes to get a rise out of you, Come on, huh? come on. Get with it. <laughs> yeah, I better do that. Else I won't be liked, huh? 
Technical chart of the teeth. Mugovan put the code on the teletype. Late last night, the one place we got a call back from was Danamora. You get on identification? Code checked out to a former prisoner named of Bob Foster. Released six years ago after a ten-spot stretch for grand larceny. Mm. Anything else? Stick with me, kid. I'm loaded. My identification came in. I checked it with R&I. &I. They had a file on Foster. Here, wait. Mugovan left some notes for you. Yeah, 1947, May. May 23. A year after he was out of Danamora, Foster was wanted on suspicion of grand larceny. Packed a satchel with his partner's dough and ran out on him. That would be the uh, satchel you found. Who was his partner? A fellow by the name of Joe Turner. He and Foster opened a nightclub together, the Blue Sheen. A year after Foster allegedly checked out with his partner's dough, the joint went into bankruptcy. And the word is Joe Turner cried his heart out at the time. Beat his chest. Called his partner naughty names. Any lead on Turner? And one of the boys traced him to a hotel on West 12th. Only the hotel is out of business now. Management converted the place into offices. Nobody knows what became of the hotel records, so... Uh... So, in all points, bulletin on Joe Turner, huh? Yeah. Is that all? Yeah, it's got a girl type in it, too. Aggie Blaine. Used to do a poker with clever parakeets at the boys' nightclub. The last known address, let's see, uh, 1326 West 34. Uh, you did real good, Dennison. Uh, pull up a minute, Danny. There's more. Oh, what? Those bills you found in the satchel. What about them? Their serial numbers were in series. Must have been the nightclub's payroll. A few weeks after Foster went up in a puff of air, five twenties out of the same series turned up in sunny California. That's all? Now I can go? Yeah, you can go. Uh, don't sit in that chair, Sonny. Just pick a spot on the floor and stand on it. It's the floor, the floor, not the rug. This okay, Miss Devlin? Floors don't belong to me, Sonny. Furniture does. Let's not louse up the furniture, huh? What do you want? Some information about a girl named Aggie Blaine. My niece. Brother's daughter. Brother's dead. Went out without muffler and rubbers. Winter of 36. Got himself a flu that wouldn't quit. Fell over in his face next day. Never got up. Where's Aggie? My niece. That's what you said. Blew out of here a long time ago. Don't know whether she's alive, dead, or what all. Could be married to the king of Turkey, for all I know. How long ago did she leave? Oh, been five years. Used to be a dancer, Aggie was. Uh, used to. Hey, don't lean on the furniture, Sonny. <laughs> Pretty furniture, huh? Huh? Uh, yeah. yeah. New as the day I got it. You want to sit down? We go in the kitchen. Not in the parlor. Not on this stuff. What do you do, Miss Devlin? Huh? Your niece used to live with you. She's gone now. What do you do? Taking rumors? You mean sublet like that? Uh huh? What for? Who needs it? Uh, retired, huh? It's nice. And all this furniture, uh, ornate. Huh? Oh, you mean tricky with the curly cues and the things, huh? Yeah, all mine. Bought and paid for. Let's get back to Aggie, Miss Devlin. I don't know she's alive or dead. I told you she I used did... to dance at a nightclub called the Blue Sheen. With pigeons. A blue one and a yellow one. One named Gloria, the other named Phyllis. Oh, I seen it myself. Look, Miss Devlin, one of the men who owned that club was found last night. He'd been murdered. You're leaning, Sonny. He'd been murdered. And your niece might be able to tell us something about it. Couldn't you give me some... No, no, nothing. Aggie, she was a dancer. Is she alive? Is she dead? How do I know? And leave there. And once more into November Day, its furnishings also not to be touched nor leaned against. For instance, the autumn perfume worn by the girl who almost brushes your sleeve, sidesteps, changes course, hurries on. And from far off, the brief wild sob of a freighter sailing out of autumn waters. And at headquarters, it arranges itself into familiar pattern... Routine investigation into death. And wait. And on the first quick surge of November night, the return on the All Points Bulletin, Joe Turner, bankrupt nightclub owner, had been spotted in a Skid Row bar. Third booth on the right was all his. Go there. And the place is jukebox and fat cat scrawling symbols and sawdust. And the place is Joe Turner, who was once a man. You come up with a drink, mister, and something good will happen to you. Do you understand me, Joe? I'm from the police. Something real good. I'll, I'll dance for you. Well, you watch me. You watch me. You hear this? Just for you. Sit down, Joe. You don't have to do that. You like me, huh? You'll, you'll buy, huh? I got other routines. Tell I'll... me about your nightclub, Joe. Huh? Your nightclub, the Blue Sheen. Tell me about the club and about Bob Foster. Him? Oh, you're a friend of Bob's. Well, 
I'll hate you. I'll squash you like a fly, so help me. What'd he do to you, Joe? Who? Who did something to me? Foster. Bob Foster. He stole from you, didn't he? Walked out on me. Didn't even wave goodbye. He just took my money, danced off someplace. Far away. Never sent a postcard. Aggie either. Aggie Blaine? Ah, there was a dancer. Did you ever see her? Oh, it's a stunning dancer. Well, I'll sh- show, you, show you a dance. It's, it's with the hands first. You see, it's like this. You know where Aggie is, Joe? Uh, Aggie's far away, too. Aggie and Bob. Blue sheen. We found Bob last night, Joe. He'd been buried under the cellar of your nightclub. Bob? Bobby Foster? Well, that's where he's been. You kill him, Joe? Because he stole from you and went away? Joe, listen. I performed for you, mister. Where's my drink? You kill him, Joe? I don't know. Maybe I did. He deserved it. Maybe I did. You think I did? Come on, Joe. Let's you and me go uptown. And book him. Charge, suspected felony, murder. Turn him over to the policeman schooled as to proper procedure and proper jail tier and proper cell. And back to the office and sit at the desk. Far away, a light is turned off. And another. And a swollen sag of gray suddenly hangs from the black sky. Morning, folding over the horizon. Danny, downstairs, come on. Down the corridors and the steps, and outside is damp, and still night. Ambulance just pulled in. Phoned it upstairs, I got it. Miss Devlin. Uh Uh-huh, shot. Dead, Danny? On account of the police rang her doorbell yesterday? On account of she's Aggie Blaine's aunt? I'm talking to you, Danny. You think so? You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Two outstanding events on CBS Radio tomorrow in the daytime. For one, the Quiz Kids return to the star's address to begin another series of their breathtaking mental gymnastics. Professor Joe Kelly will be in charge of the Little Wizards, and they'll all be waiting for you to join them tomorrow on most of these same stations. The other big event tomorrow is the American radio premiere of Christopher Columbus, Darius Milo's famous opera conducted in concert form by Dimitri Metropolis. It's the featured work on the New York Philharmonic Symphony, heard on most of these same stations tomorrow. Broadway makes its entrance out of subway kiosks, out of night corridors, blinks once and long against the white of a new November day, then moves into it, soft, polite. It's the thing to do. Treat the morning nice. Don't step on the cracks. You'll still be on your feet when day is done. And the other performers, the man hanging from a spectacular, twisting out the Mazdas that died in the night, and the mannequin, her face dusted, a bolt tightened where wax had given in tonight, and torso and head tilted closer now to shop window, and on wax lips, the good morning kiss... A new day, kid. Live it. And at headquarters, November morn is Sergeant Gino Tartaglia dipping a finger into a container of coffee. Just testing, Danny. Oh? You leave these things to the whim of that new girl in Ballo's Delco. I knew it. Too sweet. Well, that's too bad, you know. Eh, some days you wake up on the wrong side, you get too many lumps in your container. Mm, true, true, Gino. Don't feel bad about it, Danny. No percentage in building a tragedy out of it. We'll both be bigger persons if we don't make of it an issue with the delegatessen. And off to work we go. You game, Danny? Whatever you say, Gino. Am I permitted a simple statement of fact? Of course. I admire you. Thank you. To work. Why no Joe Turner is still in the drying out tank? 
Also, ballistics has established that in the murder of Miss Devlin and to Aggie Blaine, the murder weapon was the same that five years ago did do in Bob Forster, suspected absconder with his partner's loot. Same weapon? Indeed. The bullet that was found in the chest cavity of the remains of Bob Forster bore the same markings, riflings, as the bullet extracted from Miss Devlin. Ergo, same weapon was used. Small caliber gun, Danny, 22. Then whoever killed Foster five years ago is still around. Which brings me to Miss Aggie Blaine. Oh, how? That in a routine perusal made by our boys of vital statistic records, a marriage license date of July 30, 1947, was found made out to one Aggie Blaine and one Herbie Morse. They find the... Don't uh... interrupt, Danny. A check was made on said Herbie Morse and was found that he owns a drugstore on 23rd corner of 9th. That's how. You care for my coffee, Danny? No, no, but thanks anyway, Gino. Thanks for everything. that lanolin plus look in no time at all. Thank you. Yes, sir? What can I do for you? Mr. Moss? Right. My name's Clover, Mr. Moss. I'm from the police. Hi. I'm trying to get some information about a girl named Aggie Blaine. Depends upon what kind of info you want. She was my frau. Some things I'll tell you, some things I won't. Just tell me how you met her and when you met her and why you're not married to her. Things like that, Mr. Moss. What's the matter? You think you could have stayed married to Mr. her? Mr. Moss, You I... haven't got the dough on the wherewithal. Just tell me about it, Mr. Moss. She's not going to make a fool out of me. You know what I'm going to do one day, buddy? Get me another wife, a big gal, a big blonde gal. Then I'm going to find me Aggie and walk up and down in front of her with my big blonde wife rubbing her cheek to me. I'm going to when show her... When did you her... meet Aggie? On an airplane. I said hello to her, and from there on in, it was air pockets all the way to Frisco. You met her on the way to California, huh? Now, when was this? In 47, Druggist Convention. I never saw the inside of the convention hall, not with Aggie showing me the fancy eating places, and me with a paper to read on dressing at the prescription department. Now, go on. That was in June. Then back in New York, somehow, she wouldn't let me see her. Then she called me. When? July the 30th. I know, because July 31st, we tied the knot. How come the divorce? A fella. I worked late one night, fixing up a one-cent sale. I came home, she wouldn't let me in. I beat the door in with my bare hands. There was a fella there selling rugs. He gives me his card and left. Next day, she followed him. One of these days, I'm going to look that guy up. You know that? You still have his card? Do I? Right in my wallet. I want it. Oh. You're going to fix him, huh? Swell. Uh, here. Here's the card. I'm on your side, buddy. Have you seen Aggie since then? I'm happy to say no. However, the day that I do, I will also find me that big blonde, buddy. I'm going to parade her up and down in front of Aggie. And get out of the way of Mr. Moss's wagging finger. And through the aisle, lined with preparations guaranteed to keep you alive longer than anybody. A right turn down the aisle of space guns, insecticides, and bubble baths. And then left at the table where everything is marked down to 19 cents and out into the street. Legwork now, an address off the card given to you in the drugstore, Mr. Irving Lusbander, rug dealer. Aggie? She ran out on me, mister, a long time ago. A customer of mine came in one day and ordered our most expensive number wall to wall. Aggie went along with the delivery truck and never come back. Customer's name? Ewing, Dr. Keith Ewing, big back man. Got offices in the Muncie building. And at the offices of the Muncie building, be told by Dr. Ewing that Miss Blaine was merely a patient of his, and after he cleared up her back condition, he never saw her again. No, he never treated her at his office. She was an outpatient at the Cheney Hotel. So go there, Cheney Hotel. Yes, the clerk says. Miss Blaine, yes, indeed. He checked out, he's sorry to say. The morning after an automobile dealer's conclave, he remembers. Forwarding address, why, well, yes, indeed. 1213 East 61st. So go there. The girl who answers the door is dressed in velvet pedal pushers, but shakes her head sadly at the name of Aggie Blaine. Agatha, it seems, moved out on her about a month ago. Bag, baggage, and her very own boyfriend, Tony. Where? Well, Tony owns the apartment building over on East River, Beekman Place. So go there. Yes? I'm from the police, Danny Clover. I... And I'm too desperately sorry because whatever it is, I can't use it. Let's talk about it inside, Miss Blaine. Oh, but then we'd be committing something or other, wouldn't we? Oh? Oh, yes, there must be a city ordinance or something. You see, I'd let you in here and we'd talk or whatever. And all the time, you'd be operating under false pretenses. Naughty. Tell me about it. You see, dear boy, I'm not Miss Blaine. Not the girl you need. Not Miss... What, Blaine? 
Aggie Blaine. Girl who used to work at a club called the Blue Sheen. Danced there with birds. With birds? Oh, how desperately thrilling. That's what we'll talk about, huh? Of course, let's. I haven't indulged in anything so pulpy in years. Nightclub dancer with birds, man of the police knocking at my door. Oh, just walk right in, Mr. Clover. The rugs are deep and the fireplace is Italian marble and my dressing room is perfumes and custom-made crystal and full-length golden mirror and it's a castle and I call it home. So you may plump down wherever you like. I'm grateful. Don't thank me, thank Tony. Tony Crenshaw, my fiancé. Nothing's too good for you, Agatha, he said, and he's loving it. I get this shack on our wedding day. All mine. Oh, that Tony, he's a charm, all right, all right. And now you're uh, Agatha... Agatha reigns. Always was, always will be. Oh, I almost slipped. Soon, Agatha Crenshaw, Tony's wife. You want to hear about Aggie Blaine? Oh, dying. It's how we met, we two. Yeah, speak to me of Aggie. Five years ago, she was a dancer at the Blue Sheen. She... Yeah, uh... there were feathered creatures, you said all that. There was that. something else. A man named Bob Foster. Just one man? Well, this dancer couldn't have been very good. Bob Foster, ex-con, five years ago, 1947. Partner in the Blue Sheen. We found him the other day buried under its cellar flooring. He'd been shot twice, murdered. Oh, tell me you're not making this up. Because if you are, I die of disillusion. It's so desperately sordid and thrilling. You ever know this, Bob Foster? Not till this precious instant. But don't let that stop you. Go on. Aggie Blaine had an aunt, Miss Devlin. Yesterday, she was murdered with the same gun that killed Foster. Isn't that always the way? Another thing about Aggie Blaine. In 1947, she met a man on a plane to California. When they came back here, they got married. A man named Herbie Moss. Serves a girl right, killing her aunt and that Foster fellow. Yeah. Get your things. We're going downtown. Oh, such a short time, and we so well know each other. Already, you're taking me out. We want you for suspicion of murder. Get your things. Oh, it's a lovely day, and when I got up, I didn't know what I'd do with myself this morning. And you've come up with something. Let's go wherever you want, Mr. Clover. <laughs> And this room is what, Mr. Clover? Interrogation room. Sitting or standing? Well, sit down, please. Smoke? Oh, I have my own. You can light me, though. Yeah. Thanks. Still excited? Oh, tolerably. It's slowing down. Do something about it, Mr. Clover. Like book you now? Uh, for what was that again? I've forgotten. Murder. Oh, that's a charge, all right. That's really one of the... Danny? You got him? Uh, Bring him in. Come on. How do you feel, Joe? It's a shame the way I feel right now. Hi, Aggie. Charades, fellas? I supposed to guess what he is? Yeah, do that. Hint, a guy named Joe Turner. Co-owner of a nightclub named the Blue Sheen. Partner found in the cellar. Employed a girl named Aggie Blaine. Now guess why he's here. Hi, Aggie. There's no excitement in it anymore, Mr. Clover. Take me home. Then you don't know who this man is. By the pink of his eyes, I'd say a wino. You look nice, Aggie. A rum pot. Well, there's another way we can do it, Dennison. Get the druggist, get the rug salesman, the hey, doctor. Hey, uh, look at her, Danny. She's getting excited all over again. Those people bring back fond memories, lady? You should have seen her when she danced. <laughs> mm, should have seen her with the blue light. <laughs> with the spinning spot. Hi, Joe. Where you been, Aggie? I looked for you once, Joe. I couldn't find you. You're a stinking liar, Aggie. Now you see why I didn't find you. Now we all know each other. Hi, Aggie. Sure. I used to know a cop. I've been drinking a lot, Aggie. I've been thinking about you. Have you? Joe? She's still pretty. Almost all we need, Joe, is the motive. Why did you kill Bob Foster? Hey, Aggie. Don't remember out loud, Joe. Do you want the business, Joe? The nightclub or her? Tell him, Aggie. You want to confess how you killed Bob? Go ahead. Oh, baby, baby. <laughs> I'm going to tell him my part, baby. I never killed anybody. Joe. Who'd I kill? I wanted the business, so... So I took a shot at Bob, but... I hit him in the arm, that's all. 
Then he ran to you, Aggie. You boys believe rum pots around here? Go on, Joe. Next time I saw my, uh, my poor old partner, he was dead. Then you felt so sorry for him, Joe, you buried him under the cellar with some money to see him on his way. Oh, that Aggie, she's got a mind on it. She figured it. Go ahead, Aggie, show the fellas how you got a mind on you. Mr. Clover? Uh Uh-huh. It's getting serious, huh? Huh, Mr. Clover? That's the lieutenant's serious face, yeah. It's getting serious. Look. Look, Bob Foster came over with the shot arm. I said, Bob, before you go see an M.D. about your poor bullet-filled arm, here's a gun. Bob, I said, you shouldn't take that from a guy like Joe. When I handed the gun to him, it went off. <laughs> well, it's some mind. Huh? Then what was your aunt defending herself against when she got shot by the same gun? Well... When Bob came to you when he was shot, you were staying at your aunt's place, weren't you? Well, yes, I was. Your aunt knew what happened. It blackmailed you. Hey, how about my aunt's furniture? A scream, huh? Furniture, income, proceeds from blackmail. Is your aunt dead, Aggie? I didn't know. Gee, you're all alone, huh? She lost the whole thing for us, Joe. This policeman came calling. She got panicky, called me up, and said she was going to talk. Oh, uh, You I... see? <sighs> yeah, sure. From the first she lost it, Joe, you and me. Since I got back from California, remember? Now, how about that California trip, Aggie? Great. Just took a flyer to plant some of that money Foster was supposed to have stolen to make it look like he'd run away to California. Hi, Joe. Five years, honey. I've had a lousy time. What about you? Great. A time. A real time. You're still lying. Yeah. I've missed you, Joe. We probably see a lot of each other now. For a time. In the ebb of nighttime... The slabs of Broadway lean against the darkness in crazy, tilted angles. The balance is delicate, precise. So the walk must be careful, the talk quiet. It's the never-never time that drifts in from the edge of the world. The time of regret. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Aggie Blaine and Sheldon Leonard as Joe Turner. Featured in the cast were James McCallion, Ted Bliss, Martha Wentworth, and Peter Leeds. Bill Anders speaking. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. It's the marketplace for the vendors of laughter and agony, of terror and decay. Their shadows stand by the shadows of gilded pushcarts piled high with the remnants of dreams, the remnants of desires. And they'll bargain with you, these vendors. The dreams were dreamed on the edge of night, and the desires, special, very special. And you buy because there's nothing else to buy. It's Broadway, my beat. At one o'clock.
o'clock in the morning, the tunnel that leads you from Grand Central to the Times Square shuttle is deserted and bleak and almost clean. You notice these things because the tiled walls, dirtied with a film of yellow light, stretch out in front of you. And somewhere ahead of you seem to close in on themselves. And suddenly the sickness is inside you, the feeling that there's no exit, no exit anywhere. And you hurry against it. And you see the back of a man that looks familiar. And you call out to him, even if the man is Joe Keto. Joe. Hmm? Joe Keto. Huh? Thought it was you, Joe. Back with us, huh? Yeah, I'm back, but not with you, policeman. I'm back alone by myself, free and easy. You're going to keep it that way, Joe? If you keep out of my way, policeman, I'd be a good boy. If you spread your lousy wings over me like a mother hen, I don't know what I'd do. Something ugly, maybe. The loose mouth, Joe. Watch it. For 12 years, I've been watching it. For 12 dirty, rotten years. Now I'm free and easy like you, policeman. My mouth talks how it likes. You weren't happy in Sing Sing, huh, Joe? You should have been. I hear they treated you real polite, like maybe you were worth treating that way. You know what it take you for life. You just got out, Joe. Don't make it too hard on yourself. Huh? <laughs> Don't make me laugh in my belly, policeman. It's not going to be hard for Joe no more. No more hard for Joe Kito. Oh, you got plans, Joe? Uh, big, smooth plans like silk. Uh, that's how it's going to be. Silk so deep I could swim in it. Maybe, maybe even drown. <laughs> good way to die, huh, policeman? Yeah, yeah, it's good when you can pick your own way. Joe Kiddo don't have to pick. It's all there waiting for him. Silk. Does it make you jealous, policeman? Poor little policeman? You know something, Joe? I don't care. One way or the other, I don't care. Honest. Yeah. That's good, because you're not built for it. Some people, they build that way like me. Others, the others like you. I... Which way you go, policeman? You really care, Joe? Sure, sure I care. Because whichever way you go, I go the other way. Till tomorrow, policeman. But don't look around for me. Tomorrow might not come. <laughs> like silk, huh, John? <coughs> what? Please, please, help somebody else. What's the matter, lady? Then the world folded in on Joe Keto. It broke step and veered into his direction and considered Joe Keto and his dying in a subway tunnel. The police came and observed him, photographed him, cataloged him. A man in a Hamburg stared. A man in disintegrating clothing hurried by without pausing. A woman stood on the fringes of the little crowd and bit a knuckle. Finally, two interns carried him away with a stretcher and intern-type jokes. I went home. The next morning, I called headquarters, got the late Joe Keto's address. Amsterdam Avenue in Harlem. The morning sun never quite makes it in Harlem. The shadows are glued there, and that makes it tough. And if you stand on its corner, stand there and tune yourself to it, you might feel it. The start of a new day in Harlem is the start of a panic. I had the key to Joe's room from his effects. I inserted it, turned it, opened the door. Joe? Is that you, Joe? I'm making coffee, honey. What's the matter, honey? You tired, sir? Who are you? I'm sorry. I thought Joe lived here alone. He lives here alone. Who are you? I'm a policeman. That's been tried on me before. Show me. All right. Here. My name's Danny Clover. So? My name's Holly Parker. So we both met someone new. You're a slough, huh? Plain clothes detective. You like making a living that way? You're a bitter, bitter girl, Holly. I react to people by laughing at them. I got taught that. Did you laugh at Joe? What do you mean, did I? What's the matter with Joe? What are you doing here, Holly? We've got an arrangement. I make coffee for Joe. It's been going on for two days. I come down from my room upstairs and make him coffee. Thanks for not smiling. It's the truth. It's over. Joe did that again. He said he wouldn't. Last night when he went out, he told me he wouldn't have to do anything. Nothing good or bad for a long time. Where'd he go? Uh, 
Oh, so you're looking for Joe. You don't know where he is and you want me to help you find him. It's not Write that. down in your book, Holly Parker. Then write down she doesn't know. We know. Joe's dead. He was murdered, Holly. You better sit down. No, I'm all right. Go ahead, Holly. Go ahead. Not Holly. Once when I was 12, a thing happened to me, and I ran out of tears. Who killed him? He had a burden, but I don't know who killed him. Tell me about it. In that chair by the window. In that newspaper on the floor. He sat there and stared at that newspaper. Oh? This one? The Times? Yeah. It's pretty old. January 27, 1938. What's in it that makes it a burden? You tell me. Joe wouldn't. Joe was in trouble once. You know that. I know. He told me. He told me about a 12th sentence he got and about a lawyer who said he'd only get one year. The lawyer said that, huh? What lawyer? Joe said his name once and broke a beer bottle against the table. Joe said Ralph Ferguson. I've heard the name. Maybe Joe wanted to kill this Ralph Ferguson. I don't know. Maybe he did. Do you think things could have gotten themselves reversed? Things could have. I told Holly Parker to drink her coffee, then go back upstairs and stay there. Then I phoned the law offices of Ralph Ferguson. He was not in, a happy young voice told me. He was taking his three-hour break, it said, at the East River Athletic Club. I went there. I went there, and a man in biceps and white linen shorts led me through a door and along the tiled apron of a swimming pool. Shuttled me through another door and through the gallery overlooking the handball courts. Then whisked me through the area where the members felt they should do their rowing indoors. Through another door and pointed out Ralph Ferguson. Ralph Ferguson, a rosy fat man on a table getting some of the fat pounded off him. Take it easy, Mickey. Take it easy, will you? Uh, Ralph Ferguson? Uh, Your name Ralph Ferguson? Later, pal, later. This is the part Mr. Ferguson likes best. Oh. Look. Now? Look, you can't have Mickey till I'm done with him. Go ahead, Mickey. Yes, sir, Mr. Ferguson. I'm from the police, Mr. Ferguson. Danny Clover. Come on, take your head out from under that towel and peek. See? Danny Clover. Sure, go ahead, Mickey, only not too much noise. I've got my business hours, Danny. Sure, I know. I just dropped by to tell you a thing. Joe Keto's been murdered. I read it. Tough. You kill him? Uh, yeah. Turn over, Mr. Ferguson. <laughs> you kill him, Ferguson? <laughs> oh, you're kidding, Danny. No, I'm not. You were his lawyer. You promised him a one-year rap. He got 12. You and Joe fight? Let me tell you about it, Danny. Huh? Joe and a guy named Grant Murray and a guy named Lee Baker, three of them. Three of them. They heisted a car 12 years ago. They pleaded nulla contendere. The judge was in a bad humor. Give him 12 years. That was January 27, 1938, wasn't it? Yeah, you got a good memory. Not so good. I read it in the newspaper. The late edition of the Times for that date. I found it in Joe's room. Uh, yeah, Mr. Ferguson likes this, too. Yeah. He isn't going to like this. Look, Ferguson, sit up. Sit up and talk to me. It's better. What about Joe Keto? What about those three boys? Dregs. That's what about them. Gutter dregs. They didn't have the guts to look over the top of the curbstone. Little gutter people. I lost their case and society put them away for 12 years. Society owes me a thank you. What else? Nothing else. <laughs> Go take a cold shower, Danny. It'll cool you off. Put the towel and soap on my tab. I thanked lawyer Ferguson. Exercised great self-restraint in not helping Mickey slap some more fat off his fat mouth. And got out. A call to headquarters gave me Grant Murray's address. It was in a place I was getting to know, in Harlem. In a rotting, pockmarked, cold-water tenement in Harlem. Up a flight of stairs where rats had gnawed at the decaying wood. In Harlem. And to a door, its paint peeling and scarred as if fingers had clawed at it to get in or out. Light the candle, mister. Then we can see each other. There's some matches over there on the table. Oh, that's better. Oh, that's lots better. 
Been trying to do that myself for two hours, maybe. But I couldn't make it. <laughs> ain't it funny? Man wants a little light in his room and ain't got the strength to pick up a little old match. What's the matter with you, Grant? You know my name? That must make you the rent collector. <laughs> well, I got news for you, rent collector. I ain't got it. And you ain't never gonna get it, not from me. Now what you gonna do, rent collector? Throw me out? Grant. Stay away from me, rent collector. Just stay away, that's all. Grant, I'm Danny Clover of the police. What's the matter with you? Are you sick? Sick? Yeah, I'm, I'm sick, mister. But it's the last sickness I'm ever gonna have. I've been trying to get to that door to call you, Mr. Police, but I just haven't got the strength. What are you talking about? I'm talking about how a man came in here and took care of me. Good. So I could never open my mouth again. He stuck a knife in me. That's what that man did right here. See it, Mr. Police? Grant. Grant. Oh, I'm awful glad you came, Mr. Police. Oh, Mr. His body twisted off the iron cot and he sat. Then he shuddered and lay still. And the thing that fell from his hands and covered his wound like a shroud was a blood-stained newspaper. I picked it up. It said the New York Times. The headline said, Japanese stalled by Chinese troops. The dateline said, January 27, 1938. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. That red-headed circus, Arthur Godfrey, is now on hand to entertain you Saturday nights on CBS. Godfrey puts together the cream of the jest from his daytime shows on CBS, mixes in the best songs of Bill Lawrence, Jeanette Davis, and the Mariners, and turns out a top half hour of Saturday night fun. Listen to the Arthur Godfrey Digest this Saturday night on most of these same CBS stations. Broadway's a street dedicated to the proposition that dead men have stories to tell. A person becomes suddenly famous when he becomes suddenly dead. Broadway grins, makes clucking noises, and wants to know all about this suddenly famous person. Right now, it had a double feature to get gay about. A man named Joe Keto, murdered. A man named Grant Murray, murdered. At headquarters, Sergeant Gino Tataglia thought about it, gave it expert consideration, and thereby coined a phrase. Yeah, they're dropping like flies, Danny. That impresses you that way, huh? Yeah. And you know, you would have nothing to worry about if you was just Frisbee Novotny. Tataglia? Frisbee Novotny, Danny, the guy whom I've been trying to tell you about. You know, the hero of my favorite detective stories, the one who solves crimes and mayhem with a slide rule and formulas. He does that. How? Well, this Frisbee Novotny does like this. He makes X the corpse, Y the room the murder took place in, Z the time of the murder, A the... the uh, here, here, Danny, here's some paper. My pen, the gift of the ever-grateful Mrs. Tartaglia. What's she got to be grateful about? Oh, Danny. Oh, I'm sorry, Tartaglia. It's these newspapers here on my desk that got me confused, these 1938 newspapers. Oh, 1938, huh? Hey, ain't that the year little orphan Annie celebrated her 40th birthday? Yeah, that confuses me, too. Totagli, I've got a feeling the reason why those two boys were murdered is right here in these papers. Ah, that's my Danny. Huh? Uh, nothing, Danny. I've read these papers from headline to shipping news, and the only thing I can see that's interesting is this item right here on the bottom of page three. Huh? Police today arrested three men in connection with car theft. The men gave their names as Joe Keto, Grant Murray, and Lee Baker. They are being held without bail pending hearing. That's all it says, Detective. Well, this is information that the police department is already fully aware of. Uh Uh-huh. The thing that bothers me is why the two boys kept these newspapers. For their scrapbook, maybe. Something else, Detective. Something else. Something that's in these papers. Something that's staring me in the eye and begging to be understood. You got what I asked you for? Oh, sure, Danny, certainly. Straight from the parole officer. 
The third boy, Lee Baker, is employed at the moment as a garage mechanic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ain't it wonderful the trades they teach you up in Sing Sing? Where is he employed? At the garage in back of the Mobile Gas Station on 125th Street. Maybe Lee Baker's got a newspaper, too. Get me a squad car, Tataglia. Hey, you under the car. I want to talk to you. Ask the man out front, Mac. He'll give you the key and point out the door. I'm from the police, Mac. That makes you a difference? Yeah, I want to ask you some questions. You. Well, that makes you a difference. Yeah. Well, what's bothering you, Mac? They told me out front Lee Baker wasn't around. Oh, Lee Baker, huh? They told me maybe you'd know why he wasn't around. What do those guys out front know? All they know is, shall I fill it up, Mac? Hold still while I wipe your windshield, Mac. Relax while I blow up your tires. Yeah, what do those guys know? Lee Baker, why isn't he around? I've been telling you, Mac. I ain't got the slightest, foggiest notion why he ain't around. He did something? He didn't come in today? Who says he didn't come in? Since he's been working for me, he comes in every morning like veritable clockwork. Okay, I give up. You tell it to me in your own way. I knew you'd come around with Mac. Well, like I say, Lee, for the three days he's been working for me, comes in like clockwork. He works for me like I was the boss's daughter or something. Like a slave, you know what I mean? And today was different. Mac. You told me I could tell it my own way. Yeah, sorry. Forget it, Mac. Now, let me see. Where was I? He worked for you like a slave. Yeah, yeah, that's right, like a slave. But a happy slave, you know? Cheery and beery. But today was different. I said that. You did, Mac? Look, like I started to say, today was different. How? The right question, Mac. Today was different because Lee comes in, sits down with the morning newspaper, turns pale, but a green kind of pale, you know what I mean? He gets up and he walks out of the garage. Maybe he's coming back. I don't think so, Mac. He had that look. I seen it on my helpers before. When they get that look, they never come back. Yeah. Thanks for everything, mechanic. Hey, wait a minute, Mac. Lee left his toolkit. If Lee now belongs to the police, the toolkit now belongs likewise, no? Yeah. Where is it? Over here. Well, open it, Mac. That's your department. Thanks. Hey, such a beautiful picture of such a beautiful girl. He's got pasted in the lid. What a differential, huh, Mac? You got any idea what you're looking for, Mac? No. Hey, what are you doing tearing that picture off? What do you know? There's something underneath. Yeah. That's something I didn't think of. To look underneath the picture. Oh, that sly guy. Mm, there it is again. The front page of the Times, January 27, 1938. Yeah, yeah. Look what's circled with a blue circle. The U.S. Treasury balance. Such a big number. A big number. A number that meant billions of dollars. And meant that's what the United States Treasury balance was as of January 27, 1938. That meant something special to an ex-convict, now garage mechanic, now missing. The big number was beginning to make big sense. I phoned in headquarters, had them send out an all-points bulletin to pick up Lee Baker. They gave me a message for my trouble. A lady had called, a young lady named Holly Parker. Would I come up to Harlem and see her right away? I would, right away. Come in. Come in, Mr. Clover. Thanks, Holly. That chair over there is comfortable, Mr. Clover, but don't lean back in it. All right. You're going someplace, Holly? That suitcase on the bed, you were packing? Unpacking. Something changed your mind? I was going back to Michigan. Then I got to thinking, why Michigan? Why any place? You tell me. I read about Grant Murray's being murdered and Joe Keto. Grant and Joe were friends. I was a friend police. Something to run away from. I'm good at it. We'd find you, Holly. If we needed you, it wouldn't be too much trouble. We'd bring you back. I told myself that. That's why I unpacked. You're trying to tell me something, something you didn't tell me before. That's right. Maybe it means something, maybe it means nothing at all. What is it? This. A piece of paper Joe gave me the other night before he went out. He said keep it for him. He said don't let it get away from you. Here, take it. It got away from me anyhow. Thanks. There's nothing on it except a number, Mr. Clover. A number. 
646. And the date, January 27, 1938. It all fits now, Holly. Why didn't you give it to me before? Well, the kind of the way I was educated. You're a policeman. My school motto was, don't trust policemen. You might have saved a man's life if you did. You're clear now, Holly. You can do what you want, even go back to Michigan now, if you want to. Why, Mr. Clover? Why should I go anywhere? Stop champing at the bit, Danny. Patrolman Florio will have those records in here in a minute. I'm not, I'm not champing, Coslow. I'm trying to breathe. Why do you guys in the record department live in here? Well, the grapevines in the city hall says we're getting an air conditioning unit right after the next election. Thanks, Froyo. Well, here are the records, Danny. Mind if I read over your shoulder? I couldn't live without it. Hey, this Benny Fane kept interest in type books, huh? Mm-hmm. Benny Fane, the numbers king. These books he kept to do credit at the Chase National Bank. I understand Benny's now head librarian in charge of overdue fines at Sing Sing, Danny. Ain't it wonderful the trades they teach you up in Sing Sing? Huh? Yeah, wonderful. Hey, okay, Coslow, this is what I'm looking for. Oh, yeah? The number that hit on January 27, 1938 was 646, taken from the last three numbers of the Treasury report of that day. Mm -hmm. One ticket held on that number worth $100,000 bought by three men, Joe Keto, Grant Murray, and Lee Baker. According to the books, the payoff was made next day. Yeah, like you said, Coslow, these books are due credit hey, to the chain. They got Lee Baker, Danny. Good. Where? Just spotted him going into the Muncie building. Squad car just phoned in. Phone him back to Tagley. If Baker leaves the building, tell him to pick him up. Well, suppose Baker stays inside. Then he'll be where I want him. Exactly where I want him. It made sense that Lee Baker was picked up going into the Muncie building. It made sense that there was only one man there for him to see. It made sense that lawyer Ferguson's office was on the 46th floor. And the shots that screamed down the long marble corridor made the most sense of all. Lawyer Ferguson stood silhouetted at his 46th floor window, considering the jeweled backdrop of the city and approving of it and of himself against it. To the gun in his hand and the body that lay on the floor in the final grotesque attitude of final agony, he paid no attention at all. I don't think you'll find it necessary to examine him, Danny. He's quite, quite dead. I made sure of that. Yeah, yeah. Lee Baker. Lee Baker. A filthy gutter thing that tried to rise up and strike me down. Self-defense, huh? Could it be anything else? The gun in his hand? Yeah, lawyer, it could. It could be murder. <laughs> Looking for a promotion, Danny? <laughs> How many murders do you need to get promoted? I always wondered that about detectives. Murder. Like you murdered Joe Keto and Grant Murray. And for the same reason. I'm a lawyer, Danny. A good one. Very high in the profession. A policeman's drivel doesn't impress me. No? You sure, lawyer? On second thought, maybe it would. Impress me, Danny. Three murders for the same reason. The boys on our side call it motive. I promise to do better. Motive, lawyer. Which is? A hundred thousand dollars. Oh, dear, dear. That's a lot of motive, isn't it? Enough to kill three men. Even enough to kill you. What was it you said about society? Oh, yeah. Society will thank me, just like you said they thanked you. Don't count on it, boy. You need facts, evidence. Silly little hard things like that. It's all there, lawyer. Neat bookkeeping records kept by a numbers bookkeeper, one Benny Fane. We're neat, too. We have them on file. Books? They're very good, very acceptable evidence. I thought you'd like it. These books say you got the 100,000 payoff that belonged to Keto and Murray and Baker here. They picked a number and you won. How did I do a clever thing like that? Easy for a clever man like you. You get them 12 years instead of one for a second-rate crime. You keep power of attorney. The numbers pay off to you, and... and then when they get out, instead of giving them back their hard-earned hundred grand, I kill them, one by one. Is it like that, Detective Clover? Like that. Exactly like that. Excellent work, Detective. Excellent. The gun, Ferguson. Hand it over. The gun? Oh, no. I'll need it. But you knew it'd be like that all the time, didn't you, Danny? Give it to me. Don't try to reach for yours, Danny. Come to the window. Move! Move! That's a good boy. 
46 floors, Danny. Look down. That's how far you're going to fall. <laughs> A deplorable accident, they'll call it. I'll see to it that they call it that. Now, Danny. The fat folds of flesh on his face began to move to the rhythm of the silent, creeping laughter that was inside him. Then his arm swung in a wide arc to bring the gun crashing down on my skull. And I needed that. Needed that moment. I needed it. I grabbed his gun arm. It's no good, Danny. No good. Used it for a lever. Let go. Let go. I'll kill you. Let go. Lifted my body and his fat bulk lifted off the floor and... Oh! Ah! He fell, twisting into space, a part of it. His fingers exploring it, gouging out handfuls of it. Then, far below, the crowd gathered and made a circle. And the world folded in on Ralph Fergus. Broadway, where night bursts open like the sudden flame and the crowd swarm appears, squeezed out from under the earth, roped off by the silhouettes of a thousand buildings. And they dance their fury away against the time of morning until the sky soaks up the sound and pain and color and turns it into dawn. That's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest, mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The cast tonight included Stan Waxman, Ann Diamond, Bill Gray, Lou Merrill, Jester Hairston, and Jim Bannon. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The time comes to Broadway when the April day summons its warmth, its winds, its plumed sprays of sunlight, departs the avenue littered with its promises and the defeated and the unfulfilled swarm back into the subway entrances and wait on the stifling platforms in the dim, sallow light reflected from walls of stained tile. Wait for the going home. Wait for the death of a day to happen in some other place, the hall bedroom, the front stoop, some other place where shock will be gentler. And suddenly through the steel corridor, a hot, dry wind races in the depths of earth, and on it the fury of hurtling steel, and they surge forward to meet it. Soon they will be home. And in your office at headquarters, the April twilight drifts in. Somehow its touch startles the man you've been talking to. Hey, it's evening. It's evening already. What do you know? How long have I been spilling my heart out to you, Mr. Clover? An hour, maybe more. Ah, time flies. A guy tries to clean up his conscience, ease the soul, and it takes longer than he thinks. I ain't keeping you from anything, Mr. Clover. No, you've got all the time you need, Mr. Greenhouse. Go on. Oh, not much more to tell her, except what I told I see a murder take place. I report it. Common decency, I figure. What you call a murder took place over a week ago. How come it took you so long to give in to the call of decency? You got a point there, Mr. Clover. Well, tell me. See if I can explain it to you. Try hard. With all my might. I, I was a bookie once, like I told you. You told me. Uh, look, let me recap it, huh? So maybe it'll make sense to you it takes me a week plus to confess I saw a man push another man off a roof. You were a bookie. Take it from there. Yeah, a bookie. Until you boys came up with a thing to throttle initiative, dull the pioneer impulse of it. So I pit my brain against society, try to come up with a respectable dodge. 
uh, to earn my nut waffles and juice. But my mind has been in such a tight rut with 12 years of making book, all I can come up with is burglary. And that's when you saw it happen, while you were robbing an apartment in the East 30s. You got a woman that says I robbed? Uh-uh, I didn't. I tell you, this murder made such an impact on my conscience, I didn't rob, and I never will. According to our books, what you saw was a suicide. The suicide of a man named John Elgin. <laughs> How books can be mistaken. <laughs> Ask me, I know. You could identify the man if we found him, the man you say pushed Elgin off the roof, the man you say is a murderer? Identify him? I would draw my eyes into slits. Pretend I was in the emotional turmoil of over a week ago, witnessing the event from a fire escape across the airway. And I would try to identify him. You find him, and I sure would try. But I make no promises. Yeah. I ask your pardon, Mr. Greenhill. Well, it's okay. But for what? I didn't let you finish telling me why it took you this long to come to us with what you saw. <laughs> Forget it, kid. It was like this. I had some washing to do. My conscience, my past, the foolish notion I could be a successful burglar, which I am obviously not equipped, too emotional. This washing took me such a time. I now give it to you to hang out to dry. All right, you can go for now. Forever I can go, Mr. Clover. I can forget I saw a murder with my own eyes. Well, thanks for everything. You've been a dream. And watch him as he moves to the door. Stops. I'm glad I came here. What a load off the old chest. And leaves. The complete man. The happy citizen. Then turn your swivel chair around the window. Briefly watch the city leap into the night. And hear the sounds of it as quick and new and fleeting as spring wind on the strings of a harp. Walk away from it. Because the quality of this night is laced through with death talk. And so for a policeman, this night is work time. So the intercom, the order, the requisition, and the squad car is waiting downstairs. The drive to the East 30s. And the address trapped in the cone of the car spotlight. Four flights up and walk back, and the bell is to the right of the reef. Yes? Good evening. Uh, my name's Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Another one? I thought whatever business I had with you people about my husband was over, done with. There's a few more questions, Miss Elgin. May I come in? Yes. In here, please. Now, what are your questions? Are you convinced your husband killed himself? Yes. I see. Well? Has it occurred to you that someone might have pushed your husband off the roof? No. Suppose I told you someone had seen your husband murdered. Well? Well, that's what I'm telling you. Someone saw it happen. Who? Did your husband make a habit of spending much time up on the roof? Who saw my husband murdered? Well, that doesn't matter right now. What matters is that it's going to start all over again, Mrs. Elgin. A whole new investigation. I see. All right. My husband and I didn't get along. There was some talk of divorce. Never materialized. My husband was a moody man. He used to take walks. He used to walk down the hall, up the steps, onto the roof, and stare and smoke. And pace. One night he jumped. Now. Now what? Now take each one of the statements I just made and investigate them. Who saw my husband murdered? I told yes, you. Yes, you did. Very well, lie to me. If this is a method, do it. No one saw my husband murdered. Of course not. My husband's dead. My husband killed himself. I hope he rests in peace. Now get out of here. Don't move, Danny. Huh? I make this request of you. Just don't move. Stay where you are. And from this sculpted pose, congratulate me. Something good has happened to you, Gino? The best. The natal day of my youngest Amelia is writing Fini across yon spring sky. Huh? It was a beautiful day for the birthday of my youngest Danny. You should have told me before, Gino. I forgot. You I would, would have... have presented her with a present. What's a present when you can do what you can do? What can I do, Gino? 
At your leisure, call up my Amelia on the telephone. Wish her the many happy returns. For a girl who has just become a woman of 11 years, Danny, a call from such a grown-up fellow wishing her a wish, what more can such a woman ask? I'll do it, Gino. First free minute I get. Uh... <sighs> How well I remember the night she came to us. How almost she was born under the sign of the flying red horse. What? The sign of the flying red horse, Danny. Well, I had to stop at the gas station to refuel the borrowed machine in which Mrs. Tartaglia and I were making our scheduled journey to the hospital. Oh, yeah. This, of course, explains my Amelia's interest in such posies as Pegasus's and other beasties that fly with four legs. Of course. Well, Danny, now that we have disposed of the frills and flipperies, to work, huh? Well, whatever you say, Gino. <clears throat> and then to deceased John Elgin, whom we have called suicide, and with which verdict others differ. Well, what about him, Gino? This about him, according to our files. He was once picked up in a raid on an after-hours joint three months ago. With him was a woman, name of... Eh, let me adjust the specs to see. Name of Gladys Haywood of 1217 West 73th Street. The only memento the deceased John Elgin left to us, Danny. Give me that name and address, you know. Right here. Thanks. Now, get Detective Mugger and have him meet me with a squad car. Oh, and Gino... Yeah, Danny? It will be uh, too late to call your Amelia, so you give her my kiss. Good night, Gino. Leave headquarters again. The ride with Detective Mugger now up Riverside Drive, and this time of night is one with the river. Black. And the lights, flung downward from places far away, shimmer briefly and are gone. And the swift ebbing figures walking hand in hand by the water... And the lonely ones who stare at the moon's curved reflection. And the huddled ones who look for nothing at all. The river at 10 o'clock on a spring night. Take a turn on the 70s. Park the car and the house to find again. And a hall to walk. And a door found. Hello. Gladys Hayward? I'm Gladys. My name's Danny Clover. I'm... Police? That's right. You mind if I come in? Oh, I don't... Come in. You gonna stay long enough to sit? Sit. If you don't like it, I'll turn it oh, off. Oh, that's all right. We can talk. No. Now what? I'm trying to find out some background about John Elgin. Your name came up. On account of that raid. That's right. Was that the only night you were with, Mr. Elgin? I had about a year with him, mister. You want to try to believe something? I'll tell you something. I almost married him. He had a wife. I know. I met her. I had a chat with her and tea with her. Handshake. Looks into each other's eyes, woman to woman. Very civilized and up to the minute afternoon. I rang her bell and told her I was in love with her husband and wanted to marry him. What was her reaction? Smiles. She was all for it. She didn't like Mr. Elgin. She told me that when bent from the waist to pour the tea and looked up at me and smiled. About a month ago, this tremendous thing happened. Mrs. Elgin was going to divorce her husband and you were going to marry him, is that right? <laughs> the plans I have. What's happened? Pick up that book beside you, mister. War and Peace, it's called. I can't understand what it's about. The music I was listening to, I don't know what it's about either. Mr. Elgin gave me those things. And other things. First he said he loved me, and then he was going to educate me. From something simple, everything got complicated. His divorce. I don't know. So you broke it up? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I couldn't be a wife to Mr. Elgin, but... See, there I go again, calling him Mr. Elgin. I never could get around to call him by his first name. I sent him back to his wife and told him to stay there, and he thought that was the best idea. You see, a girl like me wants... What do I want? Can you tell me why anybody would want to murder John Elgin? I don't know. I don't know anything. Maybe I should have married him. Now what have I got to do? date with a guy at 11.30. I guess you better go now if that's all you want. Good night, Miss Henry. Danny? 
Let's go, Muggerman. Yeah, let's go. Let's just over the radio, Danny. You're shooting two blocks from here, liquor store. Come on. your name, mister? Ray Ford. This is my liquor store. All right. Tell me what happened, Mr. Ford. Well, a couple of minutes ago, that guy on the floor there walked in there for a bottle of booze. So I gave it to him, and he broke the bottle on the counter, shoved it at me, and said, give him money. Hey, I better get to a hospital or something. My hand's bleeding like a stuck pig. How'd your hand get cut like that? A little tussle we had. I grabbed the bottle from him. He kept coming. So I took my gun from under the counter and let him have it. You know who the man is you shot? Yeah, how do I know? I know his name's Greenhow. Got his wallet, Danny? I didn't have to. He was in my office a few hours ago to report a murder. He also told me how fast time fled. He told me he wanted to have a clean conscience. Is he dead? Yeah. Dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Now a few words from Burt Lancaster, star of the motion picture The Crimson Pirate. This is Burt Lancaster. I've been doing quite a bit of traveling around the world lately, either on location or making personal appearances. But I always keep in touch with Hollywood by listening to the Lux Radio Theater every Monday night over the CBS Radio Network. To radio actors, the Lux Radio Theater is Hollywood. Because you can always be sure of hearing the latest and best motion pictures with the original stars. Why don't you tune in with me to the CBS Radio Network next Monday night and hear some fine entertainment on the Lux Radio Theater. This Monday on most of these same CBS radio stations, Lux Radio Theater stars William Holden, Nancy Olson, and Lyle Betger in Union Station. When April comes to New York, Broadway slows down its pace to let spring come in. The walk is a kind of dream walk, languorous, rhythm to a pulse of cadence neon, to sun-worn blues yawned out a loudspeaker. And when nighttime comes, the street is filled with the sudden traceries of color that dart and ebb and dart again, and the swift laughter that spills out of doorways, perfume, warm and intimate and fleeting. So follow the crowd on Broadway. Lend your heart to it. Maybe this night will never get away from you. But it does. It always does. And in the corner of night where I was, there was no quality to the color. Where white walls touched one another, the pyramids of shadow in between. The emergency hospital and Dr. Sinsky and a man whose hand had been cut. Think it'll leave a scar, Doc? Over a period of time, it'll go away. Perhaps a slight itching now and then. You are a lucky man, Mr. Ford. No ligaments were injured. Uh, now, hold still for just another minute. Where do you live, Mr. Ford? 1212 West End Avenue. Watch that bandage, Doc. Feels a little tight. Watch it. Watch it! My prerogative as a physician, Mr. Ford, to calculate of a bandage whether or not it gives you some pain. Please don't jerk your hand away again. You have a license for this gun you killed Greenhow with? Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. Now bend your arm at the elbow, Mr. Ford. Yeah. Sure, I got a license for it. My store was held up five times, Clover. After number five, I got me a license. I got tired of donating to the Hoodlum Society of NYC. Let's slip this around here. Huh? Huh. Please, Mr. Ford, a little cooperation. This is just a slip. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Did you ever hear of a man named John Elgin, Mr. Ford? Elgin? That's right, John Elgin. Can't say as I have. Finished now, Doc? Yeah, all right. In a few days, go to your family physician. Let him look at that hand. He'll dress it and take out the stitches when it's healing. Get off the table now. Yeah. <laughs> look at this, will you? Arms dolled up like I was in an accident or something. A killing, Mr. Ford. Well, what would you do if your store was knocked over five times? Kiss the heister and hand him your register? Yeah, I killed him. Would you give me a license for a gun for if you didn't think I might have to use it? Sure, okay, Mr. Ford. You can go now. I'll get in touch with you when I need you. Uh, that's right, that way out, Mr. Ford. 
and the spring night is in full possession now. Its odors drift the corridors, seep into the room, blend with the acrid scent of pain present, pain past. The night wind of spring ripples a discarded ribbon of gauze stained with scarlet, floats it, traps it against your ankle. So leave this edge of night. Walk a street that leads into the blind alley of sleep. Walk, think, remember. The man who came to you told you he'd seen a murder committed, and in a few hours the man was dead. And another man, Ray Ford, liquor dealer who was weary of robbery, so got a license to kill. The licensed violence to kill a man who said a murder was committed had seen the cascade of death from a rooftop. The death of John Elgin that we had called suicide. Then the end of walking this spring night and open the windows of a room. Sleep. The next morning at headquarters, pick it up again. Consider again why a bookie named Larry Greenhow had brought you a week late the eyewitness account of John Elgin's death. Consider again the manner of the bookies dying. You've got a minute. I got something for you, Danny. The interruption. The motion detective Margovan in. Watch him kick a chair to the man he had brought with him. Right, sit down. Here. Make yourself at home. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Detective Margovan. Uh, I am tired. Oh, it's nice to meet up with a considerate man. What do you got, Margovan? Why'd you... The polite fellow there, Danny, I want him to make your acquaintance. That's Al Tedrow, Lieutenant Clover, Al. Indeed, a pleasure and a privilege, Lieutenant. Why did Detective Markham bring you to me, Mr. Tedrow? I honestly don't know. I've been minding my own affairs, leading the good life. Al here was leading the good life in the show up this morning, Danny. The boys picked him up around three last night. How many times have you been picked up like that, Al? Oh, I don't like to brag, but I should say I've been rousted in round numbers, Lieutenant. There are no complaints. Baker's doesn't. The boys are usually proper with me. Al's a beggar, Danny. Real pro, educated, polite. Tells his private brand of heartbreak, dimes, and small change. What's that got to do with me, mother? When the boys picked Al up last night, he had the best part of two grand on him. Tell the lieutenant where you got it, Al. Oh, with pleasure. Uh, let's see. Uh, yesterday? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yesterday I was summoned by Larry Greenhow to his favorite phone booth that he calls home. There to receive the payoff on a debt he owed me. A gambling debt I thought he had welched on. 2,000. Lovely number. Larry Greenhow, the man who was shot down. Same bookie, same man who told you he couldn't find a respectable job to keep him in coffee and cake. Same man pays off two grand. Now dead. Gotta be some. Danny Clover speaking. Dr. Sinsky, Danny, got something down here I want you to look at. Where are you? The morgue. Right away, Danny? Right away. <laughs> Here I am, Danny, over here. Uh, the reason why I called you and asked you to come down here to the morgue is... You because... said you had something interesting to show me, Dr. Sinsky. I said interesting, Danny, because to you, a policeman, that is a proper word. As far as I'm concerned, to me, it is merely a function come of Come on, the... come on, Doctor. What did you ask me to come down here for? I'll show you. Larry Greenow, Danny. Well, did you do an autopsy on him already? A merely a superficial examination, Right here. Look. A welt on the front of his thigh. What about it? Post-mortem lividity, Danny. What? A very simple thing. A person who, after he is dead, lies in one position for an hour or two, develops such a... a welt, as you call it. Hmm. A seepage of blood to the lowest part of the body. Physics, Danny. You mean Greenhow was lying on his face after he was killed? Yeah, probably with one leg drawn up under him. I uh, took the liberty, Danny, to call down for the photographs taken at the liquor store where Greenhow was found. Hmm. Here. Mm -hmm. Now, did I use the right word? Lying on his back. Yeah, you did, Doctor. It's interesting, all right. Thank you. Where's the nearest phone down here, Doctor? Yeah, uh, through that door. Thanks, Dr. Sinsky. Thanks a lot. All right, Miss Elgin. 
This is why I called you. This is why I picked you up. This is where we're going. You can sit right there in the car, Mrs. Elgin, and I'll get back in and we'll drive downtown and I'll book you for murder. Thanks. What are we going here for? Mrs. Elgin... I asked you a question. What are we going here for? You'll see. Come on. I want you to do something for me. What? Go in that vestibule and knock on the door. I'll wait here on the stoop. No. All right, let's go back downtown. What do you want of me? I told you. I didn't kill anybody? All right, you didn't kill anybody. Go in there and knock on the door. No one's home. Knock again. Again. Margaret. I didn't want to do it. He made me. He made me, Ray. I didn't want to do it. What? What, baby? What are you talking about? Inside, Ray. Inside, what? both of you. Thanks, Mrs. Elgin. All I needed was that the two of you knew each other. Ray, I didn't want to do it. He said he was going to charge me with murder. Well, baby, he you... He said should... he was going to charge me with murder, Ray. What's it all about, Paul? How's your hand, Ray? I get twitches. You'll get over it. Tell me again how you cut your hand, Ray. Like I said, with a bottle. What's this all about, Margaret? I don't know, honey. I guess all we can do is listen to Mr. Clover. Tell what for? What do we have to listen to him for? He thinks John was murdered, Ray. I don't know how he got that idea. I swear I don't know how he got that idea, Ray. How'd you get it, Clover? You killed a man named Greenhow in your store last night. He told me Margaret's husband was murdered. Yeah, he told you Margaret's husband was murdered. So? Who else is he going to tell? No one. You took care of that. What would you do if your store was knocked over five times, kissed the heister? Hand him your register? Yeah, yeah. Greenhow wasn't killed in your store, Ray. Where'd you kill him? Here? You going nutsy? Sure, I killed him in the store. Blood all over him, wasn't there? Where I shot him? Your blood. You cut your hand on purpose after you shot him. Look, Ray, there are a couple of things I can do. Have tests run on your blood type and Greenhow's, or have technicians tear this house apart looking for signs of blood. I figure this is where you killed him. You, Ray... You're in a lot of trouble. Shut up. I didn't say very much. I just Shut said... up. You killed Greenhow because he saw you push Mr. Elgin off the roof. Because he was blackmailing you. You told him that, Margaret? You told me to shut up, and I'm good to you shut up. You told him that, Margaret? He didn't need to. Ray. I learned that Greenhow paid off an old debt, a big debt. So I'd ask myself the question, where did he get the money? And why did he get the money? Why? Because he saw one man kill another. What did I kill John Elgin for? What motive did I have? You gotta have a reason. You gotta have a motive. You had a motive, Margaret. I still look good to you, Ray, honey. You almost had Margaret when her husband fell in love with another woman, but he got over it. Went back to Margaret. It was very touching. Gave me a speech about there wasn't gonna be a divorce, ever. He said, Let's start all over again. You remember, Ray? I tried to explain that to you. You're so hot tempered. Margaret, Margaret, for the love. So lo- hot. Margaret. Oh, it's over now, Ray. A little ex-book. You knew you were a murderer and blackmailed you. Then you got tired of paying him. So he came to me, labeled it murder, and went away. And Greenhow wasn't lying. He didn't tell you I'd killed Elgin. That's right. Greenhow didn't identify you. He just came to the police to frighten you. He just reported a murder. When he came back here to tell you what he'd done, you killed him. Margaret, help me. Can I talk now, Ray? Come on, come on, help me. He never said your name. Why didn't you pay him? He would have said it. Not if you'd have paid him. He would have said it. Look how hot-tempered he is. Knows everything. Him. Burns our life away. There's a special moon over Broadway tonight. It dips low and mixes with the laughter, the clack of heels, and the light flung downward from the spectaculars. And people look at it, point at it, wink at it, and run into whatever shadow they've planned for the night. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat.
Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Louise Lewis was heard as Margaret Elgin and Bill Boucher as Ray Ford. Featured in the cast were Charlotte Lawrence, Billy Halep, and Steve Roberts. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the exciting drama of mystery and murder and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint Gum. Wrigley Spearmint. Refreshing. Delicious. When the summer becomes August, Broadway pauses for a while, considers what happened to the springtime dreams to be fulfilled in the middle of July at the very latest, and what of the blonde on last month's snapshots, the one with sunny legs, the one you tried with poetry and she touched your cheek, the fawn of Camp Nevercare, jewel of the Catskills. She's back in the Bronx shoe store, kid, and the last time you walked by, she didn't look so good. And walk the streets furious with people and heat, and feel your throat tighten when it suddenly comes to you. Another summer's rushing away. Maybe next year, kid. Maybe. And uptown, east of Broadway, where I was, in the outdoor swimming pool, catering also to the seekers after something or other, the crowd was divided into swimmers, non-swimmers, sand sitters, ukulele players, and miscellaneous. And the man in the swimming trunks, lying on the concrete walk, the man who had drowned, and the police emergency crew working over him with a respirator. And the man from headquarters who had gotten there before me. They've been working on him for quite a while, Danny. Why'd you call me to come down, Muggerman? I asked the same question of Patrolman Kenny. It's like this, Danny. Kenny was flagged off his beat when this man was dragged out of the pool. Took off the man's locker check, went to the locker. You know, for identification. The locker was empty. Forced? Uh-uh. No, those locks answered with dime store skeleton key. Robbery gets a dozen calls a day from these pools. So you figure that man's drowning and his lockers being robbed had something in it? Maybe account. a coincidence, Danny. Maybe something else. I don't know. I wanted you to be here in case. Well, let's take a look. One of you men called the morgue. A lifeguard who pulled him out is that one, Danny. You want to talk to him? Uh-huh. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Uh, Russ Gavey. What happened here? Well, I was on my stand. Him, he started to yell. I went in after him. How'd you get those scratches on your shoulder? He fought me. Had to take him under to break his hold. And when he stopped struggling, I got him out. By that time, he needed artificial respiration. I gave it to him until your men came. All right. Did Detective Muggerman here tell you this man's clothes are gone, that it's going to be pretty difficult to identify him now? Yeah, he told me. Any ideas about it? Nope. Okay, Russ. <laughs> Back to the office at headquarters and sit with it. A man had been drowned in a public pool. From a policeman's point of view, worth only a quarter-page form in triplicate. However, the fact of his lockers being robbed may be something else again. Probably not. More forms. Then a couple of hours later, when the office gathers up its private shadows, a door opens. A man walks in. Uh, Danny, you busy? Come in, Dr. Sinsky. Sit down. Thank you. I just came from the autopsy room, Danny. And? Uh, has that man brought in from the swimming pool the drowned one? Has he been identified then? Not yet. What's in your mind? He was murdered. Murdered? How? Whoever administered artificial respiration to that man killed him as surely as if he had driven a knife into his heart. Dr. Sinsky... Gently, Danny, gently. I'll explain. 
Inside of the chest, Danny, is a delicate system of balances. Balances which cannot be upset, else a man's heart will be affected in his lungs. What's that got to do with murder? Simply that the autopsy I just performed on the drowned man revealed small internal hemorrhages. Bruises of the muscles and bones of the chest from too active a manipulation. You mean that lifeguard didn't do I mean he did a very bad job of artificial respiration. And that's why you call it murder. Not premeditated, of course, Doctor. This is not the question in your mind. You wanted to ask if it was premeditated, didn't you, Dan? And let the question take over the room. Add the weight of its violence to the oppressive night heat the stifling remembrance of other such questions posed in the same room quietly, fearfully, because a policeman, too, reacts to the touch of death. It fills the room, and against its pressure, you lift the phone, make the call to the Department of Public Works, have them check personnel files, come up with an address for Russ Gavey, lifeguard. Go there to the hall bedroom furnished in the style of brownstone, East 20s. Find it empty of Russ Gavey. Be told on the way out by the woman spread wide on the stoop you should have asked before. Russ was across the street in the park on that bench fighting for his share of the night air. Walk up to Russ. Let him chew the last fiber of a matchstick. I'm taking my well-earned rest. You want to help, Mr. Clover? Sure. Mind if I sit down, Russ? Sure, sit down. You were almost a hero today, Russ. You're kidding. That's how I make my daily summer bread, 50 bucks a week. Ogle a girl, save a life. How long have you been a lifeguard, Russ? Oh, six, maybe seven summers. Time out for a frolic on Anzio Beach. Then you've uh, had a lot of experience saving people from drowning. Am I a lot of share? The medical examiner down at headquarters says that man you try to save... Yeah, I remember. Our medical examiner says he was murdered. Oh? How come? Our man says it was murdered because artificial respiration wasn't applied properly. Well, your man is a smart man. But a four bit a week lifeguard does the best he can. He studies in classes, he follows a first aid manual. <laughs> you call him a murderer because he didn't make out with one poor slob. You tell me, Russ. You murder the man? Well, considering the percentage of lives that are saved and not saved by such as we, that's a question you may never be able to answer. How cop? I'll keep trying, Russ. You won't mind, huh? <laughs> Danny, why don't you never turn on a light? You sit like this in the dark by yourself. It's... I got one of the Tartaglia kids to home does the same thing. You both make me feel the same way. You've got your problems, haven't you, Gina? I could do without them. You in the mood, Danny? Sure, for whatever. What have you got? Nothing. No progress on identification of the drowned man. No progress on a connection between him and that lifeguard, Russ Gaby. Reports on Gaby State, he is looked up to at the pool by girls and ladies-sized swimmers. Occasionally, he buys for one or the other a beer at the concession stand. Occasionally, he escorts one or the other type to her home, deposits it, goes to the newsstand, buys super-type magazines, goes to his room. Healthy, normal muscle boy. Maybe a murderer, Gino. Oh, pardon me, Danny, but I must take a... Sergeant Artaglia speaking. Yes? Yeah, I got it. Hanson's Pawn Shop, East 34th. I told you I got it. <sighs> they bother us with such... Such what, you know? A man with a pawn shop got the nudge just in the midst of a nice conversation because somebody who works in a pool hocked a suit of clothes. Valuables. Look to this Mr. Hanson like stolen goods. On East 34th? Yeah. Then why bother yourself with it, Danny? Because maybe it'll give me the name of a murdered man. You might ask me why I called the police, Mr. Clover, after so many months of abstemiously staying away from you fellows. All right, Mr. Hanson, why? Because there was something fishy about it this time. Hmm? This suit, this watch, ring, money clip was brought me by a boy who's an attendant at a public pool. A pool on Upper Broadway? Inevitably, that pool where that unidentified man was drowned, his things stolen, you read about it, of course. Who brought these to you? A boy. Know him well. Had dealings with him intermittently. Who's the boy? Bobby Kent. 
He's got a room in one of those crates on East 37th, uh, uh, 1654, East 37th. Just ask for Bobby, we all know him. And you think these things belong to the drowned man? The man was robbed where Bobby works, died where Bobby works. Bobby pawns things that obviously don't belong to him. What is there left for a decent man to think, Mr. Clover? Then the three walk through the languid summer night, the city-bound and the dream-bound people on the sandstone steps who find their delights in a pop bottle, or by taking possession of a star in the sky, or by cooling themselves with a fan, courtesy of Swanson's chicken fricassee. Pass them and mind the kiddies at their nighttime play, the patter of little feet up an alley, and arrive at the address on 37th Street. And over one of the bells, see a name, Bobby Kent, apartment three. The sound you hear is the far-off thunder made of heat and air currents and stratosphere. And the lightning through the window at the end of the corridor lights up the number three on a door, briefly. Then again. Bobby. Bobby Kent. This is the police, Bobby. Open up. I'm coming in, Bobby. Bobby was in. His shirt was ripped, his face bloody, hands tied behind his back, belt around his neck, and the belt was strung over a pipe near the ceiling. Uh. I brought over a chair to stand on. There was lightning again, and the whole room was stark white for an instant. It took a while to get Bobby down, but it didn't matter. Bobby had been dead when I got there. Bobby had been murdered. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway leans against a doorway, flips a coin, and makes odds on the 31 days of August. This month, kid, it'll come in. The filly in the third, the dreamboat. The oil on that little piece of property you leased in the Texas Badlands. Gotta come in. Otherwise, what have you been building, kid? Gotta come in. So you can indulge the whim of the hour. Enjoy it. Own it. All that neon. Yours to turn on or off. That music of the dance calling to you from basement dance lands. Yours to play soft or loud. Or cut off like that. Dance in dark and in stillness if you want. The traffic signals pushing back the people. Yours to make say stop, go... You're a king, man, with headlines at your feet. Boy murdered, hung by belt in tenement room. Unknown man drowned in public pool. All yours, kid. A clean shuffle, a minute of luck, and it's all yours. And the next morning at headquarters, consider your share of it. Yours and Detective Muggerman's. You still stick with that, Danny, that the man in the pool was murdered? Yeah. You don't like it? Oh, it's not that, Danny. It's only so many people drowned, so many can't be saved. You going to go back and call everyone that wasn't the murder victim? Russ Gavey is a trained lifeguard. He told me the man fought him, had to be pushed under. Happens that way sometimes, Danny. Could have been the other way around. Could have been Russ wanted the man dead. It could have been he fought the man, drowned him, finished him with his own brand of artificial respiration. Could have been. But where's the string that knots it, Danny? What connection that is That kid there? that was hung, Bobby Kent, the attendant at the pool. That could be a connection. Because he stole a man's clothes out of a crummy locker? We're not even sure they belong to the drowned man. What do we know about them, Muggerman? Well, from the cleaner's marks, they belong to a man named Howard Crawford. Married. I checked his wife. 
Should be at the morgue to identify in a half hour. Would have come sooner. Wanted to go out and buy a dress first. I let her. I'll go down and meet her. You get whatever you can on Bobby Kent. Friends, people he stole from, whoever wanted him I'm dead. I'm working on it. To put a tail on Gavey. Every breath he breathes, I want to report. Got it. Anything else, Danny? Yeah. Why does a woman need a new dress to look at a dead man? I don't know. Ask her when you see her. Are you ready, Mrs. Coffin? Waiting for you. All right. Just look at this man and tell me if he's... Okay, uh... okay. Put him back. He's mine. Can we get out of this place now? Of course. I'm through this door. You want to sit down on this bench for a minute? Or else, huh? Sure, I'll sit. What do you think of my husband, Mr. Clover? Can you imagine it? Howard getting himself a piece of marble in a police morgue. When did you see him last? I got out of a warm bed yesterday morning on account of the phone ringing. It was for Howard. He pinched my cheek, said, Goodbye, honey, I'm going out of town. This happen often, his going out of town? In his line, salesman. And you didn't see him after that? Look, boyfriend, I was in the middle of a beauty exercise, bendovers for the figure. I was grabbing my ankles, I looked back. There he was, going out of the house. Doesn't it seem strange to you that he didn't go out of town, that he was it's found? strange to me he's dead. But I'm going to get used to it. Who do you know had a reason for murdering him? Murdered? Thought you said he drowned. Do you like to swim, Mrs. Cough? You see this sunburn? You think I got it standing under a hot iron? Look at it, see? How you like it? Did you get it at that swimming pool uptown? Coney. I know a part of Coney where they carry a pretty good crowd. That's where this burn came from. There's a lifeguard at that pool. I go to Coney where they carry a million on a weekend. I don't confine me to public pools uptown. Did you have anything to do with your husband's death, Mrs. Crawford? Now, I'm a girl who's going to tell you the truth, boyfriend. Every time I've thought of it, I've wished Howard dead every hour on the hour. And I wished him dead on the half hour, too, but that's when the race results come over the radio. Howard, things have come true. I've wished for him. That's all, Mrs. Crawford. You can get out of here now. And watch her reapply the lipstick and readjust her clothes and walk away from her dead to a summer rhythm that no longer held any part of him. A woman starting the new day fresh, the memory she had submitted to now happily dead on a marble slab. And at the end of the corridor, the street sunlight touching her face for an instant, darting away, leaving only pallor and the smear of scarlet on her lips. Back in the office, order a shadow for Mrs. Crawford. Then a telephone report from Mugovan. He had found a girl who was the girlfriend of Bobby Kent, a box office girl in an all-day, all-night movie on East 125th. Lucille Lang, on duty for the rest of the day and night. How many? Police, Miss Lang. Take back your badge. It don't buy you nothing. You were a friend of Bobby Kent's. Look, you, you want to lose me my job? All we want, Miss Lang, is... All you want is to mark me lousy with the management. A sweaty cop snooping around where I live. I know, my girlfriend called me. Told me he had his nose in my affairs, asked questions. She had to tell him I was cozy with Bobby. All we want is something that'll give us Bobby's killer. Search me up and down, you won't find Bobby's killer. Then maybe someone who wanted him dead. All the kid ever did was steal a buck here and there. So he could make an impression on me, on my girlfriend. Boy has to die for that. He was a thief. Ain't everybody kiddo one way or another. To sweep out the locker room in a public pool. To empty the foot bath, scrub them out. You think that's the end of the rainbow for a kid? Did you know about the clothes he stole from the pool? The watch, the ring, the money clip? Sure, I know. He told me. I even know about the 500 bucks that was in the suit. 500? We were going to take it and go off to faraway places. Did you know something, kiddo? What? Bobby's dead from hanging, and I'm cooped up in a cage. So I ain't gonna make it, am I? Danny? Oh, come on in, Margaret. What do you want? An opinion. About what? 
About how soon we should pick up Russ Gavey for the murder of Crawford and that pool attendant? If we pick him up, how long do you think we can hold him? A killer, Danny. He's... How are you going to prove premeditated murder by artificial respiration? Now, maybe we shouldn't start from there, Danny. Maybe we should start from the attendant. Now, he killed Bobby Kent because Bobby stole the clothes. Because Bobby would learn that the clothes belonged to Howard Crawford. Bobby was a sneak thief. From there to blackmail him, one easy lesson. So we get back to Howard Crawford. You know what we need, Mugovan. Yeah, and motive. We gotta find our wife. Danny! You got something, Gino? Officer Rachi just called from a gas station on Queens Highway. Mrs. Crawford just rest- registered at the Ritz Lodge Motel, about ten miles out of the city. Thanks, Gino. Mugovan. Yeah, Danny. That shadow you got on Russ gave you, get him off. I don't want him followed. All right. Where are you going? To find out why a widow wanders far from home. <laughs> You'll like them too, lover. You like them? That's your going away dress, Mrs. Crawford? It could be for that, too. You've got a home in Manhattan, Mrs. Crawford. What are you doing here? Where's your home, boyfriend? And what are you doing here? I wanted to talk to you. Me and my sunburn made an impression, huh? So you got a flunky to follow me. You could have done it yourself. No uproar would have happened. Well, here we are. You still haven't answered my question. What are you doing here? Girl likes to get away sometimes. You'd be surprised how many phone calls I've gotten since Howard drank all that water. Here's a dime. Throw it in the radio. No? Then I'll throw it a dime. Yep, phone calls all day long. No, it's your turn. Just to talk. Kill some time. Ah, that Kenton. Uh, Oh, what'd you say, lover? Nothing. I didn't say anything. Look, be a doll. Will you go away? Come back another day. I'll be here. Let's pick a Tuesday. Make a definite, huh? Why don't you go right now? Out the back way, through a window? Just get up. Hi, Russ. Got a little trouble. Come in, Russ. Close the door. I'll bet the lady told you to get out of here, Mr. Clover. Uh Uh-huh. You two know each other pretty well, don't you? Yeah, a swimming pool romance. I saw him in those California feet flippers, and it twisted my heart. You two planning on going away together? I only ask because the back of Russ's car is loaded with suitcases. We're going to get married in Maryland. Is there a law? Yes, there is. There's a whole section in the penal code about murder. Yeah, back to that, huh? I could have picked you up before, Russ, but I needed a motive. I had to find out why you murdered Howard Crawford. There she is. How did I kill him? By drowning him. You made sure the resuscitator squad wouldn't revive him. You crushed out whatever life there was in him. Listen to him, Edith. Yeah, listen. You killed Bobby Kent. He was a petty thief. He took the clothes you'd stolen from Crawford. Sooner or later, he'd put two and two together. Probably would have blackmailed you. You couldn't afford to let that happen. You ready, Edith? I'm ready. Only one thing, Russ. What? I'm a happy girl, Russ. I like to live happy. From just now on, you're going to be a burden. As long as lover here's got you, I don't want you. Both of you. You're an accessory, Mrs. Crawford. Well, that changes things right away. Russ. Yeah. Don't be a fool. Okay, your way, Russ. You'll never be the same. Ready to go back to town, Mrs. Crawford?
It's the time on Broadway when the crowd gives up, goes home. Then it's the street of the dim moonlight and the dark whispers. The wind of the night. The wind that scatters everything. Yesterday's headlines. Yesterday's dreams. Yesterday's people. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My Beat. My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway's glitter is soft, easy on the eye. The glint of pavements has not yet reached its nighttime sheen. The stone is still warm from the touch of twilight, and the neon has not yet bled into scarlet. The voices that screamed against the day are quieter now, and the walk slower. It's the in-between time when the day has not yet yielded to wanton night. It's the end of a tear time before the next one scars your cheek. It's your time, kid, so hold it close. Broadway's clock spins fast. And where the dusk touches night, it walks you through the arch on Washington Square, past the woman whose fearful eyes are on a child balanced on the edge of a fountain, across a quiet street, and into a brownstone hung with mirrors and crystal. And death is reflected many times over. The man who kneels beside it gives you the moment to consider it, then offers it to you. Lily Nelson, then. Slashed wrists. Last week, my wife made me buy tickets to her play. All I could get was sometime next June. She was sold out that far. Slashed wrists. You got here fast. So beautiful, Danny. So... I never thought I'd stand so close to her. I said I... you... Yeah, yeah, how I got here. It was phoned in, Danny. Anonymous call. Said Lily Nelson was in trouble. Said... Anonymous? We got a tracer on it, Danny. By the time you get back to headquarters... Maybe you we'll found get... her like this? Yeah. The door was open. I walked under all these crystal chandeliers, past all the mirrors. Found her lying in front of this one, dressed like that. That material, it's like a veil, Danny. It's No one with her? I looked through the house, no one. Was she leaving a note, anything? Nothing, Danny, just the razor blade by her side, that's all. Lily Nelson. You gotta go to ticket scalpers. Beg them to sell you a ticket overpriced just so you can watch her. Why should she kill herself? For what? And suddenly, catch the image of yourself in a ceiling-to-floor mirror. The dark gray suit, striped tie, shoes slightly scuffed. And on the floor next to them, blonde hair, white face, negligee, and slashed wrists. Image of a policeman at work. Turn your back on it. Put a subordinate in charge. Walk out. And back at headquarters, be assured that other policemen had been at work. The anonymous phone call had been traced. The caller apprehended, arrested, brought downtown, was waiting for you. So flip a switch on the intercom. Yeah, Danny? Bring him in, Gino. Right. And wait. And wonder briefly at the pattern of it, repeated too often. Why a beautiful woman, at the peak of her career, must have the fine edge of a razor to... And the opening door closes your mind to it. In here. That'll be all, Gino. All right, you can sit. Uh, I wasn't sure. That's why I called. I knocked the way I always do, and she didn't answer. And right away, I, I can't explain it. I, I had a feeling that... Sit down. That's the only way I can explain it, the feeling... Go ahead, that... sit down. Oh, what's your name? Columbo, Frank Columbo. You, you see the reason... What do you do, Frank? I drive her. I'm her chauffeur. That's why. I think there could be any other reason why a guy like me could knock on her door. What do you know about well, it? Just take it easy, Frank. Tell me about it. Seven o'clock. I called for her to take her to the theater. She didn't answer my knock. 
Never happened before. I got worried. I called you police. Why didn't you give your name? Maybe I was being crazy, being worried, but you don't know. You don't know. Know what, Frank? Why shouldn't I worry? You know what she was, Lily Nelson? I know. You know. I drove her, mister. You think I cared about the men who sat with her? They didn't last. None of them. I did. I've seen her cry. Oh? Seen her cry when she was alone. Sitting there in the back of the car. Crying. I'm the man who's seen Lily Nelson cry. You know what a woman feels for a man when she lets him see her cry? Yeah, Danny. She never said it, but... Better get him, Gino. It was going to happen one day. She'd find out I wasn't like the rest. She'd look at me... And in the moments against his being taken away, listen to the man cry out his love, the waited-for love, night-dreamed, reflected in a rear-view mirror. And finally, it was all spilled out, and the words became syllables of anguish and loss. Watch the officer take his arm gently, lead him to a place where pain is made articulate, given reason, noted in files. Then gather up the publicized elements that had contrived to give life to Lily Nelson, then taken it from her. Her appearance one night in a mediocre play, the two-line favorable review, the nurturing of it until it became columns and stardom. And at the crest of it, the play now running, The Forsaken, starring Lily Nelson, produced by Jason Giever, Crane Theater. And remember that Broadway whispered of Giever as the star maker, the first to give Lily a leading role. Without him, Lily would have remained a walk-on, a spear carrier. Go to the theater. Ask for him. Be told he was in his office at the head of the balcony. Find him suffering over the night's box office report. Someone told you you could see me? They were wrong. Police. They're still wrong. Lily Nelson was... You came here to tell me about Lily personally, out of your own mouth? What's the technical phrase for the butchering of Lily's wrists? Tell me. I'd want to know. I'm eager for crumbs of information. So am I. That should make it easier for us. You walked through my theater. You saw the empty seats. That's what it is without Lily. Rows of emptiness. Tomorrow I close the play. Because your box office report shows a loss? You're trying to shame me, policeman. It won't work. Lily meant money to me and heartache and laughs. I could count on the fingers of my left hand. Yeah, it's all here in the box office report. You sound like a man who was... Now you're going to say I was in love with her? Is that what you're going to say? All right, you were in love with her. I knew you'd be wrong. Mm -mm. No, not me. But Lily, all the major male stops from here to Hollywood and back, maybe. And a few crests and crowns across the ocean. But never me. She didn't touch me that way. The emotional climate between us said Nix. Nix, Jason, Nix. Then all Lily was to you was... Oh, a punk kid I saw in a play once. She had something. Radiant, size, dimension, depth, who knows what. All I know is I brought it out in her. Once I drank champagne from her slipper. I was so pleased with the performance she gave. Then passed the slipper around to her escorts. You gave her all that and she's dead. Why? Maybe her current flames are burning low. Excuse the cliché. Who would they be? Two. The one that gives the columnists their daily bread. The love of Lily for the boy who directed her in this play, David Knight. The other? Who else? Her psychiatrist, Dr. Kobach of Park Avenue. He's loved by tons of women. Lily wasn't one to be left standing out in the rain. Something else for you of the police? What? Whatever I probed out of Lily to make her give a performance, the one emotion I couldn't get from her was the emotion for self-destruction. A very definite lack. hmm? In here, Mr. Clover. Thank you, Doctor. Please be seated. There are cigars in the humidor by your arm. Dr. Kovac... Uh, first, an understanding, if you please. Tonight, as you have seen, I entertain friends of mine. You've called me away from them. 
Therefore, you interrupt. It's a matter of importance, Doctor. You see, there I... There is no malice. Merely the statement that you interrupt. So, if you will be brief... It's about Lily Nelson. Yes. You were her doctor, her psychiatrist. Yes. I want you to tell me about her. About her? Listen, Doctor. A woman is dead. It looks like suicide. It probably is suicide. The reason I'm questioning you is routine police procedure. Just to satisfy ourselves, it was suicide. So we know what... It was not suicide. What? It was not suicide. How do you know? Dear man, Lily did not slash her wrists. How does one know something? I know. All right, you know. How do you know it and the police don't know it? But you have already said it so nicely. I am a psychiatrist. Lily was too much in love with herself to have mutilated even a hair on her head. As for slashing her wrists, <laughs> agree with me. Ridiculous. I'm not so sure. She was found dead in front of a mirror. Wouldn't that fit in with what you said? No, on the contrary. Lily couldn't bear the shock of seeing herself in pain. You're telling me she was murdered, Doctor? Merely that she did not commit suicide. Now, if you would... In a minute, Doctor. A woman like Lily Nelson would have a lot of admirers, wouldn't she? Dear man, there were legion. Admirer upon admirer. You? Dear man, you? I'm old enough to... Well, a facet of Lily Nelson. She was in love with me. I see. Which, of course, you do not. She loved me as all women love their psychiatrists. It was Lily's protection of herself for telling me her secrets... What about her secrets? Mm, none, really. It is fashionable for an actress to have a psychiatrist. She was neurotic, Mr. Clover, to a degree dependent upon your tolerance and comprehension. Mildly neurotic, I would say. But then, aren't you, I, all of us? Now, if you will pardon me. Thank you, Mr. Clover. <laughs> And be ushered out of the library by him. And past the guests who resented alien feet walking through a string quartet. Shh. Finally walk through a door and get out. <laughs> then one more stop to make. To the other man whose name had been told me. David Knight. David Knight, director of Lily Nelson's show. Go to him. Ask him whether he thought Lily Nelson committed suicide. Forget. What do you want? Police, I, I have to shut up. The Listen to her. I shall not feel the rain. Listen, it's Lily. I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain. And dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise nor set. Happily I may remember. And happily may forget. That was Lily. Lily Nelson. She made that record for you? Lily, Lily. Mr. Knight. Who are you? What do you want? I told you, I'm from the police. Ever since I heard, ever since the news was told me, I've, I've been here listening to her. She's talking to me. Listen. Listen to Lily. When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, no shit. Lily! <laughs> Lily, I killed you! I killed you! I'm a murderer! Murderer! <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When it's October and autumn catches hold, Broadway comes up with a miracle. The leaves of red and gold are pasted in flight in shop windows. The stuffed squirrels nibble at plastic acorns, and the mannequins smile their autumn smile, an emotion compounded of wax and the new mink coat. Minor miracles may also be observed. Pink in cheeks, a spring of your step, and fresh air. It's a new time on Broadway. It's a new season. 
Open the installment account, kid. The world is yours. And where I was was a world compounded on a different stuff. Pain and grief, <laughs> the smashed remnants of two lives, and the residue of all of it. A man named David Knight, a man who said he was a murderer. I killed her. I killed her. You held her down and slashed her wrists and watched her die. Killed her. Why? Why? You don't know why? Because you loved her and Because cheated. I loved her. Oh, no. Because she loved me. What? She loved me. I wouldn't have her love. She killed herself. You mean you didn't kill her? Yes, I did. It's my fault she's dead. Don't you see? Don't you understand? No, I don't understand. I suppose I owed it to her. To love her. But I couldn't love her. And you were telling me she committed suicide. But it was my fault she did. Don't you understand that? I'm a murderer. I'm a killer. I killed Lily Nelson. Take it Just easy. as surely as if I... You didn't kill her. It wasn't your fault that... I'll show you. But... Don't be a fool. I'll show you. <laughs> you... <laughs> You've got a gun. Why don't you shoot me? That's what you want me to do, isn't it? <laughs> yes. It's because of what I did to her. I can book you for assault, Mr. Knight. Not for murder. <laughs> you okay? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Forget it. <laughs> it's funny. Lily's dead now. She's dead. And all of a sudden, I'm in love with her. <laughs> Then give the boy his release and his own cognizance. Watch him kneel to the floor, gather up the fragments of poetry once spoken only for him by Lily Nelson, and now only jagged pieces of a phonograph record. Watch as he holds them for a moment, then flings them into the wastebasket. Then leave him with it. Then walk the edge of a night to a room where sleep will come to you. Because it's a long time coming, fill in the darkness with the memory of a girl who lay in death before a ceiling-high mirror. And list the varying opinions of her dying. Her chauffeur, who was frightened because Lily hadn't answered a door. Her producer, who found in Lily no emotion that would warrant her suicide. Her psychiatrist, who thought the same, but for a different reason. Her director, who believed her dead because of a love he wouldn't bestow on her. And finally, sleep had entered the room. In the morning, back to the office. Back to the paperwork. Danny? Oh, come in, Gino. I give you... <laughs> I... Bless you. It was nice of you to think of me at moments like this. Well, not at all. Me in the midst of my... <laughs> Bless you. Who needs it? Just hand me the dose of tissue in my breast pot. Uh, here you are, Gino. <laughs> Thank you. Now to the affairs of the day, which amount to practically nil. Miss Lily Nelson, beloved star of the stage, was indeed beloved. Male admirers to stun the imagination. We knock when we enter Danny Clover's office, miss. I'm sorry. At the desk, the man... Well, it's all right. What can I do for you? I'm Janie Cochran. I feel you ought to know about me. Oh? Why? I was a great and true friend of Lily Nelson's. And you want to tell me about it? Of course I do. All right, Miss Cochran. Tell me. It started last year. I came to New York. You see, my home is in Mount Vernon. I came to New York and I had a grand idea. Go on. It was Thanksgiving vacation and I was on my high school paper and I thought it would be a grand idea to get an interview with Lily. And I did. I see. The, then what happened? Lily was so nice to me. And when I told her about my dramatics and how I was in all my school plays, you know what she said? No, I don't. She said I had the making of a great actress. I didn't believe her, but she was really serious. Oh? Of course she was. She came up to Mount Vernon and visited me. Mother was flabbergasted. Then Lily started to come up and stay almost every weekend. Mother fixed up a room so we could be alone together while we were working. That's funny. I've, I've talked to a lot of people who knew Miss Nelson. None of them ever mentioned you. Oh, we kept it a secret. It was our secret. Lily's and mine. What else did she do for you? Every weekend, presents. A watch. This one. The dress I'm wearing. And picnics and rides. So many things. Did you ever meet any of her other friends? Oh, never. 
We had a secret friendship. But now... Well, it's all over. Isn't it, Mr. Clover? Again, I must tell you, Mr. Clover, you disturb at bad times. Many patients wait upon me. I'm sure they'll understand when you've told them how a policeman came to you for help. You are in need of it also? And you use your authority? To... You told me before all of us are. You, me, everybody. And your trouble, dear man? People keep things from me. Smile to themselves when I leave a room because they're so much smarter than I am. Dear man, this is no extraordinary ailment you suffer. Rather, it is ordinary. It, it bothers me you smile to yourself when I leave a room, Dr. Kovac. I did that? To you? I asked you for Lily Nelson's secrets. You told me there weren't any. Even if there had been, I have the right as a professional man, as a man of stature in your community, to deny them to anyone. Our community has a law against people who withhold evidence in murders. Your conclusion, then, dear man, is that Lily was murdered. Let's kick it around for a while, shall we, Doctor? I could permit myself to be taken by the law... To be prosecuted, harassed. And you'd keep your mouth shut? Dear man. We'll hire our own psychiatrist. Dig into every secret Lily ever shared with anyone. You threaten, dear man. Let's call it an alternative. Lily will be remembered as the most superb actress of her time. A Bernard, a Doucet, a flame of classic beauty. A passion brought to life for men whose lives were empty, unfulfilled. You wish to destroy this, this memory of Lily? We believe she was murdered. And I too, dear man. You told me she was loved, admirers by the Legion, you said. I was not lying. But Lily... Please, was... let me gather my thoughts away to... Please. Perhaps this will make it clear. It is true Lily was loved. But in her, there was no love to return. Go on. Please. Lily had not the capacity for love. She pretended with these, her admirers, with me too. Dear man. Every particle of love that Lily had to give, she gave to the theater. Every emotion she had was, how do I present it on the stage for people to feel? Every passion, every desire, every... What was there left for Lily to give to another? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Thank you, Doctor. For what? That you now have motive for the murder. And for this you will destroy the image of Lily Nelson. You say to me, thank you. I cannot say to you, you are welcome. My other patients wait upon me, Mr. Clover. Oh. Hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. Can I, uh, get you something? Bourbon? Scotch? I'm not interrupting something, am I? What do you mean? Two drinks over there? <laughs> I've been clumsy. No, you're not interrupting. Janie, come on in. Hello, Mr. Clover. It's late, Miss Cochran. Don't you have to get back to Mount Vernon? No, I called Mother. She knows where I am. What are you doing here? I had an idea. I've just told it to Mr. Knight. He seems to agree with me. An idea about what? This child's a fine actress. She wants me to work with her. After all, Lily taught me so much. Mr. Knight's already listened to me read. He says I even sound like Lily. She does, Mr. Clover. That's why you want to work with her? The best reason in the world? For you, yeah. I can create another Lily Nelson with this child. Child? I'm going to learn not to be a child. That's why I came here. I think you ought to go back to Mount Vernon, Janie. Don't be stupid. I think you ought to go back to Mount Vernon because what happened to Lily Nelson might happen to you. What do you mean, what happened to Lily? Murdered by you. I told you that. But I was just... I know, upset. But you really did murder her, really did slash her wrists. Oh, no, that's not right. Mr. Knight told me what happened. He didn't love Lily, so she killed herself. That's the way it was, Janie. Not exactly. Lily wasn't in love with anybody. Her doctor told me that. She was in love with one thing, the theater. It was her obsession. She didn't have the energy to love anything else. Mr. Clover, 
I know, Janie. She had time for you. Because in you, Lily saw herself, a new star, another Lily Nelson, young, fresh. <laughs> it's funny, huh? When something's funny, I laugh, and I'm laughing. Listen, Mr. Knight. Lily Nelson had a hundred admirers. You were just one of them. They all tried to make love to her, and she could never return it. She cried about it. There's a man or chauffeur who's seen her weep just for that reason. That's right. Lily told me about that. She loved me. No. You loved her. She couldn't love you. You killed her. I want to go home. Don't listen to him, Janie. And you, Janie. So much like Lily, your voice, the way you carry yourself. That's why you're here with him. Janie? I... Let me go home, Mr. Knight. I'll come back. I'll come back tomorrow. I promise. Did she teach you that too, Janie? Please. Please, I promise. Hey, do you hear? You hear that, Mr. Clover, the way she said it? Let's go, Mr. Knight. I'll tell you what's going to happen to you, Janie. What happened to Lily? Listen to me, Mr. Clover. You think the chauffeur was the only man who saw Lily cry? I saw her cry, too. Before she died. She got down on her knees and cried. She said she wanted to love me. She said she couldn't love me. She couldn't love anybody. So she begged me to kill her. Because she couldn't love. She begged me. Begged. That I killed her. Do what he says, Janie. Go home. Broadway's having itself a time. It's cocky and needling people to step over the line. It makes a big muscle and dares the nighttime. It's frenzy and big noise, mostly the noise. Otherwise, you'd hear a heartbreak. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Paul Fries was heard as David Knight, Joyce McCluskey as Janie Cochran, Jane Avello as Dr. Kovac, Ed Max as Jason Giever, and Clayton Post as Frank Colombo. Bill Anders speaking. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, where you can take a bus ride into the summer evening and make believe it's a dreamboat. Then, Broadway's as innocent and nostalgic as carousel music. But if you walk, you can get hit in the face by a guy fishing for nickels under a grating. Then you can't make believe anymore. But either way, it's Broadway. My beat. <laughs> big voice that boomed through the afternoon heat belonged to Silks Bergen. Him, the heat couldn't bother. There wasn't enough of it. Silks was a jockey, about five hands high, and with a wet saddle, he might have scaled 110. He waved to me from the doorway of a haberdashery store. In here, Dan, in the store. Yeah, Silks, sure. I've been waiting. <coughs> I said I, uh, been waiting for you to pass by, Danny. What's the matter with your voice, Silks? You're down to a whisper. Laryngitis. Had it for a week. 
Hey, uh, Danny, I want that you should meet a friend of mine, Joe Murdoch. Hey, say some hello to Danny Clover, Joe. Hello, Mr. Clover. Joe? Joe's six foot six and speaks like a tenor. <laughs> you should know about things like that, Danny. Is it possible? I... Joe, uh, huh? go buy me a shirt over there. I got to talk to Danny. Sure, Silk. Uh, the lavender and the polka dots. The dots, Joe, yeah. the dots. Yeah. Can you hear me good, Danny? My voice has got so far to go from down here for me to up there to you. I'll listen close. What's on your mind? I want you to... I, I said, I said, do me a favor, huh? About the key. Why didn't I think of it myself, about the key? What key, Silks? Well, I'm riding a race down to Maryland tomorrow, you see. I don't know how long I'll be gone. Now, you understand? Oh, that key. What key, Silks? The key for the locker at the LaGuardia plane terminal. Oh, now I know. That key for that locker. Huh? I got a parcel check there. I ain't got time to run down for it now. It begins to dawn, Silk. Yeah, sure. So if I ain't back tomorrow night, how about having one of your boys who's on duty down there pick it up, huh? Yeah. And you hold it for me. Yeah. That'll save me rental, and it'll make us even for them riding lessons I give you in Central Park. <laughs> okay, Socks. Give me the key. Yeah, thanks, Danny. Yeah. And now, now don't lose it. Uh, don't worry about it. I'll put it right here on my ring. By the way, what's in the parcel? <laughs> Just some of my riding silks, Danny. <laughs> what else does a jockey own? <laughs> I patted silks on the head, bit him a fond yoikes, and mushed back into the tropical heat of Broadway. Tropical was an illusion that wasn't hard to believe. The crushed pineapple and papaya stands, the coconut milk and real whiskered coconuts, the sly grinning beat of the native drums heard through wilting loudspeakers, the girls, the luminous girls in their grass sandals and 14th Street sarongs. And then one whose lips looked as if they'd been painted with wild strawberries stopped me and kept me from my appointed rounds. I didn't mind. I'm so honest. I don't have the price of a dream, and I'm honest. Here, you dropped this. What? This hundred-dollar bill. You dropped it. Take it before it burns through my hand. A oh, hundred dollars. Wasn't I the careless one? Must have been in that Cracker Jack box I just threw away. Never throw anything away, Mr. Clover. There can be a prize in each and every package. That's a hard thing to remember. Will you help me try to remember, Miss... Uh... Ames. Bell Ames. Oh. If you ever need any help, Mr. Clover, ring for Bell Ames. That's cute. Very cute. Now maybe I can do something for you, Bell. Maybe give you back all this money you said I dropped. <laughs> all right. So I lied. All you have to do is believe you dropped that money and listen. See how easy it is? A hundred dollars and no pain. For a hundred, you can throw in a little pain. Who do I listen to? It's written on the bill. Marty wants to see you. Oh? Marty says it's easier to talk to people who have money. He likes people with money. He says they listen better that way. I'm a fool for psychology, Bell. Let's go listen to Marty. Not me, Mr. Clover. You. It's you he wants to listen. Hey, come back here. Bell, Bell, come back here. The heat melted her into the crowd and then into a cab. And I was left standing there with the after scent of a perfume I'd never smelled before and a hundred dollar bill I'd never held before. I inhaled both of them. They added up to the acrid odor of a bribe. I had to find out why. 42nd Street, the address on the bill said. I decided to walk. Somewhere between Broadway and the number I was looking for, the honky tonk started. And at the corner where women's high heels clack more slowly and the handouts become more frequent, I took a right turn into limbo. Two blocks down was what I was looking for. The last paddock hotel, room 16. Come in. Come right in. Your name, Marty? Yeah. Yeah, that's my name. And these are my boys, Tinker and Dolly. Say a greeting to the police, boys. Police? Gee. Police. Golly day. The uh, boys are from out of town police like me. The word don't impress us. You gonna give me some more money, Marty? Maybe. Maybe money, maybe trouble. Guy has a hard time figuring which is which these days. What you trying to buy, Marty? Talk. I'm buying words like I'm an editor. <laughs> <laughs> Marty's a kick, ain't he, Tinker? He's a regular comedian. Your floor show stinks. Well, they ain't really working, police. 
So let's stop playing footsie, huh? We got business, me and you. Hmm. About an hour ago, police, a little guy hailed you into a haberdashery shop. He's got a message for you. What kind of message did he have? You should have heard. All you need, Marty, is a long, thin ear. Hey, hey, the police is a kick, too, Dolly. A jolly boy, real jolly. What did Silksburg and tell you, police? Who? Now, look, I got time. Time, patience. Let's do it again. Silks Bergen, what did he tell you? You looking for a tip on the horses? I got a tip, you're it. Only you look sad for a win. You look like hardly anything at all. Show him the gun, will you, Dolly? Yeah. Look, Mr. Police, this is a gun. Golly day. Let me have it, Dolly. Yeah. Here, Marty. Now, what did Silks Bergen tell you, police? Marty, you go to movies to see how guns will act in this kind of situation? Yeah. Yeah, in a movie. Now, how did you know? Dolly. Yeah? Show the police the second reel. Yeah, pleasure. A great big pleasure. You know the language better than that, police. You might say something. Your two muscles and your gun make me bashful. State's fright, huh? <laughs> Dolly. Yeah! Hey, Tinker, this yeah. is fun. Yeah. You can play too, Tinker. Yeah. Such a jolly guy. <laughs> Playing movies with a jolly guy. <laughs> a jolly, jolly guy. <laughs> Somewhere a light going on and off made a big noise and a bigger hurt just in back of my eyeballs. It screamed at me from across the street and through a window hung with grease-stained drapes. And I knew I was still in Marty's hotel room. I knew that hours had been torn out of my life and thrown away. Then the light screamed again, and this time there were words. Big thousand-watt words that said, Pearl Club, delicious dancing girls. First one, then the other. And in between, there was the creaking sound of a rocking chair. Then the rocking chair made words, too. Don't hurry. It's rather pleasant here, sitting rocking in the dark with that brazen sign throwing its naked, intermittent light. This gun gives me the right to introduce myself. I'm Gil Sherry. Oh, should I know you? Perhaps. I believe I'm in the class book of one of our more venerated colleges. That's my identity. A thesis on Gil Sherry would make lurid reading for the boys of the old school tie, don't you think? I wouldn't know. Read me a chapter. I'm oh, delighted. Chapter one begins. Early in life, I learned to love money. It was a symbol of the sordid life into which I'd fallen. Now, sitting in a bleak, villainous hotel room, my comrades, a detective and a corpse. The corpse and the detective. Is that all me? <laughs> Not quite. You're the detective, true. And the corpse is the true corpse lying in the corner. Huh? And I believe he's a friend of yours, Mr. Clover. Silks. Silks. A rather fancifully named, don't you think? Silks Bergen. Proud, colorful name. But pride and color seem to have drained out of him. Maybe he's ashamed of wearing bullet holes where his polka dots ought to be. He was a neat little guy. So? And he'd be pleased with death. Death is so precise. Closes your mouth, too. That wasn't smart of Marty. Marty realizes that. That's why I'm to keep watch over you. Until you open yours and tell us what Silks had to tell you, huh? Oh, by the way, here are your meager belongings. Yeah. Your wallet... A key ring, your badge, and a hundred-dollar bill. Marty's orders. That's good of him. They're all there? Yeah, yeah. You said a uh, hundred dollars like there were words that hurt you. As I suggested, money is beautiful, Mr. Clover. Money buys money. Money is an ecstasy, but an exquisite pain. Oh, uh, Gil, I dropped the bill. Huh? If you pick it up for me, I'll let you hold it for as long as you want. Go on. Touch it, Gil. Feel it. Of course, I'll get it. Yeah, Gil. And get this! I'm not going to send my boys to college. Their noses break too easy. It took 15 minutes for the riot squad to clean up room 16. I booked Gil Sherry as an accomplice to murder. And the morgue booked Silks Bergen. The thing I had to do now was break a promise to a dead man. I couldn't wait until tomorrow to use Silks' key. The key that Marty didn't even notice. 
A half hour later, I was in the big waiting room at LaGuardia Field. American Airlines DC-6 leaving at gate 5 for Chicago and Los Angeles. Loading at gate 4. Hiya, Lieutenant Clover. What brings you down here? You're an officer. Had any trouble? Uh, locker thieves? No, only trouble was a three-year-old kid in a $400 cowboy suit screaming because he lost his nurse and chauffeur at the same time. Where's locker 147? 147? Uh, uh, right over here, sir. Let's go. Now, let's try this key. A suitcase, Lieutenant. Yeah, pretty heavy. Something you're looking for? Hold on a second. As soon as I get this open. Holy, all that dough. Tens and fifties and hundreds. Yeah. What could be bought with that? It's been bought, officer. A lot of blood bought and paid for. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Practically all of Casey, crime photographer's adventures are summed up in the title of tonight's show, Big Danger. If you haven't met this ace newspaper cameraman, his pretty assistant, and Ethelbert, the merry bartender, if you're looking for a top-rating thrill show, be sure to hear this latest of crime photographer's adventures. Along with Escape, which tonight will present Irvin S. Cobb's Snake Doctor, crime photographer is heard on most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. <laughs> Broadway is an animal that feeds on hot tips, a tip on a horse or a chopped liver sandwich. There are even touts who will hawk you a scratch sheet giving odds on Broadway's being wiped off the face of the earth. And sometimes the tips pay off, like the one not to put your two bucks on jockey Silk's Bergen because Silk's was dead and his handicap was a chest full of bullets. Or maybe his handicap was a heavy $100,000 left in a pasteboard suitcase in a public locker. It didn't make sense for Silk's to have that kind of money. Even to sane, sensible, sensitive Sergeant Tartaglia, it didn't make sense. It don't make sense, Danny. Silk's with a hundred grand left kicking around. Ah, uh, that's not like him. Yeah. Uh, got a cigarette, Tartaglia? I put a carton in this desk drawer a week ago, and I haven't been able to open it since. Oh, here, let me try, Danny. It's stuck, Tartaglia. Just give me a cigarette. Danny, my wife, Mrs. Tartaglia, says I am the best opener of stuck drawers she ever saw. Just give me a cigarette. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, here, Danny. Hey, and how about some circus peanuts to munch while we're thinking? When do you have time to go to circuses, Sergeant? Oh, not me, not me, Danny. Wasn't me, it was my kid. Yeah, there was a street carnival on Mulberry Street, so it was my kid. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> oh, you know, for a minute there, Danny, I thought you were munching me out. All right. Playtime's over, Sergeant. We had any reports that anyone is shy a hundred grand? No, Danny. The money has been reported neither lost, stolen, nor strayed. Did you check whether Silks made any bets that would have got him that kind of money? Yeah, Danny. The word from our stoolies is that no bookies is out that kind of dope. Not out the Silks, anyway. The word also is that Silks didn't have a wrinkle deuce to bet on his own name. Yeah. What have we got on the man they call Marty? Ah, not a thing. Aside from his autographed hundred dollar bill. Now, we can't find him, Danny. We can't trace him from no place to no place. Hmm? Uh... Danny, you feel all right from that beating? I've had it better. Uh, Sergeant, what's on Bell Ames? Ah, uh, likewise. It's an empty day with a hole in it, isn't it, Tartaglia? Yeah. It... Huh? If you want me, I'll be in Gil Sherry's cell. There must be somebody who can tell me something. Anything. <laughs> There's no need to humiliate me further, Mr. Clover. Being forced to talk to you is humiliation enough. Murder doesn't bother you, huh? As long as it's not mine. Dying can come to a man a lot of ways, Sherry. You could die as an accessory to Silk's murder. And there are so many things to prove, though, before I die, aren't there, Detective Clover? If you told us some secrets, you could maybe keep on living. That's as good as money sometimes. True, true. That's why I keep my mouth shut. I'll breathe longer that way. You mean Marty will kill you if you talk to us? I'm not brilliant like you, Sherry, but it seems to me you'll lose either way. Man has few choices. 
but the destiny of Gil Sherry will spin itself out as Gil Cherry chooses. That's what my class book said about me. Yeah. Real profits, your classmates. Real profits. Here's the envelope with Sherry's belongings you asked for, Danny. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I return your meager possessions, Sherry. Your cigarettes, an empty wallet, a fraternity pin, and... Hmm. This is interesting. Roll of tickets to Pelagus Shooting Gallery. You know Pelagus, Sherry? Pelagus, the ex-bookie? You shoot at his shooting gallery? Yeah, that's what I thought. Happy destiny, Sherry. Happy destiny. <laughs> Oh, Pelagus, keeping in trim? Pardon me, Danny. You're in my way. Oh, uh, sorry. Nice shot. You angry at somebody? What's on your mind? Guy named Marty. Yeah. You like that shot? Makes me quiver with excitement. You think I hit that duck twice before it sinks? I doubt it. <laughs> See what I mean? You're still booking races, Pelagus? I got caught once. You still booking? Uh -uh. You're in my way again. Try getting used to it, Pelagus. Try this. Where would Silks Bergen get a hundred grand? Yeah. Where? From you? Oh, yeah, from me. From Pelagus. I give people a hundred grand, eh? That's why I'm running this thing concerning gallery, because I give such big prices. You hit that duck, Lieutenant. I give you a hundred grand prize. Is that what you mean? Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, tell us. Tony Vrani, Joe Murdoch, Nessus to Potami. Petty Manos. Oh, Petty Manos. Joe Murdoch. Joe Murdoch. Silks' friend. The big guy with Silks in the haberdashery. Pelagus, what's he saying about Joe Murdoch? It's hard to explain. Hard, huh? Like this. Uh, Joe Murdoch. Was he started this river? Murdered. After his head on us, of course, day. Don't spare me that last, either. What did you say? May he rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, See you around, Pelagus. Pure scene of thoughts. Danny Clover. I feast it on us, security. It was a thought I had to think that pal Joey Murdoch was dead for the same reason that Silks was. I checked headquarters, found out that Murdoch's last known address was the last paddock hotel. He shared a room there with Silks. The environment made its own possibilities. The lobby of the last paddock had a new embellishment. Above the clerk's desk was an embroidered wreath. To Silks, it said, you finally beat the bookies. The clerk didn't sound funereal at all. Sorry, mister, you gotta come recommend it. The last paddock don't rent rooms to just any fink that asks. I didn't mention room. The sign under your chin says information. I'll take that. Ah, uh, you don't look like you carry that much dough. I got it sewn under my lapel. Here, take a look. A cop. A shaman. A real friendly policeman, mister. Come on, the information. Now, look, I'm a new boy here. You ring that bell, I give you the register. You sign it, you got a room. That's how it works. That's all I know. Yeah. Say, that's a pretty big safe over there. Why such a big safe for such a small flea bag? New, too. Yeah, new. How come? How come such a big new safe? Look, like I said, I'm a new boy Look, friendly, here. we got laws about new boys who get close to new murders. Put your out-to-lunch sign on the counter. We're going uptown. No, 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 wait a minute. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, about that new safe. See, we had an old one. What happened to it? Well, yesterday, the boys opened the old safe, and all it gave back was an empty stare. The boys did? What boys? The boys, the guys that live here, the bookies. Oh, they kept their money in a safe, huh? Well, sure, it's much safer than a bank. No peeping team on that way, eh? That way, the bookies don't pay income tax. That way, if their money gets stolen, they can't run to the police. Yeah, yeah. And that's all I know. You can take me uptown, and that's still all I know. Yeah. Don't go away, friendly. Maybe soon you'll be able to tell your story to an audience. Get in the car, Clover. Well, uh, Marty. Good seeing you, Marty. I've been looking all over for you. Get in the car, Clover. Dolly's looking at you with a gun pointed to where your badge might be. Now, just get in the car. Hey, Tinker. Hey. It's the police again. 
Maybe we'll get to play some more movies. After I take a gun. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Golly day. You'll play later, boys. Wait out here. Oh, Marty. Wait. This way, police. In that house. Two murders, eh, Marty? How does a guy feel when he's murdered two men? A good feeling. I like it. Open the door. Yeah. There's someone I want you to meet again, Clover. In here. Mr. Clover. Mr. Danny Clover. You mind if I blush with joy? You can still think of a reason to blush, Belle. <laughs> <laughs> Such pretty words for a man who's nearly dead. You got one chance, Clover. The dough, the hundred grand. Where is it? First, I'm going to tell you something about Marty, Bill. He had that money and he didn't know it. What? What's he saying, Marty? You tell us, Clover. Bill, when Marty had me worked over, he should have taken a look at my key ring. One of the keys was for a locker. Locker, money. Marty. How could you be so stupid? Answer the policeman, Marty. So, so I made a mistake, Bill. Don't worry. We got the police. We'll get the dough. hundred thousand dollars, Marty, like that, right under your nose. Oh, <laughs> Bill, you picked yourself a dull playmate. You can't afford a playmate who makes mistakes, Bill. Marty, you fool. You stupid fool. <laughs> Bill. I've got to ask you, too, Bill. How does it feel to kill a man? Where's the money, Mr. Clover? At police headquarters, in my office. Get on that phone, Mr. Clover. Get on that phone and have one of your flunkies bring it over. No tricks, Mr. Clover. Just tell it's them... It's hard to kill from up close, huh, Bell? Palacos. It's me. Palacos of Palacos shooting gallery. You see, Clover, how well they learn from Polegos? You always teach them with a gun in your hand? <laughs> one needs something to wrap one's pupil across the knuckles when she is bad. No, Belle? Belle deserves it, Pelagos. She tried to double-cross you. That makes two, Belle and Marty. Didn't know you were so much alike, Belle, you and Marty. <gasps> Don't listen to the policeman, Pelagos. No, it's just, it's just you and me. Nobody else. It's, it's you and me and a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, sounds good. To me, that sounds good. How would it sound to you, Clover? Speaking strictly from a personal point of view, I wouldn't believe it. Uh, from a personal point of view, that is. Uh-huh, but Pelagos point his view different. Oh, then it's all right, Pelagos. It's all right, isn't it? Oh, it, it couldn't be better. Just show me you mean it. Throw away your gun. Huh? On the floor, Bill. Throw away. Oh, sure, sure. Anything you say. Ah. You're a good girl, Bill. Nice good girl. <gasps> oh, Pelagos. Yes, 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 yes. Belle was a nice girl. She had nice, good ideas, Clover. How did she say? Get on the phone and have a flunky bring money over. No tricks. That's how she said. The flunky comes alone, Clover. I tell you in English, not in Greek, so you understand. He comes alone in 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, Tartaglia, this is Danny. Silk's dough. Yeah, the hundred grand. Bring it here to me. Yeah, to 8 West 63rd. In my desk drawer, Tartaglia. It's in my lower left-hand drawer. Yeah. Yeah, right away. And come alone, Tartaglia. Alone. You did good, Clover. Nice good. Now we wait. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, the man said. Just Pelagos and me. There was no one to play him off against. No Marty, no Bell. Just me. The fall guys I'd set up, Marty and Bell, all gone. It all belonged to Pelagos now. Two new fall guys, Tartaglia and me. A few more minutes, the man said. Mostly, the man watched the clock. Ah, sir. You're lucky, Clover. In two minutes, you could have died. Open the door. 
Hiya, Danny. Well, here it is. I brought the dough just like you said. Hey, you know, it's good to get away from the office. With a suitcase on the table. Huh? Hey, it's Belagos. Hey, and he's got a gun. Hey, Danny, what Give the man the suitcase, Tartaglia. Oh, well, whatever you say, Danny. Ah, <laughs> ah, Clover. You're a nice, good fool. I get the money, you still die, huh? You and the flunky. Huh? Talk to us before we die, Pelagos. I like to talk. What do we talk about? That was your money. Silk stole it from the safe at the last paddock. Thought he could get away with it. He thought you couldn't do anything about it. But you crossed him. You had Marty kill him and his friend Murdoch. You talk all by yourself, Clover. You didn't let me say a word. <laughs> now fold your hands behind your head and stand facing the wall. You both. Good. That's nice, good. Now I want to look once more at my money. It's too long since I looked at the money. Yes, my mo the money. Something wrong, Pelagos? This money is... It's what, Pelagos? It's nothing but paper. Lousy, torn up strips of dirty newspaper. Paper is nothing but... Hit the bar, Tartaglia. I'll take him. Oh. Nice, good, huh, Pelagos? Ah. Yeah. Nice, good. First, I kissed Tartaglia on the top of his bald head, because today, that's where his brain was. My lower left-hand desk drawer had been stuck for a week, and he'd gotten the cue. Dolly and Tinker, they were sitting outside, just like Marty told them, right in the middle of a police net, just like Tartaglia had arranged. So I kissed him again. So he invited me to a spaghetti dinner. Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's crowd and it's laughter, and it's a trumpet that screams. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley, and they're heaped there, the bright-eyed kid, the voice that whispers from the doorway, the poet, the dregs. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway. <laughs> 